Palestine Pilgrims Text Society of the Buildings of Justinian by Procopius Circa 560 AD Translated by Aubrey Stewart, M.A. Preface Procopius was born at Caesarea in Palestine, early in the 6th or at the end of the 5th century. He made his way, an adventurer, to Constantinople, where he began as an advocate and professor of rhetoric. He had the good fortune to be recommended to Belisarius, who appointed him one of his secretaries. In that capacity Procopius accompanied the general in his expedition to the east, A.D. 528, and in that against the Vandals, A.D. 533. The successful prosecution of the war enriched Belisarius to such an extent that he was enabled to maintain a retinue of 7,000 men, of whom Procopius seems to have been one of the most trusted, since we find him appointed commissary general in the Italian war. On his return to Constantinople, he was decorated with one of the innumerable titles of the Byzantine court, and entered into the Senate. In the year 562 he was made prefect of Constantinople, and is supposed to have died in 565, the same year as his former patron Belisarius. His works are, 1, the histories, in eight books, namely, 2 on the Persian War, 408-553, to 2 on the war with the Vandals, 395-545, to 545, and 4 on the wars with the Goths, bringing the history down to the year 553. 2 the six books on the buildings of Justinian, and, three, the Anecdota, or Secret History, a work which has always been attributed to him. The histories appeared first in Latin, 1470, the translator being Leonardo Bruni di Arezzo, Leonardo Artino, who, believing his own MS to be the only one in existence, gave himself out for the author. They were first published in Greek, at Augsburg, 1607, but the buildings had already appeared at Basel. 1531. The Secret History was first published, with a translation into Latin, at Lyons. In 1623. The histories and the anecdota have been translated into French. An English translation of the secret history was published in 1674. No other part of Procopius has, until now, been translated. The following version of the De Edificius has been specially made for the Pilgrim's Text Society, by Aubrey Stewart late fellow of Trinity, Cambridge, who has added the valuable notes marked, S. The notes marked, L, chiefly. Archaeological, have been supplied by Professor Hayter Lewis, and those marked, W, chiefly topographical, by Colonel Sir C. W. Wilson, the director of the society. The illustrations of Street. Sophia are taken from the magnificent work by Sarzenberg, published at Berlin. Those from Texia and Pullen are taken by the kind permission of Mr. Pullen. From their work on Byzantine architecture. In the investigation of the antiquities of Palestine, the name of Justinian, as associated with them, comes forward as often as that of Constantine or Herod. From Bethlehem to Damascus, from the sea coast to far beyond the Jordan. There are few places of note in which some remains, dating from his era, do not exist, or in which, at the least, some records of his works are not left in the history of his time. 
to him Mount Sinai owes the Church of the Holy Virgin. At Bethlehem he is said to have enlarged, if not rebuilt, the Great Basilica. At Jerusalem the mountain still bears on its summit the remains of the Church, which he there constructed, and Tiberius is still surrounded, in part, by the walls raised by him. He is known to have constructed a large church to the Virgin on the Mount of Olives, and several other churches in and about Jerusalem, the grandest of which is described to have been an architectural gem, was in the harem area itself. Besides these, which are definitely recorded to have been his work, he is supposed by some of the best authorities to have erected the Golden Gate and the Double Gate and of late years it has been contended that the Sacra itself was constructed by him as it now exists. But there is scarcely one of these edifices, where remains of them exist or are supposed so to do, which has not been the subject of controversy, the authorship of the Sacra, taking that as an instance, having been assigned, by various Persons who would usually be considered as authorities on the subject, to the Romans under Constantine, to the Byzantines under Justinian, and to the Arabs under Abdel Malek. It becomes, therefore, important to have a clear record as to what Justinian did, not only in Palestine but in other countries, so as to be able to judge to some extent by well-authenticated examples, of the founders of those edifices whose history is involved in doubt. Of the writers who can give us this record, none has such authority as Procopius, or gives so much detailed information, and he has, for that reason, been largely quoted by Gibbon and by well nigh every other writer on Byzantine history and he gives such definite information as to the dates of many of Justinian's buildings which remain to us, as to form a standard by which to recognize the general characteristics in outline and detail adopted by his architects in his greatest works, and which characterize the style now well known as Byzantine. Its first and greatest example is Saint Sophia at Constantinople, which is perhaps, the boldest instance of a sudden change in almost every respect, whether of plan, elevation, or detail, which is known in architecture. Before its construction, the ground plan of well-nigh every building known to Western architects had defined the plan of all above it. The columns in the apse of the basilica, or church, carried galleries or other erections above it of varied design, but in the same straight or curved lines as those beneath them. The lines of the dome, except in slightly exceptional cases, such as the ruin known as the Temple of Minerva Medica at Rome, or the Temple of the Winds at Athens, were carried up on the distinct lines of the lower walls. The capitals of the columns in the works of the ancient Greeks or Romans were in each building carved on the same design, and however beautiful each might be, the eye would see but one form of the Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian. Through the whole range of a colonnade, the Byzantines changed all that. The Great Dome of Street Sophia, the boldest piece of novel construction ever perhaps, attempted forms the crown of a building quite original in plan, and this dome is placed, not as that of the Roman pantheon, low down on thick walls of its own form, but suspended high above all the roof around it, on four arches, which spring from detached piers, the keystone alone of each arch giving a direct support to the dome, in every other part it overhangs the void in the boldest manner. The circular work between these arches is carried in a manner which is comparatively easy to imitate now, but the rude and often picturesque results of attempts at imitation in medieval times, 
more especially in the south of France, show how difficult the work was found to be at the outset. Earthquake and faults of construction occasioned the rebuilding of the Great Dome, but it still crowns, after a trial of more than 1,300 years, one of the most beautiful buildings in existence. Then the capitals of the columns, whose general outlines bear few traces of the ancient orders, were often carved each in a different manner, and, though harmonizing with each other in general outline, could bear separate scrutiny, and show each a special motive and design. The carving of these capitals, and of the other beautiful scroll work and Foliage which decorate the walls of Saint Sophia, has come down to us through the Normans, and is quite peculiar. It had none of the soft, round forms which the Romans loved, but is cut in a sharp, crisp, and somewhat stiff style, casting distinctly marked and sharp shadows, and the eyes of the foliage and other well-marked parts are emphasized by being deeply drilled in. Many of the Byzantine characteristics had been, to a large extent, foreshadowed in eastern buildings, even at so early a time as the Assyrian bas-reliefs, but it is to Byzantine architects, under the fostering care of Justinian, that we owe the picturesque changes and details of that style, the Byzantine, which takes its name from his capital and is to a large extent, identified with himself. All the drawings have been made for this volume by Mr. George Armstrong, formerly on the survey party under Captain Kunda and Captain Kitchener. L. The Six Books of Procpius of Caesarea On the Buildings of the Lord Justinian Introduction I have not begun this work through any desire to make a display of my own virtue, or trusting to my powers of language, or wishing to gain credit by my knowledge of the places described, for I had nothing to encourage me to undertake so bold a project. But I have often reflected on the great blessings which countries derive from history, which transmits to posterity the remembrance of our ancestors, and opposes the efforts of time to cover them with oblivion, which always encourages virtue in its readers by its praise, and deters them from vice by its blame, and in this way destroys its power. All we need study then is to make clear what has been done, and by whom of mankind it was done, and this, I imagine, is not impossible even for the weakest and feeblest writer, besides this, the writing of history enables subjects who have been kindly treated by their rulers, to express their gratitude, and to make a more than adequate return, seeing that they only for a time enjoy the goodness of their princes, while they render their virtues immortal in the memory of their descendants many of whom in this very way have been led by the glory of their ancestors to a love of virtue, and have been probably preserved from a dissolute course of life by the dread of disgrace. I will shortly explain my object in making these prefatory remarks. The Emperor Justinian was born in our time, one, and succeeding to the throne when the state was decayed, added greatly to its extent and glory by driving out from it the barbarians, who for so long a time had forced their way into it, as I have briefly narrated in my history of the wars. They say that Themistocles, the son of Neocles, prided himself on his power of making a small state great. But our emperor has the power of adding other states to his own for he has annexed to the Roman Empire many other states which at his accession were independent, and has founded innumerable cities which had no previous existence. As for religion, which he found uncertain and torn by various heresies, 
he destroyed everything which could lead to error, and securely established the true faith upon one solid foundation. Moreover, finding the laws obscure through their unnecessary multitude, and confused by their conflict with one another, he firmly established them by reducing the number of those which were unnecessary, and in the case of those that were contradictory, by confirming the better ones. He forgave of his own accord those who plotted against him, and, by loading with wealth those who were in want, and relieving them from the misfortunes which had afflicted them, he rendered the empire stable and its members happy. By increasing his armies he strengthened the Roman Empire, which lay everywhere exposed to the attacks of barbarians, and fortified its entire frontier by building strong places. Of his other acts the greater part have been described by me in other works, but his great achievements in building are set forth in this book. We learn from tradition that Cyrus the Persian was a great king, and the chief founder of the empire of his countrymen, but whether he had any resemblance to that Cyrus who is described by Xenophon, the Athenian in his Cyropedia, I have no means of telling, for possibly the art of the writer has given some embellishments to his achievements, while as for our present emperor Justinian, whom I think one may rightly call a king by nature. Since, as Homer says, he is as gentle as a father, if one accurately considers his empire, one will regard that of Cyrus as mere child's play. 2. The proof of this will be that the empire, as I just now said, has been more than doubled by him. Both in extent and in power, whilst his royal clemency is proved by the fact that those who wickedly plotted against his life, although they were clearly convicted, not only are alive and in possession of their property at the present day, but even command Roman armies, and have been promoted to the consular dignity. Now, as I said before, we must turn our attention to the buildings of this monarch, lest posterity, beholding the enormous size and number of them, should deny their being the work of one man, for the works of many men of former times, not being confirmed by history, have been disbelieved through their own excessive greatness. As is natural, the foundation of all my account will be the buildings in Byzantium, for, as the old proverb has it, when we begin a work we ought to put a brilliant frontispiece to it. Book I I the lowest dregs of the people in Byzantium once assailed the emperor. Justinian in the rebellion called Nica, which I have clearly described in my History of the Wars. To prove that it was not merely against the emperor, but no less against God that they took up arms, they ventured to burn the church of the Christians. This church the people of Byzantium call Sophia, i.e. Wisdom, a name most worthy of God. God permitted them to effect this crime, knowing how great the beauty of this church would be when restored. Thus the church was entirely reduced to ashes, but the Emperor Justinian not long afterwards adorned it in such a fashion, that if anyone had asked the Christians in former times if they wished their church to be destroyed and thus restored, showing them the appearance of the church which we now see, I think. It probable that they would have prayed that they might as soon as possible behold their church destroyed, in order that it might be turned into its present form. The emperor, regardless of expense of all kinds, pressed on its restoration and collected together all the workmen from every land, and Themius of Trolls, three. By far the most celebrated architect, not only of his own but of all former times, carried out the king's zealous intentions, organized the labors of the workmen, and prepared models of the future construction 
associated with him was another architect named Isidorus, a Milesian by birth, a man of intelligence, and worthy to carry out the plans of the Emperor Justinian. It is, indeed, a proof of the esteem with which God regarded the Emperor, that he furnished him with men who would be so useful in effecting his designs, and we are compelled to admire the intelligence of the Emperor, in being able to choose the most suitable of mankind to carry out the noblest of his works. Church of St. Sophia Specimen of Details of Capitals and Sea of Street Sophia From Sarzenberg The Church consequently presented a most glorious spectacle, extraordinary to those who beheld it, and altogether incredible to those who are told of it. In height it rises to the very heavens, and overtops the neighboring buildings like a ship anchored among them, it rises above the rest of the city, which it adorns. While it forms a part of it, and it is one of its beauties that being a part of the city, and growing out of it, it stands so high above it, that from it the whole city can be beheld as from a watchtower. Its length and breadth are so judiciously arranged that it appears to be both long and wide without being disproportioned. It is distinguished by indescribable beauty, for it excels both in its size and in the harmony of its proportion, having no part excessive and none deficient, being more magnificent than ordinary buildings, and much more elegant than those which are out of proportion. It is singularly full of light and sunshine, you would declare that the place is not lighted by the sun from without, but that the rays are produced within itself, such an abundance of light is poured into this church. Now the front of the church, that is to say the part towards the rising sun, where the sacred mysteries are performed in honor of God, is built as follows. The building rises from the ground, not in a straight line, but set back somewhat obliquely, and retreating in the middle into the form of a half circle, a form which those who are learned in these matters call semicylindrical, rising perpendicularly. The upper part of this work ends in the fourth part of a sphere, and above it another crescent shaped structure is raised upon the adjacent parts of the building, admirable for its beauty, but causing terror by the apparent weakness of its construction, for it appears not to rest upon a secure foundation, but to hang dangerously over the heads of those within, although it is really supported with especial firmness and safety. On each side of these there are columns standing upon the floor, which themselves also are not placed in a straight line, but arranged with an inward curve of semicircular shape, one beyond another, like the dancers in a chorus. These columns support above them a crescent-shaped structure. Opposite this east wall is built another wall, containing the entrances, and upon either side of it also stand columns with Stonework above them in a half circle exactly like those previously described. In the midst of the church are four masses of stone called piers, two on the north and two on the south side, opposite and equal to one another, having four columns in the central space between each. These piers are composed of large stones fitted together the stones being carefully selected and cleverly jointed into one another by the masons, reaching to a great height. Looking at them you would compare them to perpendicular cliffs. Upon these four arches rise in a quadrilateral form. The extremities of these arches join one another in pairs, and rest at their ends upon these piers while the other part of them rise to a great height, and are suspended in the air. Two of these arches, that is, those towards the rising and the setting sun, are constructed over the empty air, but the 
remainder have under them some stonework, with small columns. Now above. These arches is raised a circular building of a spherical form through which the light of day first shines, for the building, I imagine, overtops the whole country, and has small openings left on purpose, so that the places where these intervals in the construction occur may serve for conductors of light. Thus far I imagine. The building is not incapable of being described, even by a weak and feeble tongue. As the arches are arranged in a quadrangular figure, the stonework between them takes the shape of a triangle, the lower angle of each triangle. Being compressed between the shoulders of the arches, is slender, while the upper part becomes wider as it rises in the space between them, and ends against the circle which rises from thence, forming there its remaining angles. A spherical-shaped dome standing upon this circle makes it exceedingly beautiful. From the lightness of the building it does not appear to rest upon a solid foundation, but to cover the place beneath as though it were suspended from heaven by the fabled golden chain. All these parts surprisingly join to one another in the air suspended one from another, and resting only on that which is next to them, form the work into one admirably harmonious whole, which spectators do not care to dwell upon for long in the mass, as each individual part attracts the eye and turns it to itself. The sight causes men to constantly change their point of view, and the spectator can nowhere point to any part which he admires more than the rest, but having viewed the art which appears everywhere. Men contract their eyebrows as they look at each point, and are unable to comprehend such workmanship, but always depart thence stupefied through their incapacity to comprehend it. So much for this. Church of St. Sophia. Half section through Great Dome and Transept. Vincent Brooks Day and Son Church of St. Sophia Half plan on level of ground floor Half plan on level of galleries The Emperor Justinian and the architects Anthemius and Isidorus used many devices to construct so lofty a church with security. One alone of these I will at this present time explain by which a man may form some opinion of the strength of the whole work, as for the others, I am not able to discover them all, and find it impossible to explain them in words. It is as follows, the piers, for, of which I just now spoke are not constructed in the same manner as the rest of the building, but in this fashion, they consist of quadrangular courses of stones, rough by nature but made smooth by art, of these stones, those which make the projecting angles of the pier are cut angularly, while those which go in the middle parts of the sides are cut square. They are fastened together not with what is called unslaked lime, not with bitumen, the boast of Semiramis at Babylon, nor anything of the kind, but with lead, which is poured between the interstices and which, pervading the whole structure, has sunk into the joints of the stones, and binds them together, this is how they are built. Let us now proceed to describe the remaining parts of the church. The entire ceiling is covered with pure gold, which adds glory to its beauty, though the rays of light reflected upon the gold from the marble surpass it in beauty, there are two porticos on each side, which do not in any way dwarf the size of the church, but add to its width. In length they reach quite to the ends, but in height they fall short of it, these also have a domed ceiling and are adorned with gold. Of these two porticos, the one is set apart for male, and the other for female worshippers, there is no variety in them nor do they differ in any respect from one another, but their very equality 
and similarity add to the beauty of the church. Who could describe the galleries, five, of the portions set apart for women, or the numerous porticos and cloistered courts with which the church is surrounded? Who could tell of the beauty of the columns and marbles with which the church is adorned? One would think that one had come upon a meadow full of flowers in bloom, who would not admire the purple tints of some and the green of others, the glowing red and glittering white, and those, too, which nature, like a painter, has marked with the strongest contrasts of color. Whoever enters there to worship perceives at once that it is not by any human strength or skill, but by the favor of God that this work has been perfected his mind rises sublime to commune with God, feeling that he cannot be far off, but must especially love to dwell in the place which he has chosen, and this takes place not only when a man sees it for the first time, but it always makes the same impression upon him, as though he had never beheld it before. No one ever became weary of this spectacle, but those who are in the church delight in what they see, and, when they leave it, magnify it in their talk about it, moreover, it is impossible accurately to describe the treasure of gold and silver plate and gems, which the Emperor Justinian has presented to it, but by the description of one of them, I leave the rest to be inferred. That part of the church which is especially sacred, and where the priests alone are allowed to enter, which is called the sanctuary, contains 40,000 pounds weight of silver. The above is an account, written in the most abridged and cursory manner, describing in the fewest possible words the most admirable structure of the church at Constantinople which is called the Great Church, built by the Emperor. Justinian, who did not merely supply the funds for it, but assisted it by the labor and powers of his mind, as I will now explain. Of the two arches which I lately mentioned, the architects call them Lori, six, that one which stands towards the east had been built up on each side, but had not altogether been completed in the middle, where it was still imperfect, now the piers upon which the building rested, unable to support the weight which was put upon them, somehow all at once split open, and seemed as though before long they would fall to pieces. Upon this Anthemius and Isidorus, terrified at what had taken place, referred the matter to the emperor, losing all confidence in their own skill. He at once, I know not by what impulse, but probably inspired by heaven, for he is not an architect, ordered them to carry round this arch, for it, said he, resting upon itself, will no longer need the piers below. Now if this story were unsupported by witnesses, I am well assured that it would seem to be written in order to flatter and to be quite incredible, but as there are many witnesses now alive of what then took place, I shall not hesitate to finish it. The workman performed his bidding, the arch was safely suspended, and proved by experiment the truth of his conception. So much then for this part of the building, now with regard to the other arches, those looking to the south and to the north, the following incidents took place. When the arches called Lori were raised aloft during the building of the church, everything below them labored under their weight, and the columns which are placed there shed little scales, as though they had been planed. Alarmed at this, the architects again referred the matter to the emperor, who devised the following plan. He ordered the upper part of the work that was giving way, where it touched the arches to be taken down for the present, and to be replaced long afterwards when the damp had thoroughly left the fabric. This was done, 
and the building has stood safely afterwards, so that the structure as it were bears witness to the emperor. Two in front of the senate house there is an open place which the people of Constantinople call the Augusta Elm, in it there are not less than seven courses of stone in a quadrangular form, arranged like steps, each one so much less in extent than that which is below, that each one of the stones projects sufficiently for the men who frequent that place to sit upon them as upon steps. From the topmost course a column rises to a great height, not a monolith, but composed of stones of a considerable periphery, which are cut square, and are fitted into one another by the skill of the masons. The finest brass, cast into panels and garlands, surrounds these stones on every side, binding them firmly together. While it covers them with ornament, and in all parts, especially at the capital and the base, imitates the form of the column. This brass is in color paler than unalloyed gold, and its value is not much short of its own weight in silver. On the summit of the column there stands an enormous horse, with his face turned towards the east, a noble sight. He appears to be walking, and proceeding swiftly forwards, he raises his left forefoot as though to tread upon the earth. Before him, while the other rests upon the stone beneath it, as though it would make the next step, while he places his hind feet together, so that they may be ready when he bids them move. Upon this horse sits a colossal brass figure of the emperor, habited as Achilles, for so his costume is called, he wears hunting shoes, and his ankles are not covered by his greaves. He wears a corslet like an ancient hero, his head is covered by a helmet which seems to nod, and a plume glitters upon it. A poet would say that it was that star of the dog days. Mentioned in Homer. 7. He looks towards the east, directing his course, I imagine, against the Persians, in his left hand he holds a globe, by which the Sculptor signifies that all lands and seas are subject to him. He holds no sword or spear, or any other weapon, but a cross stands upon the globe, through which he has obtained his empire and victory in war, he stretches forward his right hand towards the east, and spreading out his fingers seems to bid the barbarians in that quarter to remain at home and come no further. This is the appearance of the statue. The church of Irene, 8, which was next to the great church, and was burnt down together with it, was rebuilt on a large scale by the emperor Justinian, a church scarcely second to any in Byzantium except that of Sophia. There was between these two churches a hospice for the relief of destitute persons and those in the last extremity of disease, suffering in body as well as in fortune, which was built in former times by a God-fearing man named Samson. This also did not remain unscathed by the insurgents, but perished in the fire, together with the two neighboring churches. The Emperor Justinian rebuilt it in a more magnificent fashion and with a much greater number of rooms, and he has also endowed it with a great annual revenue, in order that the sufferings of more unfortunate men may be relieved in it for the future. Insatiate as he was in his love for God, he built two other hospices opposite to this, in what are called the Houses of Isidorus and Arcadius, being assisted in these pious works by the Empress Theodora. As for all the other churches which this emperor raised in honor of Christ, they are so many in number and so great in size that it is impossible to describe them in detail, for no power of words nor one's whole life would suffice to collect and to recite the list of their several names, let this much suffice. 
3. We must begin with the churches of the Virgin Mary, for it is understood that this is the wish of the Emperor himself, and the true method of description distinctly points out that from God we ought to proceed to the Mother of God. The Emperor Justinian built in all parts of the Roman Empire many churches dedicated to the Virgin, so magnificent and large, and constructed with such a lavish expenditure of money, that a person beholding any one of them singly would imagine it to have been his only work, and that he had spent the whole period of his reign in adorning it alone. For the present, as I said before, I shall describe the churches in Byzantium. One of the churches of the Virgin, 9, was built by him outside the walls, in a place named Blachene, for he must be credited with the pious foundations of Justin, his uncle, since he administered his kingdom at his own discretion. This church is near the seashore, of great sanctity and magnificence, it is long, yet its width is well proportioned to its length, and above and below it is supported and rests on nothing less than sections of Parian marble which stand in the form of columns. These columns are arranged in a straight line in all parts of the church except in the middle, where they are set back. Those who enter this church especially admire its lofty and at the same time secure construction, and its splendid yet not meretricious beauty. He built another church in her honor in the place which is called the fountain, where there is a thick grove of cypress trees, a meadow whose rich earth blooms with flowers, a garden abounding in fruit, a fountain which noiselessly pours forth a quiet and sweet stream of water, in short where all the surroundings beseem a sacred place. Such is the country around the church, but as for the church itself, it is not easy to describe it in fitting words, to form an idea of it in the mind, or to express it in language, let it suffice for me to say thus. Much of it that in beauty and size it surpasses most other churches. Both these churches are built outside the city walls, the one at the place where the wall starts from the seashore, the latter close to what is called the Golden Gate, which is near the further end of the fortifications, in order that both of them might form impregnable defences for the city walls. Besides these, in the temple, of Hera, now called the Hyrium, he erected a church in honor of the Virgin, which cannot easily be described. In that part of the city which is called Deuteron, 10, he built a noble and admirable church in honor of Street, Anne, whom some think to have been the mother of the Virgin, and the grandmother of Christ, for God, in choosing to become man subjected himself to having grandparents and a genealogy on his mother's side like a man. Not very far from this church, in the last street of the city, there is a fine church built in honor of the martyr Zoe. He found the church of the Archangel Michael, 11, at Byzantium small, very dark, and quite unworthy of being dedicated to the Archangel, having been built by one senator, a patrician in former times, and in shape very like a small bedroom in a poor man's house. Wherefore he raised it entirely to the ground, that no part of its former unseemliness might be left, and rebuilding it of a goodly size, in the manner which we now see, changed it into a building of wonderful beauty. This church is of a quadrangular form, its length apparently not greatly exceeding its width, of its sides, that which looks towards the east, has at its extremities a thick wall constructed of a great mass of stones, but in the middle is set back, forming a recess, on each side of which the roof is supported by columns of variegated stone. The opposite wall, that towards the west, is 
pierced with doors opening into the church. For his faith in the apostles of Christ is testified in the following manner, in the first place he built the church to S.S. Peter and Paul, which did not exist before in Byzantium, close to the king's palace, which was formerly called by the name of Hormistus. 12. This was once his own private house, and when he became emperor of the Romans, he made it look worthy of a palace by the magnificence of its buildings, and joined it to the other imperial apartments. Here also he built another church dedicated to the glorious saints Sergius and Bacchus, 13, and afterwards another church standing obliquely to it. These two churches stand, not facing one another, but obliquely towards one another, joined together, and vying one with another. They have a common entrance, are equal to one another in all respects, are surrounded by a boundary wall, and neither of them exceeds the other or falls short of it, either in beauty, size, or any other respect for each alike reflects the rays of the sun from its polished marble, and is alike covered with lavish gilding and adorned with offerings, in one respect. Alone they differ, that the length of one is straight, whereas the columns of the other for the most part stand in a semicircle. They both have one portico at their vestibule, which from its great length is called narthex. 14. The whole vestibule the court, the inner doors from the court and the neighborhood of the palace are alike common to both, and both these churches are so admirable that they form a great ornament to the entire city, and especially to the palace. Plan of Church of S.S. Sergius and Bacchus After this, out of his exceeding great reverence for all the apostles, 15, he did as follows. In ancient times there was one church at Byzantium dedicated to all the apostles, but through length of time it had become ruinous, and seemed not likely to stand much longer. Justinian took this entirely down, and was careful not only to rebuild it, but to render it more admirable both in size and beauty, he carried out his intention in the following manner. Two lines were drawn in the form of a cross, joining one another in the middle, the upright one pointing to the rising and setting sun, and the other cross line towards the north and the south wind. These were surrounded by a circuit of walls, and within by columns, placed both above and below, at the crossing of the two straight lines, that is, about the middle point of them there is a place set apart, which may not be entered except by the priests, and which is consequently termed the sanctuary. The transepts which lie on each side of this, about the cross line, are of equal length, but that part of the upright line towards the setting sun is built so much longer than the other part as to form the figure of the cross. That part of the roof which is above the sanctuary is constructed like the middle part of the church of Sophia, except that it yields to it in size, for the four arches are suspended and connected with one another in the same fashion, the circular building standing above them is pierced with windows, and the spherical dome which overarches it seems to be suspended in the air, and not to stand upon a firm base, although it is perfectly secure. In this manner the middle part of the roof is built, now the roof over the four limbs of the church is constructed of the same size as that which I have described over the middle, with this one exception, that the wall underneath the spherical part is not pierced with windows. When he had completed the building of this sanctuary, the apostles made it evident to all that they were pleased and thoroughly delighted with the honor paid them by the emperor, for the bodies of the apostles Andrew, Luke, and Timothy, which had before this been invisible and altogether unknown, 
were then made manifest to all men. Signifying, I imagine, that they did not reject the faith of the emperor, but permitted him openly to behold them, to approach and to touch them, that he might gain from them assistance and security for his life. This was discovered in the following manner. The Emperor Constantine built this church in the name and in honor of the apostles, making a decree that there should be a sepulcher there for himself, and for those who should rule after him, women as well as men, which is observed even to the present day. Here also the body of the father of Constantine was laid. But he did not in any way hint that the bodies of the apostles were there, nor did there appear to be any place set apart for the bodies of saints. When, however, the Emperor Justinian was rebuilding this church, the workmen dug up the whole foundation, lest any unseemly thing should be left in it. They saw there three neglected wooden coffins, which declared by inscriptions upon them that they contained the bodies of the apostles Andrew, Luke, and Timothy, which the emperor and all Christian men beheld with the greatest delight. A solemn procession and public festival was ordered, and, after the customary rites had been performed in their honor, the coffins were covered up, and again placed in the ground. The place was not left unmarked or uncared for, but was reverently dedicated to the bodies of the apostles. In return for the respect paid them by the emperor, the apostles, as I said before, made themselves manifest to all men. For, under a religious prince, the host of heaven do not hold themselves aloof from the affairs of men, but love to mingle with them, and rejoice in intercourse with mankind. Who could be silent about the church of Acacius, 16, which, being ruinous, he pulled down and built up again from its very foundations, adding wonderfully to its size. It rests on all sides upon brilliantly white columns, and its floor is covered with similar marble, from which so bright a light is reflected as to make one imagine that the whole church is covered with snow. Two porticos stand in front of it, the one supported on columns, and the other looking towards the forum. I was within a little of omitting to mention the church which was dedicated to Saint Plato the Martyr, 17, a truly worthy and noble building, not far from the forum, which is named after the Emperor Constantine, and likewise the church dedicated to the Martyr Mosius. 18, which is the largest of all these churches. Besides this, there is the Church of the Martyr Thesis, and the Church of Saint Theodorus, 19, standing outside the city in the place which is called Regis, and the Church of the Martyr Thecla, which is near the harbour named after Julian, and that of Street Theodota in the suburb which is called Hebdomen. All these were built from their foundations by this emperor during the reign of his uncle Justin, and are not easy to describe in words, while it is impossible to admire them sufficiently when beholding them. My narrative is now attracted to the Church of St. Agathonicus, 20, and I am forced to mention it, though I have no longer voice nor words befitting such a work let it be sufficient for me to have said thus much of it, I will leave the description of its beauty and sumptuousness in all respects to others to whom the subject is fresh, and who are not wearied out by their labours. v. Finding other churches in what is called the Anaplus, and along the coast of the opposite continent, which were not worthy to be dedicated to any of the saints, as also round the gulf which the natives call Serres, 21, after the name of Seroessa, the mother of Byzans, who was the founder of the city, he showed a royal munificence in all of them, as I will presently prove, 
having first said a few words about the glory which the sea adds to Byzantium. The prosperity of Byzantium is increased by the sea which enfolds it, contracting itself into straits, and connecting itself with the ocean, thus rendering the city remarkably beautiful, and affording a safe protection in its harbours to seafarers, so as to cause it to be well supplied with provisions and abounding with all necessaries, for the two seas which are on either side of it, that is to say, the Aegean and that which is called the Euchine, which meet at the east part of the city and dash together as they mingle their waves, separate the continent by their currents, and add to the beauty of the city while they surround it. It is, therefore, encompassed by three straits connected with one another, arranged so as to minister both to its elegance and its convenience, all of them most charming for sailing on, lovely to look at, and exceedingly safe for anchorage. The middle one of them, which leads from the Euchine Sea, makes straight for the city as though to adorn it. Upon either side of it lie the several continents, between whose shores it is confined, and seems to foam proudly with its waves because it passes over both Asia and Europe in order to reach the city, you would think that you beheld a river flowing towards you with a gentle current. That which is on the left hand of it rests on either side upon widely extended shores, and displays the groves, the lovely meadows, and all the other charms of the opposite continent in full view of the city. As it makes its way onward towards the south, receding as far as possible from Asia, it becomes wider, but even then its waves continue to encircle the city as far as the setting of the sun. The third arm of the sea joins the first one upon the right hand, starting from the place called Sisi, 22, and washes the greater part of the northern shore of the city, ending in a bay. Thus the sea encircles the city like a crown, the interval consisting of the land lying between it in sufficient quantity to form a clasp for the crown of waters. This gulf is always calm, and never crested into waves, as though a barrier were placed there. To the billows, and all storms were shut out from thence, through reverence for the city. Whenever strong winds and gales fall upon these seas and this strait, ships, when they once reach the entrance of this gulf, run the rest of their voyage unguided, and make the shore at random, for the gulf extends for a distance of more than forty stadia in circumference, and the whole of it is a harbour, so that when a ship is moored there the stern rests on the sea and the bows on the land, as though the two elements contended with one another to see which of them could be of the greatest service to the city. 6. Such is the appearance of this gulf, but the Emperor Justinian rendered it more lovely by the beauty of the buildings with which he surrounded it, for on the left side of it, he, to speak briefly, altered the church of Street. Laurentius the Martyr, which formerly was without windows and very dark, 23, into the appearance which it now presents, and in front of it he built the church of the Virgin, in the place which is called Blachonnet, as I described a little above. Behind it he built a new church to S.S. Priscus and Nicolaus, renewing the whole building. This is an especially favourite resort of the people of Byzantium, partly from their respect and reverence for the saints, which were their countrymen and partly to enjoy the beauty of the situation of the church, for the emperor drove back the waves of the sea, and laid the foundations as far among the billows as possible. At the upper part of the gulf, in a very steep and precipitous place, there was an ancient church of S.S. Cosmas and Damianus, where once 
These saints appeared on a sudden to the emperor as he lay grievously sick and apparently at the point of death, given up by his physicians, and already reckoned as dead, and miraculously made him whole. In order to repay their goodness, as far as a mortal man may do, he entirely altered and renewed the former building, which was unseemly and humble, and not worthy to be dedicated to such great saints, adorned the new church with beauty and size and brilliant light, and gave it many other things which it did not formerly possess. When men are suffering from diseases beyond the reach of physicians, and despair of human aid, they resort to the only hope which is left to them, and sail through this gulf in boats to this church. As soon as they begin their voyage they see this church standing as though on a lofty citadel, made beautiful by the gratitude of the emperor, and affording them hope that they too may partake of the benefits which flow from thence. On the opposite side of the gulf the emperor built a church which did not exist before, quite close to the shore of the gulf, and dedicated it to the martyr. Anthemus. The base of this temple, laved by the gentle wash of the sea, is most picturesque, for no lofty billows dash against its stones, nor does the wave resound like that of the open sea, or burst into masses of foam, but gently glides up to the land, silently laps against it, and quietly retreats. Beyond this is a level and very smooth court, adorned all round with marble columns, and rendered beautiful by its view of the sea. Next to this is a portico, beyond which rises the church, of a quadrangular form, adorned with beautiful marble and gildings. Its length only exceeds its breadth far enough to give room for the sanctuary, in which the sacred mysteries are performed, on the side which is turned towards the rising sun, such is the description of it. Seven beyond this, at the very mouth of the gulf, stands the church of the martyr Irene, 24, which the emperor has so magnificently constructed that I could not competently describe it, for, contending with the sea in his desire to beautify the gulf, he has built these churches as though he were placing gems upon a necklace, however, since I have mentioned this church of Irene, it will not be foreign to my purpose to describe what took place there. Here, from ancient times, rested the remains of no fewer than forty saints, who were Roman soldiers, and were enrolled in the Twelfth Legion, which formerly was stationed in the city of Melitene, in Armenia, now, when the Masons dug in the place which I just spoke of, they found a chest with an inscription stating that it contained the remains of these men. This chest, which had been forgotten, was at that time purposely brought to light by God, both with the object of proving to all men with how great joy he received the gifts of the emperor, and also in order to reward his good works by the bestowal of a still greater favor, for the emperor. Justinian was in ill health, and a large collection of humors in his knee caused him great pain. His illness arose from his own fault, for during all the days which precede the Paschal feast, and are called fast days, he practiced a severe abstinence, unfit not only for a prince, but even for a man who took no part in political matters. He used to pass two days entirely without food, and that, too, although he rose from his bed at early dawn to watch over the state, whose business he ever transacted, both by actions and words, early in the morning, at midday, and at night with equal zeal, for though he would retire to rest late at night, he would almost immediately arise, as though disliking his bed. Whenever he did take nourishment, he refrained from wine, 
bread, and all other food. Eating only herbs, and those wild ones which had been for a long time pickled in. Salt and vinegar, whilst water was his only drink. Yet he never ate to repletion. Even of these, but whenever he dined, he would merely taste this food, and then push it away, never eating sufficient. From this regimen his disease gathered strength, defying the efforts of physicians, and for a long time the emperor suffered from these pains. During this time, hearing of the discovery of the relics, he disregarded human art, and commended himself to them, deriving health from his faith in them, and finding healing in his bitterest need from his true faith, for as soon as the priests placed the pattern upon his knee, the disease at once vanished, forced out of a body dedicated to God. Not wishing that this matter should be disputed, God displayed a great sign as a testimony to this miracle. Oil suddenly poured forth from the holy relics, overflowed the chest, and besprinkled the feet and the purple garment of the emperor. Wherefore his tunic, thus saturated, is preserved in the palace as a testimony of what then took place, and for the healing of those who in future time may suffer from incurable disorders. 8 Thus did the Emperor Justinian adorn the gulf which is called the Horn. He also added great beauty to the shores of the other two straits, of which I lately made mention, in the following manner. There were two churches dedicated to Street Michael the Archangel, opposite to one another, on either side of the strait. The one in the place called Anaplus, 25, on the left hand as one sails into the Euchine Sea, and the other on the opposite shore. This place was called Prudus by the ancients, I suppose because it projects a long way from that shore, and is now called Brochi, the ignorance of the inhabitants having in process of time corrupted the name. The priests of these two churches perceiving that they were dilapidated by age, and fearing that they might presently fall down upon them, besought the emperor to restore them both to their former condition, for in his reign it was not possible for a church either to be built, or to be restored when ruined, except from the royal treasury, and that not only in Byzantium, but also everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. The Emperor, as soon as he obtained this opportunity, demolished both of them to the foundation, that no part of their former unseemliness might be left. He rebuilt the one in Anaplus, 26, in the following manner. He formed the shore into a curve within a mole of stone, which he erected as a protection to the harbour, and changed the sea beach into the appearance of a market for the sea, which is there very smooth, exchanges its produce with the land, and seafaring merchants, mooring their barks alongside the mole, exchange the merchandise from their decks for the produce of the country. Beyond this seaside market stands forth the vestibule of the church, whose marble vies in colour with ripe fruit and snow. Those who take their walks in this quarter are charmed with the beauty of the stone, are delighted with the view of the sea, and are refreshed with the breezes from the water and the hills which rise upon the land. A circular portico surrounds the church on all sides except the east. In the midst of it stands the church, adorned with marble of various colours. Above it is suspended a domed roof, who, after viewing it, could speak worthily of the lofty porticos, of the buildings within, of the grace of the marble with which the walls and foundations are everywhere encrusted. In addition to all this, a great quantity of gold is everywhere spread over the church, as though it grew upon it. In 
Describing this, I have also described the Church of Street. John the Baptist, 27. Which the Emperor Justinian lately erected in his honor in the place called Hebdomen, for both the two churches are very like each other, except only that. The Church of the Baptist does not happen to stand by the seashore. The Church of the Archangel, in the place called Anaplus, is built in the above manner, now upon the opposite shore there is a place at a little distance from the sea, which is level, and raised high upon a mass of stones. Here has been built a church in honor of the Archangel, of exceeding beauty, of the largest size, and in costliness worthy of being dedicated to the Archangel Michael by the Emperor Justinian. Not far from this church, he restored a church of the Virgin, which had fallen into ruins long before, whose magnificence it would take long to examine and to express in words, but here a long expected part of our history finds its place. Nine upon this shore there stood from ancient times a beautiful palace, the whole of this the Emperor Justinian dedicated to God, exchanging present enjoyment for the reward of his piety hereafter, in the following manner. There were at Byzantium a number of women who were prostituted in a brothel, not willingly, but compelled to exercise their profession, for under pressure of poverty they were compelled by the procurer who kept them to act in this manner, and to offer themselves to unknown and casual passers-by. There was here from ancient times a guild of brothel keepers, who not only carried on their profession in this building, but publicly bought their victims in the market, and forced them into an unchaste life. However, the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora, who performed all their works of piety in common, devised the following scheme. They cleansed the state from the pollution of these brothels, drove out the procurers, and set free these women who had been driven to evil courses by their poverty, providing them with a sufficient maintenance, and enabling them to live chaste as well as free. This was arranged in the following manner, they changed the palace, which stood on the right hand as one sails into the Euchine Sea, into a magnificent convent, to serve as a refuge for women who had repented of their former life, in order that their spending their lives in devotion to God, and in continual works of piety, they might wash away the sins of their former life of shame, wherefore this dwelling of these women is called from their work by the name of the penitentiary. The princes endowed this convent with large revenues, and furnished it with many buildings of exceeding great beauty and costliness for the comfort of these women, so that none of them might be forced by any circumstances to relax their practice of chastity so much. Then for this part of the subject, as one sails from this place towards the Euchine Sea, there is a lofty promontory jutting out from the shore of the strait, upon which stood a church of the martyr Saint Pantlemon. 28, which, having been originally carelessly built, and having been much ruined by lapse of time, was taken down by the Emperor Justinian, who built the church which now stands there with the greatest magnificence, and both preserved the honor due to the martyr and added beauty to the strait by building on each side of it the churches which I have mentioned. Beyond this church, in a place which is called Argyronium, there was, in old times, a hospital for poor men afflicted with incurable diseases, which having in the course of time fallen into the last stage of decay, he most zealously restored to serve as a refuge for those who were thus afflicted. Near this place there is a district by the seaside called Moshadius which is also called Hiron. Here he 
built a temple in honor of the Archangel of Remarkable Splendor, and in no respect inferior to those churches of the Archangel, of which I spoke just now. He also built a church dedicated to Street Trifon the Martyr, decorated with much labor and time to an indescribable pitch of beauty, in that street of the city, which is called by the name of the Stork. Furthermore, he built a church in the Hebdomen, in honor of the martyrs Minas, 29, and Menesis, and finding that the church of Street Ias the Martyr, which is on the left hand as one enters the Golden Gate, was in ruins. He restored it with a lavish expenditure. This is what was done by the Emperor Justinian in connection with the churches in Byzantium, but to describe all his works throughout the entire Roman Empire in detail, is a difficult task, and altogether impossible to express in words, but whenever I shall have to make mention of the name of any city or district, I shall take the opportunity of describing the churches in it. X the above were the works of the Emperor Justinian upon the churches of Constantinople and its suburbs, but as to the other buildings constructed by him, it would not be easy to mention them all. However, to sum up matters, he rebuilt and much improved in beauty the largest and most considerable part both of the city and of the palace which had been burned down and leveled with the ground. It appears unnecessary for me to enter into particulars on this subject at present, since it has all been minutely described in my history of the wars. For the present I shall only say this much, that the vestibule of the palace and that which is called Charles, as far as what is known as the House of Oz, and Outside the palace the public baths of Zeuchippus, 30, and the great porticos and all the buildings on either hand, as far as the Forum of Constantine, are the works of this emperor. In addition to these, he restored and added great magnificence to the house named after Hormistus, which stands close to the palace, rendering it worthy of the palace, to which he joined it and thereby rendered it much more roomy and worthy of admiration on that side. In front of the palace there is a forum surrounded with columns. The Byzantines call this forum the Augusta Elm. I mentioned it in a former part of this work, when, after describing the Church of Street Sophia, I spoke of the brazen statue of the Emperor which stands upon a very lofty column of stones as a memorial of that work. On the eastern side of this forum stands the Senate House, which baffles description by its costliness and entire arrangement, and which was the work of the Emperor Justinian. Here at the beginning of every year the Roman Senate holds an annual festival, according to the custom of the state. Six columns stand in front of it, two of them having between them that wall of the Senate House which looks towards the west, while the four others stand a little beyond it. These columns are all white in color, and in size, I imagine, are the largest columns in the whole world. They form a portico, covered by a circular dome-shaped roof. The upper parts of this portico are all adorned with marble equal in beauty to that of the columns, and are wonderfully ornamented with a number of statues standing on the roof. Not far from this forum stands the Emperor's Palace, which, as I have said before, was almost entirely rebuilt by the Emperor Justinian. To describe it all in words is impossible but it will suffice for future generations to know that it was all the work of this emperor. As, according to the proverb, we know the lion by his claw, so my readers will learn the magnificence of this palace from the entrance hall. This entrance hall is the building called Charles, its four walls 
stand in a quadrangular form, and are very lofty, they are equal to one another in all respects, except that those on the north and south sides are a little shorter than the others. In each angle of them stands a pier of very well-wrought stone. Reaching from the floor to the summit of the wall, quadrangular in form and joining the wall on one of its sides, they do not in any way destroy the beauty of the place, but even add ornament to it by the symmetry of their position. Above the are suspended eight arches, four of which support the roof, which rises above the whole work in a spherical form, whilst the others, two of which rest on the neighboring wall towards the south and two towards the north, support the arched roof which is suspended over those spaces. The entire ceiling is decorated with paintings, not formed of melted wax poured upon it, but composed of tiny stones adorned with all manner of colors, imitating human figures and everything else in nature. I will now describe the subjects of these paintings. Upon either side are wars and battles, and the capture of numberless cities, some in Italy, and some in Libya. Here the Emperor Justinian conquers by his general Belisarius, and here the general returns to the Emperor, bringing with him his entire army unscathed, and offers to him the spoils of victory, kings, and kingdoms, and all that is most valued among men. In the midst stand the Emperor and the Empress Theodora, both of them seeming to rejoice and hold high festival in honor of their victory over the kings of the Vandals and the Goths, who approach them as prisoners of war led in triumph. Around them stands the Senate of Rome, all in festal array, which is shown in the mosaic by the joy which appears on their countenances, they swell with pride and smile upon the emperor, offering him honors as though to a demigod, after his magnificent achievements. The whole interior, not only the upright parts, but also the floor itself, is encrusted with beautiful marbles, reaching up to the mosaics of the ceiling. Of these marbles, some are of a Spartan stone equal to emerald, while some resemble a flame of fire, the greater part of them are white. Yet not a plain white, but ornamented with wavy lines of dark blue. 31. So much for this building. 11. As one sails from the Propentis towards the eastern part of the city, there is a public bath on the left hand which is called the Baths of Arcadius, and which forms an ornament to the city of Constantinople, great as it is. Here our emperor constructed a court standing outside the city, intended as a promenade for the inhabitants, and a mooring place for those who sail past it. This court is lighted by the sun when rising, but is conveniently shaded when he proceeds towards the west. Round it the sea flows quietly with a gentle stream, coming like a river from the main sea, so that those who are taking their walks in it are able to converse with those who are sailing, for the sea reaches up to the basement of the court with great depth, navigable for ships, and by its remarkable calm, enables those on the water and on the land to converse with one another. Such is the side of the court which looks upon the sea, adorned with the view over it, and refreshed with the gentle breezes from it, its basement, its columns, and its entablature are all covered with marble of great beauty, whose color is of a most brilliant white, which glitters magnificently in the rays of the sun. Moreover, many statues adorn it, some of brass and some of marble, composing a sight well worth mention, one would conjecture that they were the work of Phidias the Athenian, of Lysippus of Sicyon, or of Praxiteles. Here also is a statue of the Empress Theodora on a column, which was erected in her honor. 
by the city as an offering of gratitude for this court. The face of the statue is beautiful, but falls short of the beauty of the Empress, since it is utterly impossible for any mere human workman to express her loveliness, or to imitate it in a statue, the column is of porphyry, and clearly shows by its magnificent appearance that it carries the Empress, before one sees the statue. I will now explain the Emperor's works to afford an abundant supply of water to the city. In summertime the imperial city used for the most part to suffer from scarcity of water, although at other seasons it had sufficient, for at that time, in consequence of the drought, the fountains flowed less plenteously than at other seasons, and supplied the aqueducts of the city very sparingly. Wherefore the emperor devised the following plan. In the portico of the emperor, where the advocates, and magistrates, and other persons connected with the law transact business, there is a very lofty court of great length and width, quadrangular in shape, and surrounded with columns, which is not constructed upon an earthen foundation, but upon the rock itself. Four porticos surround this court, one upon each side of it. The Emperor Justinian excavated one of these porticos, that upon the south side, to a great depth, and stored up there the superfluity of water from the other seasons for use in summer. These cisterns receive the overflow from the aqueducts, when they are too full of water giving them a place to overflow into, and afford a supply in time of need when water becomes scarce. Thus did the Emperor Justinian arrange that the people of Byzantium should not want for sweet water. He also built new palaces elsewhere, one in the Hirum, 32, which is now called the Hirium, and in the place called Jucundiana. I am unable to describe either the magnificence or exquisite workmanship, or the size of these palaces in a manner worthy of the subject. Suffice it to say that these palaces stand there, and were built in the presence and according to the plans of Justinian, who disregarded nothing except expense, which was so large that the mind is unable to grasp it. Here also he constructed a sheltered harbour, which did not exist before. Finding that the shore was exposed on both sides to the winds and the violence of the waves, he arranged a place of refuge for mariners in the following manner, he constructed what are called chests, of countless number, and of great size, flung them into the sea on each side of the beach in an oblique direction, and by continually placing fresh layers in order upon the others, formed two walls in the sea opposite to one another, reaching from the depths below to the surface of the water on which the ships sail, upon this he flung rough stones, which when struck by the waves break their force, so that when a strong wind blows in the winter season, everything between these walls remains calm an interval being left between them to serve as an entrance for ships into the harbour. Here also he built the churches which I formerly mentioned, and also porticos, marketplaces, public baths, and everything else of that sort, so that this palace in no respect falls short of that within the city. He also built another harbour on the opposite continent, in the place which is called after the name of Europius, not very far from the Hirum, constructed in the same manner as that which I mentioned above. The above are, described as briefly as possible, the works of the Emperor Justinian in the Imperial City. I will now describe the only thing which remains. Since the Emperor dwells here, a multitude of men of all nations comes into the city from all the world, in consequence of the vast extent of the empire, each one 
of them led thither either by business, by hope, or by chance, many of whom, whose affairs at home have fallen into disorder, come with the intention of offering some petition to the emperor. These persons, forced to dwell in the city, on account of some present or threatened misfortune, in addition to their other trouble are also in want of lodging, being unable to pay for a dwelling place. During their stay in the city, this source of misery was removed from them by the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora, who built very large hospices as places of refuge in time of need for such unfortunate persons as these close to the sea, in the place which is called the stadium, I suppose because in former times it was used for public games. Note dot, for the interesting church of the Kura, see appendix. Book 2. I the new churches which the Emperor Justinian built in Constantinople and its suburbs, the churches which were ruinous through age, and which he restored, and all the other buildings which he erected there, are described in my previous book, it remains that we should proceed to the fortresses with which he encircled the frontier of the Roman territory. This subject requires great labor, and indeed is almost impossible to describe, we are not about to describe the pyramids, that celebrated work of the kings of Egypt, in which labor was wasted on a useless freak, but all the strong places by means of which our emperor preserved the empire, and so fortified it as to render vain any attempt of the barbarians against the Romans. I think I should do well to start from the Median frontier. When the Medes retired from the country of the Romans, restoring to them the city of Amida, 33, as has been narrated in my history of the wars the Emperor Anastasius took great pains to build a wall round an, at that time, unimportant village named Dara, which he observed was situated near the Persian frontier, and to form it into a city which would act as a bulwark against the enemy. Since, however, by the terms of the treaty formerly made by the Emperor Theodosius, with the Persians, it was forbidden that either party should build any new fortress. On their own ground in the neighborhood of the frontier, the Persians urged that. This was forbidden by the Articles of the Peace, and hindered the work with all. Their power, although their attention was diverted from it by their war with the. Huns. The Romans, perceiving that on account of this war they were unprepared pushed on their building all the more vigorously, being eager to finish the work. Before the enemy should bring their war against the Huns to a close and march against themselves, being alarmed through their suspicions of the enemy, and constantly expecting an attack, they did not construct their building carefully, but the quickness of building into which they were forced by their excessive hurry prevented their work being secure, for speed and safety are never wont to go together, nor is swiftness often accompanied by accuracy. They therefore built the city walls in this hurried fashion, not making a wall which would defy the enemy, but raising it barely to the necessary height, nor did they even place the stones in their right positions or arrange them in due order or fill the interstices with mortar. In a short time, therefore, since the towers, through their insecure construction, were far from being able to withstand snow and hot sun, most of them fell into ruins. Thus was the first wall built round the city of Dara. 34. Fortifications at Dara from Texia and Pullen's Byzantine architecture. It occurred to the Emperor Justinian that the Persians would not, as far as lay in their power, permit this Roman fortress to stand threatening them, but that they would march against it with their entire force, and use every device to 
assault its walls on equal terms, and that a number of elephants would accompany them, bearing wooden towers upon their backs, which towers instead of foundations would rest upon the elephants, who, and this was the worst of all, could maneuver round the city at the pleasure of the enemy, and carry a wall, which could be moved whithersoever its masters might think fit, and the enemy, mounted upon these towers, would shoot down upon the heads of the Romans, within the walls, and assail them from above, they would also pile up mounds of earth against the walls, and bring up to them all the machines used in sieges. While if any misfortune should befall the city of Dara, which was an outwork of the entire Roman Empire and a standing menace to the enemy's country, the evil would not rest there, but the whole state would be endangered to a great extent. Moved by these considerations he determined to fortify the place in a manner worthy of its value. In the first place, 35, therefore, since the wall was, as I have described, very low, and therefore easily assailable, he rendered it inaccessible and altogether impregnable. He placed stones which so contracted the original battlements as only to leave small traces of them, like windows, allowing just so much opening to them as a hand could be passed through, so that passages were left through, which arrows could be shot against the assailants. Above these he built a wall to a height of about thirty feet, not making the wall of the same thickness all the way to the top, lest the foundations should be overweighted by the mass above, and the whole work be ruined, but he surrounded the upper part with a course of stones and built a portico extending round the entire circuit of the walls, above which he placed the battlements, so that the wall was throughout constructed of two stories, and the towers of three stories, which could be manned by the defenders to repel the attacks of the enemy, for over the middle of the towers he constructed a vaulted roof, and again built new battlements above it, thus making them into a fortification consisting of three stories. After this, though he saw, as I have said before, that many of the towers had, after a short time fallen into ruin, yet he was not able to take them down, because the enemy were always close at hand, watching their opportunity, and always trying to find some unprotected part of the fortifications. He therefore devised the following plan, he left these towers where they were, and outside of each of them he constructed another building with great skill, in a quadrangular form, well and securely built. In the same manner he securely protected the ruinous parts of the walls with a second wall. One of these towers, which was called the Watchtower, he seized an opportunity of demolishing rebuilt it securely, and everywhere removed all fear of want of strength from the walls. He wisely built the outside part of the wall to a sufficient height, in due proportion, outside of it. He dug a ditch, not in the way in which men usually make one, but in a small space, and in a different fashion. With what object he did this, I will now explain. The greater part of the walls are inaccessible to besiegers, because they do not stand upon level ground, nor in such a manner as would favor an attack, but upon high precipitous rocks where it would not be possible to undermine them, or to make any assault upon them, but upon the side turned towards the south. The ground, which is soft and earthy and easily dug, renders the city assailable. Here, therefore, he dug a crescent-shaped ditch, deep and wide, and reaching to a considerable distance. Each end of this ditch joined the city wall, and by filling it with water he rendered it altogether impassable to the enemy. On the inner side, 
Of it he built a second wall, upon which during a siege the Roman soldiers keep. God, without fear for the walls themselves and for the other outwork which stands before the city. Between the city wall and this outwork, opposite the gate, which leads towards Amadeus, there was a great mound, from which the enemy were able to drive mines towards the city unperceived. This he entirely removed, and leveled the spot, so as to put it out of the enemy's power to assault the place from thence. Too thus did Justinian fortify this stronghold winking sad smiley 36, he also constructed reservoirs of water between the city walls and the outwork, and very close to the church of Street. Bartholomew the Apostle, on the west side. A river runs from the suburb. Called Cord, distant about two miles from the city. Upon either side of it rise. Two exceedingly rugged mountains. Between the slopes of these mountains the river runs as far as the city, and since it flows at the foot of them, it is not possible for an enemy to divert or meddle with its stream, for they cannot force it out of the hollow ground. It is directed into the city in the following manner. The inhabitants have built a great channel leading to the walls the mouth of which is closed with numerous thick bars of iron, some upright and some placed crosswise, so as to enable the water to enter the city, without injury to the strength of its fortifications. Thus the river enters the city, and after having filled these reservoirs, and been led hither and thither at the pleasure of the inhabitants, passes into another part of the city, where there is an outfall constructed for it in the same way as its entrance. The river in its progress through the flat country made the city in former times easy to be besieged, for it was not difficult for an enemy to encamp there, because water was plentiful. The Emperor Justinian considered this state of things, and tried to find some remedy for it, God. However, assisted him in his difficulty, took the matter into his own hands, and without delay ensured the safety of the city. This took place in the following manner. One of the garrison of the city, either in consequence of a dream or led of his own accord to it, collected together a great number of the workmen engaged in building the fortifications and ordered them to dig a long trench in a certain place, which he pointed out to them, a considerable distance within the city wall, declaring that they would there find sweet water flowing out of the ground. He dug this trench in a circular form, making the depth of it for the most part about 15 feet. This work proved the saving of the city, not through any foresight of the workmen, yet, by means of this trench, what would have been a misfortune, was turned into a great advantage to the Romans, for, as during this time very heavy rain fell, the river, of which I just spoke, raged outside the fortifications and rose to a great height, being unable to proceed, because when it was swollen to such a size neither the channel nor the entrances in the wall were large enough to contain it, as they had been before. It consequently piled up its waters against the wall, rising to a great height and depth, and in some places was stagnant, and in others rough and violent. It at once overthrew the outwork, swept away a great part of the city wall, forced its way through the city gates, and, running with a great body of water, occupied almost the whole city, invading both the market place, the narrower streets, and the houses themselves, swept off from them a great mass of furniture, wooden vessels, and such like things, and then, falling into this trench, disappeared underground. Not many days afterwards it 
reappeared near to the city of Theodosiopolis, at a place about 40 miles distant from the city of Dara, where it was recognized by the things which it had swept away out of the houses at Dara, for there the whole mass of them reappeared. Since that period, in time of peace and quiet, the river flows through the midst of the city, fills the reservoirs with water, and passes out of the city through the outfall especially constructed for it by the builders of the city, which I described above, and, as it supplies that region with water, becomes a great boon to the inhabitants of the neighborhood. When, however, a hostile army advances to besiege the city, they close the passages through the iron gratings with what are called sluice doors, and at once force the river to change its course and to flow into the trench and the subterranean gulf beyond, so that the enemy suffer from want of water and are at once obliged to raise the siege. Indeed Mirans, the Persian general, in the reign of Cabots, came thither to besiege the city, and was compelled by all these difficulties to retire baffled after a short time, and a long while afterwards, Kisros himself advanced with the same intentions, and attacked the city with a numerous army, but being driven to great straits through want of water, and perceiving the height of the walls, he imagined the place to be entirely impregnable, gave up his project, and straightway retired into Persia. Being outgeneraled by the foresight of the Roman Emperor. Three such were the works of the Emperor Justinian in the city of Dara. I shall now describe what he arranged to prevent any second misfortune happening to the city from the river, in which matter his wishes were manifestly assisted by heaven. There was one Chryses of Alexandria, a clever engineer, who served the emperor as an architect, and constructed most of the works both in the city of Dara and in the rest of the country. This Chryses was absent when the misfortune from the river befell the city of Dara, when he heard of it, he retired to bed in great grief, and dreamed the following dream, a figure of more than human. Stature appeared to him, and showed and explained to him a device which would protect the city from any dangerous inundation of the river. He, conceiving this idea to be divinely inspired, at once wrote an account of the device and of the vision, and sent it to the emperor, giving a sketch of what he had been taught in his dream. It happened that not long before this a message reached the emperor from the city of Dara, giving him an account of what had happened with the river. Thereupon the emperor, disturbed and alarmed at what had taken place, straightway summoned those most celebrated architects, Anthemius and Isidorus, whom I have mentioned before. He informed them of what had happened, and inquired what arrangement could be devised to prevent this mischief befalling the city a second time. Each of them described what he considered to be a suitable plan for this purpose, but the emperor, evidently acting under a divine impulse, although he had not yet seen the letter of Chryses, miraculously invented and sketched out of his own mind the plan suggested by the dream. The interview terminated without the adoption of any distinct plan and without their deciding upon what was to be done, but three days afterwards came a messenger to the emperor, who brought the letter from Chryses, and who explained the form of the arrangement which he had seen in his dream. The emperor now again sent for the architects, and ordered them to recall to mind their former ideas of what ought to be done. They repeated everything in order. Both their own devices and the spontaneous inventions of the emperor, after which the emperor brought forward the messenger sent from Chryses, and 
showing them the letter and the sketch of what he had seen in his dream, caused them to wonder greatly, when they perceived how heaven had assisted our emperor in everything for the advantage of the empire. The plan of the emperor accordingly won the day, and triumphed over the art and learning of the architects. Chryses returned to the city of Dara, with orders from the emperor to carry out the work which he had described with all speed, according to the plan revealed in the dream. He carried out his orders in the following manner. In a place about forty feet distant from the outwork of the city, across the valley in which the river runs between the two mountains, he constructed a barrier of considerable height and width, joining each end of it to the mountain. On either side, in such a manner that the water of the river in its strongest flood could never force its way through it. This work is called by those who are learned in such matters a dam, or sluice, or whatever else they please. He did not build this barrier in a straight line, but in the form of a crescent, in order that its arch, which was turned against the stream of the water, might be better able to resist its violence. The upper and lower parts of this barrier are pierced with apertures, so that, when the river suddenly rises in flood, it is forced to stop there and to flow no further with the entire weight of its stream, but passing in small quantities through these apertures it gradually diminishes in violence and power. And the wall is never damaged by it, for the flow of water, collecting in the place, which, as I have said before, is about forty feet in length, lying between the barrier and the outwork, is never unmanageable, but runs gently to its usual entrance, and thence is received in the artificial channel. As for the gate, which the fury of the river broke open in former times, he removed it from thence, and blocked up its site with enormous stones, because this gate, being situated on flat ground, was easily reached by the river when in flood, but he placed the gate not far off, in a lofty place in the most precipitous part of the circuit of the walls, which it was impossible for the river to reach. Thus did the emperor arrange these matters. The inhabitants of this city suffered greatly from the want of water, for their was no fountain springing out of the ground, nor was any water carried about the streets in an aqueduct, or stored up in cisterns, but those who lived in the streets through which the river passed could draw drinking water from it without trouble, while those who dwelt at a distance from the course of the river had either to fetch their drinking water with great trouble or to perish with thirst. However, the Emperor Justinian constructed a great aqueduct, by which he brought the water to every part of the city, and relieved the distress of the inhabitants. He also built two churches, that which is called the Great Church, and the Church of Street. Bartholomew the Apostle. 37. Moreover, he built very spacious barracks for the soldiers that they might not inconvenience the inhabitants. Not long after this he restored the wall and outworks of the city of Amida, which had been built in former times, and were thought likely to fall into ruins, thus ensuring the safety of that city. I am now about to speak of his buildings in the forts which stand on the frontier of the territory of these cities. For as one goes from the city of Dara towards the land of Persia, there lies on the left a tract entirely impassable for carriages or horses, extending to the distance of about two days' journey for a lightly equipped traveller, ending in an abrupt and precipitous place called Rabdium. 38. The land on each side of this road to Rabdium belongs for a great distance to Persia. When I first saw this I was surprised at it, and inquired of the people of the country how it was that a 
road and tract belonging to the Romans should have enemies' land on each side of it. They answered, that this country once belonged to the Persians, but that at the request of the king of Persia one of the Roman emperors gave a village abounding in vines near Martiopolis, 39, and received this region in exchange for it. The city of Rabdium stands upon precipitous and wild rocks, which there rise to a wondrous height, below it is a region which they call the field of the Romans out of wonder, I suppose, at its belonging to the Romans, though it lies in the midst of the Persian country. This Roman field lies on flat ground, and is fruitful in all kinds of crops, one might conjecture this from the fact that the Persian frontier surrounds it on every side. There is a very celebrated fort in Persia, named Cicerinum, which the Emperor Justinian once captured and razed to the ground, taking prisoners a great number of Persian cavalry, together with their leader Blistians. This place lies at a distance of two days' journey from Dara for a lightly equipped traveller, and is about three miles distant from Rabdium. It was formerly unguarded, and altogether neglected by the Romans, so that it never received from them any garrison, fortification, or any other benefit, wherefore the peasants who tilled this country, of which I just spoke, besides the ordinary taxes, paid an annual tribute of fifty gold pieces to the Persians, in order that they might possess their lands and enjoy the produce of them in security. All this was altered for them by the Emperor Justinian, who enclosed Rabdium with fortifications, which he built upon the summit of the mountain which rises there, and, taking advantage of the position of the ground, rendered it impossible for the enemy to approach it. As those who dwelt in it were in want of water, there being no springs on the top of the cliff, he constructed two cisterns, and by digging into the rocks in many places made large reservoirs of water, so that the rainwater might collect, and the garrison might use it freely, and not be liable to capture through distress for want of water. He also rebuilt solidly, and gave their present beauty and strength to all the other mountain forts, which reach from this point and from the city of Dara to Amida, namely, Saifi, Sri, Smargdis, Lerns, Hyarifthan, Ataki, Cyphris, Ripalti, Benasimon, and also Sina, Razius, Dabani, and all the others, which were built there in ancient times, and which before this were constructed in a contemptible fashion, but which he made into an impregnable line of outposts along the Roman frontier. In this region there stands a very lofty mountain, precipitous, and altogether inaccessible, the plain below it is rich and free from rocks, suitable both for arable and pasture land, for it abounds in grass. There are many villages at the foot of this mountain, whose inhabitants are rich in the produce of the country, but lie exposed to the attacks of the enemy. This was remedied by the Emperor Justinian, who built a fort upon the summit of the mountain, in which they might place their most valued possessions, and themselves take refuge at the approach of the enemy. This is named the fort of the emperors. Moreover, he carefully rebuilt and safely fortified the forts in the neighborhood of the city of Amida which before were only surrounded by mud walls, and were incapable of defense. Among these were Apadne and the little fort of Bertham, for it is not easy to set down all their names in detail, but speaking generally, he found them all exposed to attack, and has now rendered them impregnable, and since his time Mesopotamia has become quite protected against the Persian nation.
nor must I pass over in silence what he devised at the fort of Barra, of which I just now spoke. The interior of this fort was entirely without water, and Barra is built upon the precipitous summit of a lofty mountain. Outside its walls, at a great distance, at the bottom of the hill, there was a fountain which it was not thought advisable to include within the fortification, lest the part which was situated upon the low ground should be open to attack. He therefore devised the following plan. He ordered them to dig within the walls until they reached the level of the plain. When this was done in accordance with the emperor's order, to their surprise they found the water of the fountain flowing there, thus the fort was both constructed securely and conveniently situated with regard to water supply. V. In the same manner, since the walls of Theodosiopolis, 40, the bulwark of the Roman Empire on the river Aborus, had become so decayed by age that the inhabitants derived no confidence from their strength, but rather terror, as they feared that before long they would fall down, the emperor rebuilt them for the most part, so that they were able to check the invasions of the Persians into Mesopotamia. It is worth describing what he did at Constantina. The original wall of Constantina was so low that a ladder would easily reach the top, and in its construction was greatly exposed to attack, and seemed hardly to have been built in earnest for the towers were of such a distance from one another, that if the assailants attacked the space between them, the garrison of the towers would be too far off to drive them back, moreover, the greater part of it was so ruinous from age that it seemed likely soon to fall. In addition to this, the city had an outwork which was more like a siege work to enable the enemy to attack it, for it was not more than three feet in thickness, cemented with mud, the lower part of it built of rock fit for making millstones, but the upper part of what is called white stone, which is not to be trusted and is very soft, so that the whole work might easily be captured. However, the Emperor Justinian rebuilt the decayed part of the walls, more especially on the west and north sides between every two towers of the wall he placed the third, so that since his time all the towers for the defense of the wall stand close together. He also greatly raised the height of the wall and of all the towers, so as to render the place impregnable to an enemy. Moreover, he built covered approaches to the towers, each of which towers contained three stories of vaulted stone so that each one of them was called and really was a castle in itself, for what the Greeks call Fraurian is called a castle in the Latin tongue. Besides this, Constantina used formerly to be reduced to great straits for want of water, there are indeed wells of good water outside the walls at the distance of a mile, round which grows a large wood of very lofty trees within the walls, however, since the streets are not built upon level but upon sloping ground, the city in ancient times was waterless, and its inhabitants suffered much from thirst and the difficulty of obtaining water, but the Emperor Justinian brought the water within the walls by means of an aqueduct, adorned the city with overflowing fountains, and may justly be termed its founder. These were the works of the Emperor Justinian in these cities. 6. The Romans had a fort by the side of the river Euphrates on the extreme frontier of Mesopotamia, at the place where the river Aborus, 41, effects its junction with the Euphrates. This fort was named Circisium, 42, and had been built in former times by the Emperor Diocletian, however, our present emperor, Justinian, finding that it had become ruinous through lapse of time, and was 
neglected and not in a posture of defense, altered it into a strong fortification, and made it into a city of eminent size and beauty. When Diocletian built the fort, he did not completely surround it with a wall, but brought each end of the walls down to the river Euphrates, built a tower at each end of them, and left the side between them entirely unfortified, imagining, I suppose, that the waters of the river would suffice to defend the fort on that side. In the course of time, however, the stream of the river, continually eating away the bank, undermined the tower on the south side, and it became evident that unless prompt measures were taken it would shortly fall. Now appeared the Emperor Justinian, entrusted by heaven with the glory of watching over, and, as far as one man can do, of restoring the Roman Empire. He not only saved the undermined tower, which he rebuilt of a hard stone, but also enclosed all the unprotected side of the fort with a very strong wall, thus doubling its security by adding the strength which it derived from the wall to that afforded by the river. Besides this, he also built a powerful outwork round the city, especially at the spot where the junction of the two rivers forms a triangular space, and thus left no place exposed to the attacks of the enemy. Moreover, he appointed a general who had the title of Duke, and who always resided there with a garrison of picked soldiers, thus rendering the place a sufficient bulwark for the frontier of the empire. He also rebuilt in its present splendor the public bath which is used by the inhabitants, which had become quite ruinous and useless by the incursions of the river for he found all that part of it which is suspended above the solid foundation for the convenience of bathers, underneath which the fire is placed, and which is called the hypercost, exposed to the influx of the river, by which the bath was rendered useless, he therefore strengthened with stonework, as I have said, the part which formerly had been hollow, and built another hypercost above it, which the river could not reach, thus restoring the enjoyment of the bath to the garrison. In this manner did our emperor restore the buildings of Circisium. Beyond Circisium there is an ancient fort named Anucus, whose wall the emperor Justinian found a mere ruin, and which he rebuilt in so magnificent a fashion that its defences vie with those of the most celebrated cities, and in the same manner he rendered formidable, and altogether unapproachable by an enemy, those forts situated near the city of Theodosiopolis, which before his time were either without walls, or only walled with mud and absurd heaps of stones. These are Magdala Thumb, with two others on either side of it, and the two forts, the Great and Little Thanorum, Bismidim, Themares, Bedemars, Dorseron, Theola, Phile, Zimathas, and, one may say, all the rest. There was an extensive position near Thanorum, which could easily be occupied by our enemies the Saracens, by crossing the river Aborus, from which point they were able to penetrate in small parties into the thick and extensive forest and the mountain which is situated in that region, and make inroads upon the Roman inhabitants of that country. Now, however, the Emperor Justinian has built a tower of hard stone in that place, manned it with a considerable garrison, and has altogether repressed the incursions of the enemy by the establishment of this bulwark against them. 7. The above other works of the Emperor Justinian in this part of Mesopotamia, I must speak in this place of Edessa, Carhe, Corleacum, and all the other strong places which are in that country, since they lie between the two rivers. Edessa, 43, 
stands on the banks of a small stream called Certus, which collects its waters from many places, and runs through the midst of the city. From thence it passes onwards, after having supplied the wants of the city. Effecting its entrance and exit through by a channel constructed by former generations, which passes through the city walls. This river once, after much rain, rose to a great height, and seemed as though it would destroy the city, it tore down a large part of the outworks and of the walls, inundated almost the whole city, and did much damage, suddenly destroying the finest buildings, and drowning a third part of the inhabitants. The Emperor Justinian not only at once restored all the buildings of the city which were overthrown, among which were the Church of the Christians and a building called Antiphras, but also arranged with great care that no such disaster should ever again occur, for he made a new channel for the river, outside the city walls, which he arranged in the following manner. The ground on the right bank of the river was formerly flat and low, lying, while that on the left was a precipitous mountain, which did not allow the river to turn aside from its accustomed course, but forced it to flow into the city. Because when flowing towards the city it met with no obstacle on its right bank. He therefore dug away the whole of this mountain, making a channel on the left bank of the river deeper than its former bed, and built on the right bank an enormous wall of stones, as large as a wagon could carry, so that if the river ran as usual with a moderate volume the city would not be deprived of the convenience of its water, but if it should be swollen into a flood a moderate stream would run as usual throughout the city, but the excess of water would be forced into this channel constructed by Justinian, and thus extraordinarily conquered by human art and skill might run round the back of the race course, which is situated not far off. Moreover he forced the river within the city to run in a straight course, by building a wall above it on either side, so that it could not turn out of a straight path, by which means he both preserved the use of it for the city, and removed all fear of it for the future. The wall and outwork of Edessa, like those of the other places, had for the most part fallen into ruins through age. Wherefore the emperor restored them both, making them new and much stronger than they were before. Part of the wall of Edessa is occupied by a fort, outside of which rises a hill very close to the city and overhanging it. This hill was in ancient times occupied by the inhabitants, and included in their walls by an outwork, that it might not form a weak point to the city. Their work, however, made the city much more open to assault in that quarter, for their outwork was very low, built on an exposed site, and could be taken even by children playing at sieges. Justinian therefore took it down and built another wall on the top of the hill, which is in no danger of an assault from higher ground in any quarter, and which follows the slope of the hill down to the level ground on both sides, and joins the city wall. 44. Edessa. From Texia and Pullen's Byzantine architecture. Columns on a terrace of the castle. Also at the cities of Carhe, 45, and Corleacum, 46, he destroyed the walls and outworks, which were much impaired by age, and rendered them impregnable by building the present complete fortifications, he also built a strong wall round the unprotected and neglected fort at Batne, 47, and gave it the fine appearance which it now presents. Eight these, as I have said before, were the works of the Emperor Justinian in Mesopotamia and Oshuen. I will now describe what was done on the right bank of the river Euphrates. In all other parts the Roman and Persian frontiers 
border upon one another, and each nation proceeds from its own country to make war and peace with the other, as all men of different habits and empires do when they have a common frontier, but in the province which was formerly called Comagen, which is now called Euphrasia, they dwell nowhere near to one another, for the Roman and Persian frontiers are widely parted by a country which is quite desert and devoid of life, and possesses nothing worth fighting for. Yet each nation, though not regarding it as a work of much importance, has built a chain of forts of unbaked brick where the desert borders upon their inhabited country. None of these forts have ever been assaulted by their neighbors, but the two nations dwell there without any ill feeling, since there is nothing for either of them to covet, however, the Emperor Diocletian built three of these forts in this desert, one of which, named Mambri, had fallen into ruin through age, and was restored by the Emperor Justinian. About five miles from this fort, as you go towards the Roman country, Zenobia, the wife of Odnathus, the chief of the Saracens in those parts, built a small city in former times and gave it her own name, calling it Zenobia. 48. Since then, long lapse of time brought its walls to ruin, and as the Romans did not think it worth caring for, it became entirely uninhabited. Thus the Persians, whenever they chose, were able to place themselves in the midst of the Romans. Before any news had been heard of their coming, however, the Emperor Justinian rebuilt the whole of Zenobia, filled it with numerous inhabitants, placed in it a commander with a garrison of regular soldiers, and thus formed a powerful fortress, a bulwark of the Roman Empire and a check upon the Persians. He did not merely restore it to its former appearance, but made it far stronger than it was before. The place is closely surrounded by high cliffs, from which the enemy were formerly able to shoot down upon the heads of the defenders of the wall. Being desirous to avoid this, he constructed a building upon the walls, on the side nearest these cliffs, which might always act as a protection to the defenders. This building is called a wing because it appears to hang upon the wall. Indeed, it is not possible to describe all that our emperor built at Zenobia, for as the city is situated far away in the desert, and for this reason is always exposed to peril, and cannot derive any succor from the Romans, who dwell at a distance, he took the greatest pains to render it secure. I will now relate some few of his works there. Zenobia stands beside the river Euphrates, which flows close to its walls on the eastern side. This river, surrounded by high mountains, has no space in which to extend itself, but its stream is confined among the neighboring mountains and between its rugged banks. Whenever it is swollen by rain into a flood, it pours against the city wall and washes not merely against its foundations but as high as its very battlements. The courses of stone in the walls, drenched by this stream, became disarranged, and the whole construction was endangered, he, however, constructed a mole of enormous masses of hard rock, of the same length as the wall, and forced the flooded river to expend its rage in vain, setting the wall free from any fear of injury, however high the river might swell. Finding that the city wall upon the northern side had become ruinous from age, he raised it to the ground, together with its outwork, and rebuilt it, but not upon its former site, because the houses of the city were so crowded together at that point as to inconvenience the inhabitants, but he proceeded beyond the foundations of the wall, beyond the outwork and the ditch itself, 
and there built an admirable and singularly beautiful wall, thus greatly enlarging Zenobia in this quarter. There was, moreover, a certain hill which stood near the city towards the west, from which the barbarians, when they made their attacks, were able to shoot with impunity down upon the heads of the defenders, and even of those who were standing in the midst of the city, this hill the Emperor Justinian surrounded with a wall on both sides, and thus included it in the city of Zenobia, afterwards, escarping its sides throughout, so that no enemy could ascend it. He also built another fort upon the top of the hill, and thus rendered it altogether inaccessible to those who wished to assault the city, for beyond the hill the ground sinks into a hollow valley, and therefore it cannot be closely approached by the enemy. Above this hollow valley the mountains at once rise on the western side. The emperor did not merely watch over the safety of the city, but also built churches in it, and barracks for the soldiers, he also constructed public baths and porticos. All this work was carried out under the superintendence of the architects Isidorus and Joannes, of whom Joannes was a Byzantine, and Isidorus a Milesian by birth, being the nephew of that Isidorus whom I mentioned before. Both of these were young men, but showed an energy beyond their years, and both displayed equal zeal in the works which they constructed for the emperor. 9 After Zenobia was the city of Suri, 49, situated on the river Euphrates, whose fortifications were so contemptible that when Kasros assaulted it, it did not hold out for so much as half an hour, but was instantly taken by the Persians. This fort, however, like Corleacum, was restored by the Emperor Justinian, who surrounded it with a strong wall, strengthened it with an outwork, and enabled it for the future to resist the attack of the enemy, there is in Euphrates a church dedicated to Sergius, an eminent saint, whom the ancients so admired and looked up to that they named the place Sergiopolis, 50, and surrounded it with a low rampart, sufficient to prevent the Saracens in that region from capturing it by assault, for the Saracens are by nature incapable of attacking walls, and consequently the weakest mud wall is sufficient to resist their onset. In later times this church received so many offerings as to become powerful and famous throughout the land. The Emperor Justinian, reflecting upon these matters, at once applied himself to its protection surrounded it with a most admirable wall, and provided a quantity of water, stored up in reservoirs, for the use of its inhabitants, besides this, he built in the place houses and porticos, and all the other buildings which are regarded as the ornaments of a city. He also placed a garrison of soldiers in it to defend the walls in time of need, and, indeed, Kusros, the king of Persia, who determined to take the city, and who brought up a large army to besiege it, was compelled to raise the siege, being overcome by the strength of the walls. The emperor spent equal care upon all the towns and forts on the borders of Euphratesia, namely, Barbalissus, 51, Neosis area, Gobula, Penticamia, which is on the Euphrates, and Europus. 52. At Hemorus, finding the walls built in some parts carelessly and dangerously, and in some parts formed only of mud. While the place was deficient in water supply and consequently despicable as a fortification, he raised them to the ground, and at once carefully rebuilt them of courses of the hardest stone, making the wall much wider and higher than before. He also constructed reservoirs for water in all parts of the works, all of which he filled with rainwater, and, placing a garrison there, he rendered the 
place as powerful and secure as we now see it. Indeed, if one were carefully to consider this, and to inspect all the other good works of the Emperor Justinian, one would say it was for this alone that he had received the crown, by the manifest favor of God, who watches over the Roman people. Besides these places he also found Hierapolis, 53, which is the chief of all the cities in that region, lying exposed to any enemy that might attack it, but by his own provident foresight he rendered it safe, for, as it originally enclosed a large empty space and on that account the entire circuit of the walls could not be guarded, he cut off the part which was useless, arranged the walls in a safer and more compact form, and, by thus reducing it to the size necessary for use, made it one of the strongest cities of the present day. He also conferred upon it the following benefit. A fountain of sweet water springs perpetually out of the earth. In the midst of the city, and forms therein a wide lake, this, indeed, added to the safety of the city when it was beleaguered by an enemy, but in time of peace was by no means necessary, as much water was brought into the city from without. In process of time the inhabitants, having enjoyed a long period of peace, and having never experienced any distress, neglected this spring, for it is not in human nature when in prosperity to make provision against times of adversity. Consequently they gradually filled up the lake with rubbish, and were accustomed to bathe in it, to wash their clothes in it, and to throw all kinds of refuse into it. In this province of Euphratesia were situated two other towns, Zgmo, 54, and Neosis area, which were indeed towns in name but were merely surrounded by dry stone walls, built so low that they might be crossed by an enemy without any difficulty, since they could leap over them without fear, while they were so narrow as to be altogether indefensible, because they afforded no room for the garrison to stand upon to defend them, however, the Emperor Justinian surrounded these places also with real walls, of a sufficient width and height, and equipped them with all other means of defense, thus giving them a just right to be termed cities, and rendering them safe from the attacks of the enemy. Ex moreover, with regard to the cities taken from Kisros, that barbarian, disregarding the perpetual peace which he had sworn to observe, and the money which he had received on account of it, was filled with envy of the emperor Justinian, because of the conquests which he had made in Libya and in Italy, and considered his plighted faith to be of less importance than the gratification of this passion, he watched his opportunity, when the greater part of the Roman army was away in the west, and invaded the Roman territory unexpectedly. Before the Romans had any news of the approach of the enemy, these cities, I say, the Emperor Justinian so strengthened and beautified that they are all at the present time much more flourishing than before, and have no dread of injury. From barbarian invasion, fearing no attacks of any kind. Above all, he rendered the city of Antiochia, 55, which is now surnamed Theopolis far more beautiful and powerful than it was before, its wall in ancient times was too large, and extended beyond all reason, uselessly enclosing flat ground in one place, and lofty cliffs in another, so that it was full of weak points. The Emperor Justinian reduced it to a useful size, making it protect the city alone, and not the places which it formerly enclosed. In the lower part of the fortifications, where the city had spread out to a dangerous extent over a smooth plain, and was indefensible through the great length of the wall, he drew it back as far as possible, advantageously reducing the size of the city in that quarter.
and strengthening it by concentration. As for the river Orontes, which formerly flowed past it in a circuitous course, he changed its direction, and caused it to skirt the walls of the city. Thus, by an artificial channel, he brought the course of the river as near the city as possible, by which means he relieved the city from the danger of its unmanageable size, and yet retained the protection afforded by the river Orontes. Then, by building new bridges, he supplied fresh means of intercourse across the river, which he diverted from its course as far as was required, and then returned to its former bed. The upper part of the city, on the high ground, he fortified in the following manner. On the summit of the mountain which is called Oracassias there is a lofty rock which stands close outside the wall opposite to the fortifications in that quarter, and which renders them easy to attack. It was from this point that Kasroz took the city, as I have explained in my work on the subject. The region within the walls was for the most part uninhabited and difficult of access. For the place is divided by lofty rocks and deep ravines, which cut off all the paths, so that the wall of Antiochia seems there to belong to another city. He therefore disregarded the rock which overhangs the wall so close and renders it liable to capture, and decided to build his new wall at a distance from it having learned by experience the folly of the original builders, moreover, he leveled the ground within the walls, which formerly had been precipitous, and made the ascent to this part of the city not only practicable for people on foot, but for horsemen and even for carriages. On this high ground he also built baths and reservoirs for water within the walls, and dug a well in each tower, remedying the original waterless character of the place by the storage of rainwater. It is worth our while to describe his works upon the torrent which descends from these mountains. Two precipitous mountains overhang the city, standing close to one another, of these, the one is called Oracassias, the other stories. They are joined by a glen and ravine which lies between them, which in time of rain produces the torrent named Onopnictus, which used to flow down from the high ground and overflow the fortifications, and sometimes rose so high as to pour into the streets of the city, doing much mischief to the inhabitants. The Emperor Justinian remedied this in the following manner. In front of that part of the wall which is nearest to the ravine, from which the torrent used to rush against the wall, he built an exceedingly high wall, reaching from the hollow bed of the ravine to the mountains on either side, so that the torrent was not able to rush past it, but was forced to stay and collect its waters there. In this wall he made apertures through which he forced the water to run gently in a smaller volume, checked by this artificial barrier, so that it no longer broke with its full force against the city wall so as to overflow it and ruin the city, but proceeded gently and quietly, as I have explained, and flowing in this manner passed wherever it was desired to go through the channels constructed for it by the former inhabitants. Thus did the Emperor Justinian reconstruct the walls of Antiochia, he also rebuilt the entire city, which was burnt by the enemy. As the whole city was reduced to ashes, and leveled to the ground, and only heaps of rubbish remained. After the conflagration, it was at first impossible for the citizens of Antiochia to recognize the site of their own dwellings. He consequently removed all the ruins and cleared away the charred remains of the houses, but, as there were no public porticos or halls supported by columns, no marketplace, and no streets which marked out the quarters of the city, 
there was nothing to point to the site of any particular house. However, the emperor, without any delay, removed the rubbish as far as possible from the city, thus freeing the air and the ground from all impediments to building, and first covered the foundations of the city everywhere with stones large enough to load a wagon. After this he divided it by porticos and marketplaces, defined all the blocks of building by streets, arranged the aqueducts, fountains, and watercourses with which the city is adorned, constructed theatres and public baths in it, and graced it with all the other public buildings which belong to a prosperous city. He also brought thither a number of workmen and artificers, and thus rendered it more easy for the inhabitants to rebuild their own houses, the result of this is that Antiochia at the present day is a more celebrated city than before. He also built therein a large church in honor of the Virgin, the beauty and magnificence of which is in all respects beyond description. He endowed this church with a considerable revenue, and also built a large church dedicated to Saint Michael the Archangel. Moreover, he made provision for the sick poor in that place, and built dwellings for them, separate for the different sexes, in which they were supplied with attendants, and the means of curing their diseases, while at the same time he established hospices for strangers who might be staying for any time in the city. 11. In like manner he also restored, greatly strengthened, and brought into its present condition the wall of the city of Chalcis, together with its outwork, which had become weak and ruinous through age. There was in Syria an utterly neglected village named Cyrus, 56 which the Jews had built in ancient times when they were led captive from Palestine into Syria by the army of the Medes, from which country they were long afterwards released by Cyrus the king, wherefore they called the place Cyrus in honor of their benefactor. In the course of time Cyrus became quite overlooked and was entirely without walls, but the emperor Justinian, with a prudent zeal for the safety of the empire, and also out of reverence for the SS. Cosmas and Damianus, whose bodies lay near that place down to my own time, made Cyrus into a flourishing and admirable city, rendering it safe by a very strong wall, with a numerous garrison, large public buildings, and with all other appurtenances on an exceedingly magnificent scale. In former times the interior of this city was without water, but outside the walls was a plenteous spring which provided abundance of drinking water, yet was altogether useless to the inhabitants, since they had no means of drawing water from it without great labor and peril, for they were obliged to go to it by a circuitous path, as the country between it and the city was precipitous and altogether impassable, so that an enemy, if he were present, could easily lay an ambush and cut them off. He therefore constructed a water course from the city walls to the fountain, not open, but concealed underground with the greatest care, which supplied the city with water without either trouble or danger. He also very strongly rebuilt the entire circuit of the walls of Chalcis, 57, which had fallen into ruin down to its very foundation and was altogether indefensible, and he strengthened it with an outwork. He also restored all the other towns and forts in Syria in an admirable fashion. Thus did the Emperor Justinian provide for the security of Syria, there is, too. In Phoenicia, by the side of Lebanon, a city named Palmyra, which was built in the desert in ancient times, and which was conveniently placed on the road by which our enemies the Saracens would enter our country. It was, indeed, 
originally built for this purpose, namely, in order to prevent the barbarians making unexpected inroads into the Roman territory. This place, which through lapse of time had become almost entirely deserted, was strongly fortified by the Emperor Justinian, who supplied it abundantly with water, and filled it with a garrison of soldiers, so as to check the inroads of the Saracens. Book 3 I the Emperor Justinian fortified the eastern country in the manner which I have described in a former part of this work. Now as I started from the Persian frontier in my description of his work upon the fortresses, I think it will be convenient to proceed from thence to that of Armenia, which skirts the Persian territory from the city of Amida as far as that of Theodosiopolis. Before Describing the buildings in that quarter, I think it would be advisable to give some account of how our emperor brought the Armenians out of a condition of danger and terror into their present state of settled security, for he did not preserve these his subjects by buildings alone, but also by his foresight in other matters, as I shall presently explain. To do this I must refer for a short time to ancient history. In old times the Armenians had a king of their own nation, as we are told by the historians of remotest antiquity. When, however, Alexander of Macedon overthrew the king of Persia, the Persians remained quiet under his yoke, but the Parthians revolted against the Macedonians, conquered them in war drove them out of their country, and pushed their frontier as far as the river Tigris. Subsequently the Persians remained subject to them for 500 years, up to the time when Alexander, the son of Maimaia, ruled over the Romans. At this time one of the kings of the Parthians made his brother, named Arsaces, king of the Armenians as the history of the Armenians tells us, for let no one suppose that the Arsacidae are Armenians. Now for five hundred years there was peace between them in consequence of their relationship. The king of the Armenians dwelt in what is called Greater Armenia, having been from ancient times subject to the emperor of the Romans, but afterwards one Arsaces, king of Armenia had two sons, named Tigranes and Arsaces. When this king was about to die, he made a will by which he left the succession to his kingdom to both his sons, not dividing its power equally between them, but giving a fourfold greater share to Tigranes. The elder Arsaces, after making this division of his kingdom, passed away, but Arsaces his son, grieved and enraged at the inferiority of his position, laid the matter before the Roman Empire, hoping that by using all means in his power he might drive his brother from the kingdom, and render his father's unjust wishes of no effect. At this time Theodosius, the son of Arcadius, ruled over the Romans, being still a child. Tigranes fearing the emperor's vengeance, put himself in the hands of the Persians and handed over his kingdom to them, preferring to live as a private man amongst the Persians, rather than to make an equitable arrangement with his brother, and rule jointly over the Armenians with him in good faith and honor. Arsaces, being equally afraid of the attacks of the Persians and of his brother, abdicated his own kingdom in favor of the emperor Theodosius, on certain conditions, which I have explained at length in my history of the wars. For some time the country of the Armenians was an object of contention between the Romans and the Persians, but they finally agreed that the Persians should possess the share of Tigranes, and the Romans that of Arsaces. Both parties signed a treaty on these conditions, and henceforth the 
emperor of the Romans appointed whom he pleased, and at what time he thought proper to rule over the Armenians. This ruler was called the Count of Armenia down to my own time. However, since such a kingdom as this was not capable of repelling the incursions of the enemy, because it possessed no regular army, the emperor Justinian, perceiving that Armenia was always in a disorderly condition, and therefore was an easy prey to the barbarians, put an end to this form of government, and placed a general in command of the Armenians, giving him a sufficient number of regular soldiers to repel the invasions of the enemy. This was the arrangement which he adopted for what is called Greater Armenia, but the remainder of Armenia, that which reaches from this side of the river. Euphrates as far as the city of Amida, was governed by five Armenian satraps, whose offices were hereditary and tenable for life, however, they received the insignia of their office from the hands of the Roman Emperor alone. It is worth while to explain what these insignia were, since they will never again be seen by Men, they were a cloak made of wool, not such as grows on sheep, but such as is gathered from the sea. The animal on whom this wool grows is called pinna. The cloak was of purple, covered with gold at that part where it was fastened. Together, there was a gold brooch upon the cloak, containing a precious stone, from which three amethysts were suspended by loose golden chains. The tunic was of silk, entirely covered with the golden ornaments known as featherwork. The boots were red-colored, reaching to the knee, such as it is not lawful for anyone to wear except the Roman emperors and the kings of Persia. No Roman soldiers were ever employed either by the king of Armenia or the satraps, but they trusted exclusively to their own resources in war. In later times, However, during the reign of the Emperor Zeno, when Illus and Leontius openly revolted against the Emperor, certain of the satraps took their side, wherefore the Emperor Zeno, after his victory over Illus and Leontius, allowed one of the satraps, whose satrapy, that of the country called Bulabitis, was the weakest and least important, to retain his former possession but deposed all the others, and did not allow these governments any longer to be held by hereditary descent, but filled them by persons chosen by the emperor, as is the custom with all the other Roman governments. Yet even then Roman soldiers were not placed in them, but Armenian soldiers, as had formerly been customary, and who were quite unable to defend them against the attacks of the enemy. Perceiving this, the Emperor Justinian abolished the title of satrap for all time to come, and appointed two rulers over these nations, with the title of dukes, giving them a large number of regular Roman soldiers, in order that with them they might defend the Roman frontier. He also built for them strong places, as follows. 2. I shall begin with the country of Mesopotamia, in order to connect my account with what has been described above. He established one of these rulers of the Armenian tribes, who have the title of Duke, in the city which is called Martiopolis, 58, and the other in a fortress which is named Scytherizon. I will now describe in what part of the Roman Empire these places are situated. The city of Martiopolis is situated in that part of Armenia which is called Sophanine, close to the river Nymphius, and bordering closely on the enemy's country, for at that place the river Nymphius divides the Roman and Persian territory. Beyond the river lies the country named Arxans, which from ancient times has belonged to the Persians. Yet this city was always neglected by the Romans, and lay exposed to the attacks of these barbarians, 
so that Cabads, the king of the Persians, in the reign of the emperor Anastasius, invaded the country of the Romans, and led an army through Martiopolis, which is distant from Amida a little more than a day's journey for a lightly equipped traveller. As a mere incident and unimportant part of his invasion he took this city without any siege, assault, or beleaguerment, but simply by giving out that he was coming, for the inhabitants, who knew well that they could not hold out for a single moment of time against his army, as soon as they saw the Median host near at hand, at once went over to Cabards, with Theodorus, who at that time was satrap of Saphanine, at their head, dressed in the insignia of his office, and delivered themselves and the city of Martiopolis up to him, taking with them the public revenue for two years. Cabards, pleased with this, refrained from ravaging the city and the entire country, which he regarded as part of the Persian Empire. He dismissed the people unhurt, and neither did any injury to them nor altered anything in their city, but replaced Theodorus, whom he regarded as a wise man, as satrap over them, placing in his hands the symbols of authority, and trusting him to protect the Persian territory. After this he led his army onwards, took Amida by a siege, and retired into the Persian territory, as I have described in my history of the wars. The Emperor Anastasius, perceiving that it was not possible for the city of Martiopolis to defend itself without any fortifications against the attacks of the enemy, not only was not angry with Theodorus and the people of Saphanine, but declared that he was very thankful to them for their action. The wall of the city of Martiopolis was in thickness, about four feet, and in height about twenty feet, so that it could not only be easily captured by an enemy, who employed siege operations and brought battering engines against it, but could easily be escalated. In consequence of this, the Emperor Justinian proceeded as follows. He dug a trench outside the walls, laid foundations in it, and built a new wall of a thickness of four feet, at a distance of four feet from the old wall. He raised this wall also to a height of twenty feet, making it in all respects equal in size to the old one. He then filled up the space between the two walls with stones and mortar, thus forming the whole work into one wall twelve feet in thickness. He then raised it, keeping the thickness the same, to a height twice as great as that which it formerly possessed. Moreover, he built an admirable outwork round the city, and built all the other defences of a fortified place. Three on the west side of Martiopolis is a place named Phison, which also is situated in that part of Armenia which is called Saphanine, and is distant from Martiopolis a little more than one day's journey. About eight miles beyond this place lie precipitous and altogether impassable mountains, between which are two narrow passes, situated close to one another which are called Kleisuri. Travellers from Persian Armenia to Saphanine, whether they proceed from the Persian territory or by way of the fortress of Scytherizon, must necessarily proceed through these two passes, of which the one is called by the natives Eleusis, and the other Safshe. Each of these ought to be fortified with the utmost care, in order to bar the way against the enemy, in former times. However, they remained entirely unguarded. But the Emperor Justinian, by placing admirable fortifications both at Phison and in the passes, and by establishing sufficient garrisons in them, rendered it altogether impossible for the barbarians to invade the country. 
These were the works of the Emperor Justinian. In that part of the country of Armenia which is called Saphanine. In Scytherizon, which is in the province called Astyanine, he built a new fort. On a hilly spot, of great size, and completely impregnable. This place he furnished with a sufficient supply of water, and all other conveniences for its inhabitants, and placed in command of it, as I said before, the other Duke of Armenia with a sufficient garrison of soldiers, thus rendering the tribes of Armenia secure in this quarter also. As one goes from Scytherizon, 59, towards Theodosiopolis and Greater Armenia, is the country of Khorzan, which extends for a distance of about three days. Journey, without any lake, river or mountain to divide it from the country of the Persians, whose frontier is confused with it, so that the inhabitants of this region, whether they be Roman or Persian subjects, have no fear of one another, and never expect any attack, but intermarry with one another, have common markets for their produce, and cultivate the country together. When the rulers of either nation make an expedition against the other at the command of their prince, they always find their neighbors unprotected, for each of them has extremely populous places close to one another, while in former times there was no fortification whatever, so that it was possible for the king of Persia to invade the Roman territory in this quarter more easily than anywhere else, until the Emperor Justinian prevented his doing so, in the following manner. In the midst of this country there was a place named Artelison, which he surrounded with a very strong wall, and made into an impregnable fortress, he placed a garrison of regular soldiers in it, and appointed a general over them, whom the Romans in the Latin language style a duke. Thus did he fortify the whole of that frontier. For these were the works of the Emperor Justinian in that quarter. I now come to what he did in the rest of Armenia. The city of Satala was formerly in a perilous position, because it is not far distant from the enemy's country, and is built upon low ground, surrounded by many hills so that it ought in consequence of its position to possess impregnable fortifications. However, its defences were even more untrustworthy than its position, the works having been badly and carelessly constructed, and by lapse of time having fallen into ruin. The whole of these were demolished by the emperor, who built a new wall round it of sufficient height to appear to overtop the neighboring hills, and of sufficient thickness to support such an unusual height with safety. He built round it an outwork of an admirable character, and struck despair into the heart of the enemy. He also built a very strong fort not far from Satala, in the province of Oshuen. In this province there was an old fort built by the ancients upon the ridge of a precipitous hill, which was once taken by Pomptus, the Roman general, who, when he became master of the country, fortified it with great care, and named it Colonia. The emperor Justinian exerted all his power in restoring this fort, which had fallen into decay after so long a time, moreover, he distributed enormous sums of money among the inhabitants of this region, and thus persuaded them to build new fortifications on their own ground, and to restore those which had fallen into ruin, so that nearly all the works situated in that country were built by the Emperor Justinian. There also he built the forts of Bayburden and Archon. He restored Lysi or Mum and Luterarise and Winking Sad Smiley 60. He also built a new fort in the place which is called the Ditch of Germanus. Moreover, he restored the walls of Sebastia, 61, and Nicopolis, which are cities of Armenia, 
which were on the point of falling, having become decayed through age. In them, he built churches and monasteries. At Theodosiopolis he built a church dedicated to the Virgin, and restored the monasteries in the places named Petrius and Cucarizan. At Nicopolis, 62, he built the monastery of the Forty-Five Saints, and a church of St. George the Martyr at Bizona. Near Theodosiopolis he restored the monastery named after the Forty Martyrs. There was a place in what used to be called Lesser Armenia, not far from the river Euphrates, where formerly a regiment of Roman soldiers was stationed. The place was named Melitan, and the regiment was named Legion. Here the Romans in former times had built a square fortification on low ground, which was convenient for soldiers' quarters and for the reception of their standards. Afterwards, by the orders of Trajan, the Roman emperor, the place was raised to the dignity of a city, and became the capital of that nation. In the course of time, the city of Melitan became large and populous, and since it was no longer possible for the inhabitants to dwell within the fortification, which, as I have said, enclosed but a small space of ground, they built their city in the plain near it, erecting thereon their churches, the dwellings of their magistrates, the market place, and the shops of their merchants, the streets, porticos, baths, theatres, and all the other ornaments of a large city. In this manner Melitan became for the most part composed of suburbs. The Emperor Anastasius attempted to enclose the whole of it with a wall, but died before he had carried out his intention. However, the Emperor Justinian built a wall all round it, and rendered Melitan, 63, a great defense and ornament to the Armenians. V. These are the works of our emperor in that part of Armenia which lies on the right bank of the Euphrates, I will now speak of what he did in greater Armenia. When the Roman emperor Theodosius obtained the kingdom of Arsaces, as I explained before, he built a castle on one of its hills, very liable to capture, which he called Theodosiopolis. This was taken by Cabots, the king of Persia, when he passed it as he was marching straight upon Amida. Not long afterwards the Roman Emperor Anastasius built a city there, enclosing within its walls the hill upon which Theodosius had placed his castle. Although he named the city after himself, yet he was not able to abolish the name of Theodosius, its former founder, for though the things in common use among mankind are constantly changing, yet it is not easy to alter their former names. The wall of Theodosiopolis was of a sufficient width, but was not raised to a proportional height, for it was only about 30 feet high, and therefore was very liable to capture by an enemy skilled in sieges, such as the Persians. It was weak in other respects also, for it was not defended by any outwork or ditch, moreover, some high ground close to the city overhung the wall. These defects the emperor Justinian remedied in the following manner, in the first place he dug a very deep trench all round it, like the bed of a torrent among precipitous mountains, next. He cut up the overhanging hill into a mass of inaccessible precipices and pathless ravines, moreover, in order to make the wall very high, and unassailable by an enemy, he employed the same device as at the city of Dara. He contracted the battlements to the smallest size through which it was possible to shoot at the besiegers, laid stones over them so as to make another story round the entire circuit, and skillfully placed a second set of battlements upon it, enclosing the 
whole place within an outwork like that of the city of Dara, and making each tower into a strong castle. He established in this place all the forces of Armenia. With their general, and rendered the Armenians so strong that they no longer feared the attacks of the Persians. At Bizona the emperor did nothing of this sort, for this place is situated upon flat country, surrounded by wide plains fit for the maneuvers of cavalry, and full of putrid pools of stagnant water, so that it was very easily stormed by an enemy, and was very unhealthy for its inhabitants, for these reasons, he neglected this place, and built a city elsewhere to which he gave his own name. It is a fine city, and altogether impregnable, and stands in a place called Sumina, distant three miles from Bizona, in a very healthy and airy position on high ground. Six these were the acts of the Emperor Justinian in Armenia. At this point of my narrative it appears convenient to describe what he did among the tribes of the Tsini, since they dwell next to the Armenians. In ancient times the Tsini were independent and without any rulers, living after the manner of wild beasts, regarding and worshipping as gods the woods and birds and other animals. They spent all their lives in lofty and thickly wooded mountains, and never cultivated the ground, but supported themselves by plundering and brigandage, for they themselves were unacquainted with agriculture, and their country, when it is not covered with precipitous mountains, is hilly, and the surface of these hills is not earthy, or capable of growing crops even if it were cultivated, but rough and hard, and altogether sterile. It is not possible to irrigate the ground, to reap a crop, or to find a meadow anywhere, and even the trees, with which the land of the Tsini is covered, bear no fruit, because for the most part there is no regular succession of seasons, and the land is not at one time subjected to cold and wet, and at another made fertile by the warmth of the sun, but is desolated by perpetual winter and covered by eternal snows. For this reason the Tsini, in ancient times, remained independent, but during the reign of our emperor Justinian they were conquered by the Romans, under the command of Sitter, and perceiving that resistance was impossible, at once submitted in a body, preferring an easy servitude to a dangerous freedom. They at once all changed their religion to the true faith, became Christians, and embraced a more civilized mode of life. Renouncing brigandage, and serving in the Roman army, which was constantly at war with their enemies. However, the Emperor Justinian, fearing that the Tsini might at some time revert to their former wild mode of life, devised the following expedients. The whole country of the Tsini is difficult, and quite impassable for horsemen, being everywhere surrounded with precipices and woods, as I said before, so that it was impossible for the Tsini to mix with their neighbors, but they lived by themselves in a savage manner, like wild beasts. He therefore cut down all the trees which hindered the making of roads, and leveled the rough ground, rendering it easily passable for horsemen, and thus made it possible for them to mix with the rest of mankind, and hold intercourse with their neighbors. Next he built a church for them in a place called Skamaliachon, in order that they might perform divine service, partake of the holy mysteries, gain the favor of God by prayers, perform the other duties of religion and feel themselves to be human beings. He built forts in every part of the country, garrisoned them with regular Roman soldiers, and thus enabled the Tsini to mix without restraint with the rest of mankind. I shall now describe the parts of 
Phsenia in which he built these forts. There is there a place where the three frontiers of the Roman Empire, of Persian Armenia, and of the Tsini join, here he constructed a new and very powerful fort, named Oranon, which he made the chief guarantee of peace to the country, for at that point the Romans first entered Psania. Here he established a garrison under a general with the title of Duke. At a place distant two days journey from Oranon, on the frontier of the Osinite Tsini, for the Tsini are divided into many tribes, there was a fortress built in ancient times, which long before this had fallen into ruin by neglect, and was named Chartan. The Emperor Justinian restored this, and placed in it a large garrison to keep the province in order. On the east of this place is a precipitous ravine stretching towards the north. Here he built a new fort named Barkan. Beyond this, at the skirts of the mountain, are stables where the Osinite Tsini used to keep their cattle, not in order to plough the land, for the Tsini, as I said before, are altogether idle, and know nothing of husbandry, and have no ploughed land, or other operations of farming, but for a constant supply of milk and meat. Beyond the skirts of the mountain, to the westward of the place upon the plain, which is called Sina, stands the fort of Sicilison, which was of ancient construction, but by length of time had fallen into ruin, and was restored by the Emperor Justinian, who established in it, as in all the others, a sufficient garrison of Roman soldiers. On the left, as one goes from thence in a northerly direction, is a place which the natives call the Ditch of Longinus, for in ancient times Longinus, a Roman general of the Isaurian nation, pitched his camp there during a campaign against the Tsini. Here our emperor built a fort, named Bergamnos, a day's journey distant from Sicilison, which, like the fort at Sicilison described above, our emperor very strongly fortified. Beyond this is the frontier of the Coxalini. Tsini, where he placed two forts named Skymaliachon and Tsanzakan. Here, he placed another officer with a garrison. Seven these were the works of the Emperor Justinian among the Tsini. In the country beyond them, on the banks of the Euchine Sea, is a city called Trapezus. 64. As there was a scarcity of water at this place, the Emperor Justinian constructed an aqueduct, called by the name of the Martyr Eugenius, by which he relieved the wants of the inhabitants. Both here and at Amasia, 65, he restored the greater part of the churches, which had become ruinous by lapse of time. Beyond the frontier of the city of Trapezus is a place named Rizium, 66, which he in person restored and surrounded with fortifications magnificent beyond description and belief, for the city is second to none of those on the Persian frontier in size and strength. He also built a fort in Lazica, named Lozorum, and fortified the passes in that country, which are named the Kleisuri, in order to shut out the enemy from the country of the Lazy. 67. He also restored an ancient and ruinous church of the Christian Lazy, and founded a noble city, named Petra, 68 which the lazy by their own negligence allowed to fall into the hands of the Persians, when Kisros came thither with a great army, but the Romans conquered the Persians in battle, killed some of them, took the rest prisoners, and razed the city to the ground, that the Persians might not be able to return thither and do any more mischief, all of which has been described in my history of the wars, where also is a Description of how, on the continent opposite the territory of the Lazy, as one goes towards the Maeotic Lake, 69, 
the Romans destroyed two forts, named Sebastopolis, 70, and Pitus, because they heard that Kisros meditated sending an army to occupy them. Now, however, the Emperor Justinian entirely rebuilt Sebastopolis, which before was only a small fort, making it impregnable. By the strength of its walls and other defences, and ornamenting it with streets and buildings, so as to render it one of the first of cities, both for size and beauty. Moreover, finding that the walls of the cities of Bosporus and Cherson, which are situated upon the seashore in that region, beyond the Maeotic Lake and the Tauri and the Tauroscythi, on the frontier of the Roman Empire, had quite fallen into ruin, he restored them to a condition of great beauty and strength. In the same region he built the fort of Alastus, and one in the country of the Gorzubati. He especially strengthened the fortifications of Bosporus, which, in ancient times, had fallen into the power of the barbarians, and which he captured from the Huns and annexed to the Roman Empire. There is here a country by the sea. Sure, named Doru, which has been long inhabited by those Goths, who would not follow Theodoric on his expedition to Italy, but of their own accord remained there, and have been in alliance with the Romans down to my own time, joining the Roman armies when they march against the enemy, at the pleasure of the Emperor, their numbers are about three thousand, they are excellent warriors industrious husbandmen, and most hospitable to strangers. Their country, Doru, is situated on high ground, yet is not rough or sterile, but good soil, producing the best of crops. The emperor built no city or fort anywhere in this country, as its inhabitants cannot endure to be confined within walls, but love to dwell in the open country. He did, however, fortify with long walls the passes by which an enemy could enter the country, and thus freed the Goths from foreign invasion. These were his works in this quarter. There is a maritime town of the Thracians on the borders of the Euchine Sea, named Anchialus, 71, which it would be more proper to mention in my description of Thrace, since, however, the course of my narrative has led me to speak of the works of our emperor on the shores of the Euchine Sea, it will be well at this point to describe the buildings which he erected at Anchialus. At this place, fountains of warm water, which spring up not far from the city, supply the inhabitants with natural baths. This place was neglected and left unfortified by the former emperors, although so many tribes of barbarians dwell in the neighborhood of it, so that the sick persons, who resorted to it, could not enjoy its benefits without considerable danger, however, the emperor Justinian has now fortified it, and enabled them to be healed in safety. These were the fortifications built in the east, in Armenia, in the country of the Tsini, and on the shores of the Euchine Sea, by the Emperor Justinian. Let us now proceed from this region to the buildings which he has constructed in the rest of Europe. Book 4 I, I count it a toilsome and perilous task, to cross a great ocean in a crazy vessel, and it is the same thing to describe the buildings of the Emperor Justinian. In a feeble narrative, for this Emperor, one may say, showed greatness of mind in all that he did, and in his buildings performed works surpassing description. In Europe especially, wishing to construct works on a scale worthy of the need which existed for them, his buildings are difficult, nay, almost impossible to describe, being worthy of their position in the neighborhood of the river. Danube and the barbarian tribes beyond it, whose invasions they are intended to repel, 
for along its banks dwell the nations of the Huns and the Goths, and the empire is threatened by the tribes of the Tauri and the Scythians, the Sclavonians, and the rest, whom the ancient historians call the dwellers in wagons or Sauromati, and all the other wild tribes which either inhabit or roam through that region. With all these tribes, ever eager for war, Justinian was forced to contend, so that he could neglect no point, but was forced to construct a chain of innumerable fortresses, establish in them numberless garrisons of soldiers, and do everything else in his power to hold in check a foe, with whom neither truce nor intercourse could be held, for these enemies were accustomed to make war without any pretext or declaration, and not to terminate it by any treaty, or cease fighting after a time, but to take up arms without any cause only to lay them down when compelled by main force. However, let us proceed to what remains of our description, for when a work is begun, it is better to bring it to an end in any fashion whatever rather than to give it up and leave it unfinished, besides which, we might reasonably be blamed if our emperor could construct such works, and we were to shrink from the labor of describing them. Now that I am about to enumerate the buildings of this our emperor in Europe, it is worth while before doing so to make a few remarks about the country. From what is called the Adriatic Sea a branch extends straight into the continent, apart from the rest of the sea, so as to divide the country and form the Ionian Gulf, having on its right bank the Epirates and the other nations in that quarter, and on the left the Calabrians, compressed into a long and narrow inlet. It embraces almost the whole of the continent above this sea and running over. Against it, the river Danube forms the land of Europe into a peninsula. Here our emperor constructed many admirable works, for he fortified the whole of Europe so securely as to render it inaccessible to the barbarians who dwell beyond the river Danube. I ought, however, to begin with the native country of the emperor, which must Occupy the first place in my narrative, as it does in all other respects, for it alone may rejoice and pride itself upon the glory of having bred and furnished the Romans with an emperor, whose works are so great that they can neither be described in language nor set down in writing. In the country of the European Dardani, who dwell beyond the frontier of the citizens of Epidamnus, near the fort called Bidariana, is a place named Taurisium, from whence came the Emperor Justinian, the founder of the universe. 72. This place he hastily fortified in a quadrangular form, placing a tower at each angle, and gave it from its shape the name of Tetrapiurgia, or the Four Towers. Close to this place he built a most noble city, which he named Justiniana Prima, this word in the Latin language means first, thus repaying his debt to the country which bred him, though this duty ought to have been shared by all the Romans, since this place furnished a preserver for them all alike. Here he constructed an aqueduct and supplied the city with a perpetual flow of water, and erected many other works, magnificent and surpassing all. Description, worthy of the founder of the city, it is not easy to enumerate the churches, and it is impossible for language to describe the dwellings of the magistrates, the size of the porticos, the beauty of the marketplaces, the fountains, the streets, the baths, and the shops. In a word, the city is great, populous, flourishing, and worthy to be the metropolis of the whole country, to which dignity it has been raised. In addition to this, it is the seat of the Archbishop of Illyria, 
all the other cities yielding to it as being the greatest in size, so that it in turn reflects glory upon the emperor, for the city prides itself upon the emperor which it has bred, while the emperor glories in having constructed the city. Let the above description of it suffice, for to describe it all in exact detail, is impossible, because all language must fall short of a city worthy of such an emperor. Besides this, he entirely rebuilt the fort of Badariana, and rendered it much stronger than before. There was an ancient city in the country of the Dardani, named Ulpiana. He demolished the greater part of the wall of this place, which was very unsafe and altogether useless, and brought it to its present magnificent appearance, decorated it with many other beautiful buildings, and gave it the name of Justiniana Secunda. Secunda in the Latin language signifies second. He also built a new city in its neighborhood, which he named Justinopolis, after the name of his uncle Justin. He restored the walls of Sardica, Nisopolis, Germana and Pantalia, which he found dilapidated by age, so as to make them secure and impregnable. Between these cities he built three small towns, Kratiskara, Quimadaba, and Rumisiana. Thus he restored these cities from their foundations, and, wishing to render the river Danube a very strong bulwark to them and to the whole of Europe, he covered the whole course of the river with numerous forts, as I shall shortly afterwards describe, and established on all parts of its banks garrisons of soldiers, sufficient to restrain the barbarians from crossing the river in that quarter. When, however, he had completed all these works, remembering the insecurity of all human designs, and reflecting that, should the enemy succeed in passing the river by any means, they would ravage the unguarded country, carry off all the inhabitants for slaves, and plunder all their property, he did not leave them to trust to the forts along the course of the river alone for their protection, but gave them means of defense of their own, for he constructed such a number of fortifications in these regions, that every field either possesses a castle or is near to some walled place, both here and in new and old Epirus. Here also he built the city of Justinianopolis, which formerly was called Adrianopolis. He restored Nicopolis, Photica and Finis, the latter towns, Photica and Finis, being situated upon low ground, suffered from inundations, wherefore the Emperor Justinian, perceiving that it was impossible to build walls for them, upon a firm foundation, made no alteration in either of them, but built forts near them, which he placed upon strong and precipitous ground. In this country there was an ancient city, abundantly supplied with water, and deriving its name from its position, for it was formerly named Euroia. Not far from this city of Euroia is a lake, in the midst of which rises an island containing a hill, the lake reaches round this island so far as only just to allow access to it. The emperor transferred the inhabitants of Euroia to this place, built a city for them, and strongly fortified it. Too after our survey of the whole of Epirus we pass over Italia and Acarnania, and come to the Crissian Gulf, the Isthmus of Corinth, and the other parts of Greece. Here the emperor's foresight was most especially displayed, and one may marvel at the numerous walled cities with which he fortified the Roman Empire. Amongst the rest he paid especial care at the pass of Thermopylae. In the first place he raised its walls to a great height, for the mountains in this place were easy to be taken by an enemy, 
and were fortified by what was more like a hedgerow than a wall. He placed double battlements upon all these walls, and also upon the fort, which had been built there in an equally careless manner by the ancients, giving it a sufficient height, and double bulwarks. Besides all this, as the place was entirely without water, he contrived a reservoir for rainwater, and also carefully fortified many paths up the mountain, which had formerly been left unguarded. One may well wonder how the Persian king spent so long a time here, and only found one path, and that, too, one which was betrayed to him by Greek traitors, when there are many unfortified roads in the place along which one could almost drive a wagon, for the sea, which washes the base of the mountains, has widened the mouths of most of the paths leading up from thence. And as the ground was full of glens and impassable ravines, it appeared to the ancients that what was thus divided by nature could not be continuously enclosed by fortifications, so that they lazily sacrificed their safety in their reluctance to embark upon so difficult a work, and trusted to chance, resting all their hopes of safety against the invasion of the barbarians on their probable Ignorance of the roads, for men who despair of accomplishing difficult tasks. Always imagine that what they have found so hard, will not easily be effected by others, so that it cannot be disputed that the Emperor Justinian showed greater care and foresight than anyone else who has ever lived, since he was not prevented, even by the sea which washes and breaks upon these mountains, from laying firm foundations on the very beach and watery shore, and making the most contrary elements serve his purpose, and yield to him, subdued by human art. However, not even after having connected these mountain thickets and glens, and having joined the sea to the mountain, and enclosed the whole of Greece with his fortifications, did our emperor relax his zeal on behalf of his subjects. But he also built many forts within this wall, taking a just view of the chances of human life, which render no place secure or impregnable, so that if by any mischance it should happen that these walls should at any time be taken, the garrison might find a refuge in these forts. Moreover, he established everywhere granaries and reservoirs of water in secure positions, and placed nearly 2,000 soldiers to garrison the works, which was never done by any emperor at any former time, for these walls remained unguarded formally, even down to my own time, and if the enemy assaulted them, some of the peasants in the neighborhood, adopting a military life on the spur of the moment, used to act as garrison, and, from their want of experience, risked the capture of them and of the whole of Greece, by which parsimony this country was for a long time exposed to the attack of the barbarians. 73. Thus did the Emperor Justinian strengthen the fortifications of Thermopylae. He also with great care built walls round the cities which lie in the country. Beyond it, Saccus, Hypata, Coracii, Unum, Baliae and Leontarium. At Heraclea he did as follows, as one goes from Illyria to Greece, two mountains stand close to one another for a long distance, forming a narrow pass between them, of the kind called Clysuri. In the midst runs a fountain, which in the Summertime pours a clear and drinkable stream down from the mountains, which stand around, and forms a tiny rivulet, but in rainy seasons there rises a very deep and violent torrent, which collects its waters from the ravines among the cliffs. By this path the barbarians were able to gain an easy passage to Thermopylae and the neighboring parts of Greece. On either side of the path, 
There were in ancient times two ancient fortresses, one being the city of Heraclea, which I mentioned before, and the other that of Mropol, standing at a little distance from it. The Emperor Justinian restored both these fortresses, which had long been in ruins, and built a very strong wall across the pass, joining it to the mountains on either side, so that he closed the passage against the barbarians, and forced the torrent first to form a lake within this wall, and then to flow over it and continue its course. He secured all the cities of Greece which lie within the walls of Thermopylae, restoring the fortifications of all of them, for they had long ago fallen into decay. At Corinth in consequence of violent earthquakes, and at Athens, Plataea, and the towns in Gitea having fallen into decay through age, as no one had taken any care of them, he, however, left no place assailable or unguarded, for in his watchful care for his subjects he bethed out him that the barbarians, should they reach the country about Thermopylae, would despair of success as soon as they learn it that they would gain nothing by forcing the works there, since all the rest of Greece was fortified, and they would have to undertake the siege of each individual city, for a deferred hope does not encourage men to endure labor, nor are they eager for gain which is far distant, but give up their hopes of future advantage to avoid present discomfort. Having effected this, the Emperor Justinian, learning that all the cities in Peloponnesus were unwalled, and reflecting that much time would be wasted if he attended to the security of each one, securely fortified the whole isthmus with a wall, since the existing wall was mostly in ruins. Upon this wall he built forts and established garrisons in them, and in this manner rendered the whole country of Peloponnesus safe from the enemy, even though any misfortune should befall the fortifications at Thermopylae. 3. Diocletianopolis in Thessaly was in ancient times a flourishing city, but latterly was ruined by the incursions of the barbarians, and had long been without inhabitants. There is a lake near it, which is called Castoria, in the midst of which is an island surrounded by water, with only one narrow passage, not wider than 15 feet leading to it through the lake. On this island stands a very lofty mountain, which overhangs the lake on one side and the island on the other, wherefore our emperor decided against the site of Diocletianopolis, because it was obviously exposed to attack, and had long before suffered the misfortunes which I had mentioned, but built a very strong city on the island, to which he naturally gave his own name. Besides this, he removed the walls of Echinum, Thebes, Pharsalus, and all the other cities of Thessaly, amongst which are Demetris, Metropolis, Gumphi, and Tricatus, and securely fortified them, for their walls were decayed by age and could easily be taken by an enemy. Now that we have come to Thessaly, let us proceed to Mount Pelion and the River Penus. The Penus flows in a gentle stream past Mount Pelion, and in its course adorns the city of Larissa, for Phthia no longer exists, but has perished through age. The river flows with a quiet stream as far as the sea, and the neighboring country is rich in fruits of all kinds and in sweet waters, which the inhabitants were never able to enjoy, as they were in continual expectation of an attack from the barbarians, for there was no strong place anywhere in these regions to which they could fly for refuge, but the walls of Larissa and Caesarea were so ruinous that they were almost open towns. The Emperor Justinian, by Rebuilding the walls of both these cities very strongly, enabled the country to enjoy true prosperity.
not far from hence rise precipitous mountains covered with lofty trees. These mountains were the home of the centaurs, and in this country the battle of the centaurs with the Lepidae took place, as the ancient myths declare, which inform us that in old times there dwelt there a monstrous race combining the forms of two creatures. Antiquity gives some warrant for this fable by the name of a fort in these mountains, which down to my own time was named Centauropolis, whose ruinous walls the Emperor Justinian restored and strengthened, together with those of Eurymne in the same country, which had fallen into the same condition. Now, that I may leave no part of Greece undescribed, we must proceed to the island of Euboea, which stands close to Athens and Marathon. This island of Euboea lies in the sea, in front of Greece, and seems to me as though it had once formed a part of the mainland, and had afterwards been separated from it by a strait, for an arm of the sea flows past the mainland there, in the neighbourhood of the city of Chalcis, ebbing and flowing in a narrow channel, confined between banks which reduce it to the size of a rivulet. This strait is called the Euripus. Such is the island of Euboea. A single beam laid across the strait forms a bridge, which the inhabitants lay across at their pleasure, and then appear to be dwellers on the continent, and walk on foot to the land beyond the strait, but when they remove it, they cross the strait in boats, and again become islanders, so that whether they proceed on foot or on shipboard depends upon the laying down or taking up of a single piece of wood. The country within this is named, the peninsula of, Palene. In ancient times, the inhabitants built a wall across the isthmus, which joined the sea at each end, and built there a city, which in former times was called Potidaea, and now, Cassandria, however, time so ruined all these buildings that when, not long ago, the Huns overran these regions, they captured this cross wall and city as though in sport, though they never have conducted a siege since the world began. This event, however, gave the Emperor Justinian an opportunity of displaying his goodness and magnanimity, for as he was always wont to repair all the misfortunes which befell him by his own foresight, he turned the most terrible disasters into a source of good fortune by the magnificent works by which he repaired. So here he fortified the city of Palene, which is the bulwark of the whole country, and the wall across the isthmus, so as to render them quite impregnable and able to defy all attacks. These were his works in Macedonia. Not far from the city of Thessalonica flows the river Achaeus, which passes through a fertile and rich country, and empties itself into the sea at that place. This river flows with a gentle current, its waters are calm and sweet. The neighboring country is low-lying, well-watered, and forms rich pasture, but was sadly exposed to the inroads of the barbarians, having no fort or place of strength of any kind for a distance of forty miles. Wherefore the emperor built a strong fort on the banks of the river Achaeus where it joins the sea, an entirely new work, to which he gave the name of Artemisium. For it is my duty to mention the other strong places in this part of Europe. I am quite sure that if I were to recount this list of the fortresses in this country, to men dwelling in a distant region and belonging to another nation, without any Facts to guarantee the truth of my story, the number of the works would make it appear altogether fabulous and incredible, as it is, however, they are to be seen at no great distance, and great numbers of the inhabitants of that region are present in our city, wherefore, with the confidence which springs from truth, I shall not 
hesitate to give a list of the works of the Emperor Justinian in the above. Mentioned countries, both in restoring ruinous fortifications and in building new ones. It will be most convenient to put them all in the form of a list, so that my narrative may not be confused by the insertion of their names. These are the new forts built by the Emperor Justinian in New Epirus Sad Smiley 74. Seminits. Martis. Alpiensis. Gynecumits. Epistaba. Spertium. Argus. Avon. Aana. Stridon. Stephaniacum. De Africus. Saint Sabinus. Labulus. Ulula. Epilium. Dilakin. Pisini. Patina. Sithenas. Geminus. Dolbin. Bacust. Hedonia. Alistris. Titiana. Irene. Ulibula. Epiduta. Brebate. Bacusta. Thesaurus. These places were restored. Saint Stephen. Tythra. Cethrian. Brebeata. Apis. Bupus. Pelium. Indini. Cum. Dionysius. Parcu. Toshium. Sidronpolis. Turcanus. Antipagre. Capesa. Pupsaulus. Cilici. Gabraeum. Argias. Diana. Therma. Clementina. Amantia. Ilrin. Pertium. These are the new forts built in old Epirus. Palmas. Zeropatos. Olbas. Europa. Sianin. Chimera. Marciana. Heliga. Algus. Hermonia. Simonus. Adanum. These places were rebuilt. Mercia. Two forts dedicated to Saint Donatus in the Castina territory of Justinianopolis, Genesius, and Photis, Pucus, Marmarita, Symphagium, Lystria, Pranathidum, Petroniana, Hedones, Carmina, Castellum, Saint Sabinus, Bulebus, also a reservoir in the fort of Cum. Palius. Martius. Trana. Pesium. Posidon. Anulus. Colophonia. In Macedonia. Candida. Malikiza. Colobina. Pascas. The Basilica of Amintas. Olon. Bulbas. Gentianum. Brigises. Prinyana. Apes. Thestium. Pluram. Siri. Caminus. Garasan. Therma. Cumarciana. Bogus. Limdorm. Neapolis. Bupudan. Calanus. Barbers. Museum. Syriana. A. Cremba. Pelicum. Adrianium. Lags. Edana. Cratia. Cicle. Fasii. Nymphium. Placidiana. Matipsis. Hynia. Argitianum. Limna. Basinus. Option. Cassopes. Shiradras. Parthian. Cassopes. These forts were rebuilt in Thessaly. Alcan. Circinii. Losinus. Sidrius. Gerontica. Fraselin. Perbila. The following new forts were built in Dardania. Laborum. 
A crinza. Castimum. Terias. Rabestum. Drullus. Castilium. Victorii. These were rebuilt. Siciana. Priscopera. Tizul. Miletes. Usiana. Dardapara. Bisiana. Sizuna. Mascas. Veroniana. List. Lasbaris. Celeriana. Castello Bretara. Zispes. Edizio. Genzina. Denius. Petrizan. Secola. Eutigiana. Imastus. Mulato. Castellona. Balas. Capomalva. Cataris. Seretus. Cataricus. Pochium. Pensa. Quino. Catafeterus. Berzina. Debanus. Bicina. Cubinus. Arsa. Getmaza. Blizzo. Victoriana. Labutsa. Azita. Quinti. Derbuli. Burmurum. Suricum. Catrasma. Cassins. Rotan. Tutina. Cabensiles. Balicina. Marslina. Bella. Primaniana. Catalates. Palmilinus. Casilla. Aria. Mariana. These in the country of the city of Sardica. Scupium. Struas. Stenes. Prishina. Marsipetra. Macunyana. Preparum. Scopumciana. Rumaniana. In the country of Cabansa, Ball Bay was built, and the following were repaired. Bergia. Vinus. Stamazo. Trisiana. Clisbestita. Parnista. Duina. Symes. Turicla. Bidzo. Medica. Stenocorta. Peplabius. Danedibe. Cune. Ardia. In asterisk 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 these were restored. Pugama. Borbriga. Betsas. Turis. Brigidaba. These were rebuilt. Salabris. Bots. Arcunes. Bitsimaes. Duris. Bardsyanaya. Buteries. Banes. Barbabris. Bimerus. Arbatias. Tizudias. Kuzuzura. Skuans. Iteris. Centudes. Itabaris. Skes. Tugarius. Ligneus. Bimast. Itadba. Stramanches. In the country of the city Germany, Skablizo was built, and the following were rebuilt. Germus. Cinzeris. Candaris. Regino Castellum. Roligeras. Swagagments. These in the country of the city of Porta, Pantalia. Tarprum. Blippus. Sobastas. Zespuris. Churduseras. These in the region of Scarsetina. Alaram. Balorsum. Magamias. Butis. Eleuconenta. In the country of the city of Asterisk 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 these new forts were built. Calvinshia. Arsaza. Farinors. Viculia. Stranvasta. Castilium. Aldowns. Groths. Barakthists. Garces. Somates. Pists. Arsna. Dusmanes. Brachidum. Bratsista. Iraria. Holodoris. Burcadium. Cassia.
Sabinibris, Granditum, Timiana, Erbriana, Candela, Nogto, Gerbicum, Mediana, Lord Sones, Tiancana, Dulias, Castengem. These were rebuilt. Hercula, Millerica, The Fort of Mutinus, Debrera, Badopes, Chestu Para, Calis. These in the country of Ramishina, Brytra, Cumudba, Suburas, Darius, Lamponiana, Ludsolo, Strongs, Reportans, Dalmatas, Spelanca, Premiana, Scumbro, Freraria, Britero, Topera, Tulcoburgo, Tomes, Longiana, Quas, Alupo Fontana, Certenuses, Dardapara, Stenes, Berdamina, Idaba, Grinchapana, Deutaba, Gracchus, Pretsuis, Drasimarca. In the country of Aquiana there was built the new fort of Timothachian, and the following were rebuilt, Peters, Castellanorvo, Skullcoburgo, Florentina, Vindimula, Romaliana, Briola, Skeptcasas, Argonoculum, Argentas, Aureliana, Pots, Gembro, Amuluslets, Clemades, Timulciolum, Turibus, Meridio, Gribo, Maria Pented, Schillerus, Tridetitilius, Sutrato, Braeola, Mutsipera, Motris, Stenders, Viconorvo, Scarapera, Quashina, Odriuso, Julioboli, Sipipn, Ponces, Trajana, Zanes. V. Thus did the Emperor Justinian fortify the whole Illyrian continent. I shall now set forth the manner in which he strengthened the bank of the river Ister, which men also call the Danube with fortifications and garrisons of soldiers. The Roman emperors in ancient times, wishing to prevent the barbarians who dwelt beyond the Danube from crossing it, occupied the whole shore of this river with fortresses, which they built not only on the right bank, but in some places, also on the further bank of the river. These fortresses were not constructed so as to be inaccessible to assailants, but just sufficient not to leave that bank of the river without defenders, for the barbarians in that region did not understand siege operations. Most of these strong places consisted only of one tower, and were consequently called towers, and very few men were stationed in them. This was at that time sufficient to overawe the barbarian tribes, so that they made no attacks upon the Romans, but in later times Attila invaded the country with a great army, raised all these fortresses to the ground without difficulty, and laid waste the greater part of the Roman territory, without meeting with any resistance. The Emperor Justinian rebuilt the demolished forts, not in their original form, but in the most powerful manner of fortification, and in addition to them built many others. In this manner he entirely restored the security of the Roman Empire, which had been altogether lost. I shall now set forth the manner in which all this was effected. The river Danube, flowing from the mountains of the Celts, who are now known as the Gauls, encloses a great tract of country, for the most part entirely desert, but in some places inhabited by barbarians, who dwell like savages. 
without any intercourse with the rest of mankind. On reaching Dacia, it first begins to divide the barbarians who dwell on its left bank from the Roman territory on the right bank. For this reason the Romans call this part of Dacia Ripensis, for in the Latin language a bank is called Ripa. The first city which they built on this bank was named Singidon, which in process of time the barbarians captured, razed to the ground, and rendered entirely desolate. Most of the other fortresses were reduced to the same condition, but the emperor Justinian rebuilt it entirely, surrounded it with a strong wall, and again made it a noble and admirable city. He built a new fort of great strength, distant eight miles from the city of Singidon, 75, which from that circumstance is called Octavum. Beyond it there was an ancient city named Viminasium, which the emperor entirely rebuilt, for it had long before been razed to the ground. 6. Proceeding onward from the city of Viminasium, three fortresses stand on the bank of the Danube, named Picnus, Cupus, and Novi, which formerly derived their name from a single tower built in each place, now, however, the Emperor Justinian added so many houses and fortifications to each of these, that they came to be regarded as considerable cities. On the further bank, opposite Novi, stood in ancient times a ruinous tower named Latrata, which the ancients called Liderata. This place was made by our emperor into a large and very strong fort. After Novi are the forts of Cantabazates, Smorns, Campses, Tinnitas, Vernes, and Ducipratum, and many more on the further bank, all of which he rebuilt from the foundations. After this comes Caput Bovis, the work of the Roman Emperor Trajan, and beyond it an ancient fort named Zanes, all of which he enclosed with strong fortifications, and rendered them impregnable. Bulwarks of the Empire Not far from Zanes is a fort named Pontes, where a stream leaves the river, encloses a small portion of the bank, and then rejoining its true channel, unites itself to the main river. It does this not by nature, but compelled by human art. I will now describe why it was that the place was named Pontes, and that the Danube was forced to flow round this place. The Roman Emperor Trajan, a spirited and energetic man, appears to have been irritated at the thought that the boundary of his empire was fixed by the River Danube. 76. He was anxious, therefore, to throw a bridge across it, in order that he might pass it without its offering any obstacle when he marched against the barbarians beyond it. How he built this bridge I shall take no pains to describe, but shall let that be told by Apollodorus of Damascus, the chief architect of the entire work. No advantage accrued from it to the Romans, and the bridge subsequently was destroyed by the stream of the Danube and by age. Trajan built two forts on either bank of the river, and called that on the further side Theodora and that on the Dacian bank Pontum, from the name of the bridge. For the Romans call a bridge Ponce in Latin. Since after this the river became impassable for ships at this place, owing to the ruins and foundations of the bridge, they forced the river to adopt a new channel and perform a circuit in order to afford them a passage beyond it. Both these forts fell into ruins through age and the assaults of the barbarians, but the emperor Justinian rebuilt the fort Pontum, on the right bank of the river, with new and powerful fortifications, and thus secured Illyria. As for that on the opposite bank, named Theodora, he thought it unnecessary to bestow any care upon it, 
since it was exposed to the attacks of the barbarians in that region, but he built all the new fortifications which stand on the bank below Pontum at this day, which are named Merburgus, Susiana, Armata, Timona, Theodoropolis, Stilaburgus, and Halicaniburgus. There is a small city near this place, named Ad Aquas, some small part of whose fortifications, which had become unsafe, were restored by the emperor. Beyond it he built Burgonavor, and Lacaburgus, and the fort named Dorticum, which he made into the existing strong fortification. He altered the solitary tower named Judeus into what may be called, and really is, a most beautiful fort. He rebuilt Burgus Altus, which formerly was deserted and altogether uninhabited, and also enclosed with a wall another place named Gums. He rebuilt the fortifications of Crispas, which had become ruinous from age, and built Loninina and Pontesrium in an admirable manner. At Bonania and Novum he rebuilt the bastions which had become ruinous. He rebuilt all the ruinous parts of the city of Raciaria and in many other places he either enlarged small fortifications or reduced over large ones to a convenient form, in order that neither their smallness nor their excessive size might expose them to the attacks of the enemy, as, for example, he turned Mocationa from a single tower into the more complete fort which it is at this day, whilst at Olmus. He reduced the space enclosed by the walls, which formerly was very great, thus enabling it to defy the attacks of the enemy. In many places he altered a solitary tower, an object of contempt to an invader, into a strong fort, as at Tricissa and Putides. He magnificently restored the ruinous walls of Sebras. He built a new fought in by grain, and another one near to it, in a place where formerly stood a single tower named Onos. Not far from this there remained only the foundations of a city, which in former times had been named Augusta, but which now, possessing its ancient name, but having been altogether rebuilt by the emperor, Justinian, is well peopled. He rebuilt the ruined fortifications of Edabe, restored the city of Variana, which had long been in ruins, and fortified Valeriana, which before had possessed no defences. Besides these, he paid attention to and enclosed with strong fortifications. Other places not on the bank of the river, but standing at a distance from it. Named Castramatis, Zetno Cortum, and Iscum. He took great pains to enclose with a wall and otherwise fortify an old fort on the bank of the river, named the Fort of the Huns. Not far from the Fort of the Huns is a place where a fort stands. On each bank of the Danube, the one in Illyria named Palatiolum, while that on the opposite bank was named Sisabida. These, which had become ruinous through age, were restored by the Emperor Justinian, who thereby checked the inroads of the barbarians in that quarter, and beyond them rebuilt an ancient fort, now known as Utos. On the extreme frontier of Illyria he built a fort named Lapidaria, and altered a solitary tower, named Lucernaria Bergam, into a fort worthy of admiration. The above were the works of the Emperor Justinian in Illyria, he did not, however, merely strengthen this country with fortifications, but placed in each of them garrisons of regular soldiers, and thus checked the incursions of the barbarians. 7. Hitherto I have described the fortifications of Illyria along the river Danube. We must now pass into those which the Emperor Justinian built along its shores in Thrace, 
for it appears convenient to me first to describe the whole of this bank, and then to proceed to the description of his works in the inland country. Let us then first proceed to the country of the Messians, 77, whom the poets speak of as fighting hand to hand, for their country is contaminous with that of Illyria. After Lucernaria Bergam, the Emperor Justinian built the new fort of Securisca, and beyond it restored the ruinous part of Sintodemus. Beyond this he built an entirely new city, which, after the name of the Empress, he called Theodoropolis. He renewed the ruinous part of the forts which are named Eatron and Tigers, and added a tower to that of Marxentius, of which he thought it stood in need. He built the new fort of Sinton. Beyond this is the fortification of Transmariska, opposite to which, on the further side of the river, the Roman Emperor Constantine once built with great care a fort named Daphne, thinking it advisable that at this place the river should be guarded on both sides. This in process of time was entirely destroyed by the barbarians, but was rebuilt from its foundations by the Emperor Justinian. Beyond Transmariska, he took suitable pains to restore the fortresses of Altinum and that called Candidiana, which long ago had been destroyed by the same enemies. There are three forts in succession. Along the bank of the Danube, named Soltopiagus, Dorostolus, and Sisidaba, in each of which the emperor repaired with great care such parts as had become ruinous. He bestowed similar pains upon Quisris, which lies beyond the bank of the river, and enlarged and greatly extended Palmatis, which stands in a narrow pass, although it was not near the bank of the river. Close to this he built a new fort, named Adina, because the Sclavonian barbarians were wont to conceal themselves there and lie in ambush, so as to render it impossible for travelers to proceed through that country. He also built the fort of Tilition and the outwork on the left of it. Thus was the bank of the Danube and its neighborhood fortified in Messia. 78. I shall now proceed to Scythia, where the first fort is that named after Street. Cyrillus, the ruinous parts of which were most carefully rebuilt by the emperor. Justinian. Beyond this was an ancient fortress named Almiton, but as the Sclavonian barbarians had for a long time infested that region, and made their Habitation there, it had become quite deserted, and nothing remained of it except its name. He therefore rebuilt it from its foundations, and rendered that part of the country safe from the attacks of the Sclavonians. Next to this is the city of Ibida, whose walls had become very ruinous, but which he, without any delay, rebuilt and rendered very strong. He built a new fort beyond it named Aegistum, and restored another fort in the furthest part of Scythia named Ormiris, whose walls had for the greater part fallen into decay, as he did to all the other fortifications in this part of Europe. 8. I have described above the buildings constructed by the Emperor Justinian among the Dardanians, Epirates, Macedonians and the other tribes of the Illyrians, as well as those in Greece and along the river Ister. Let us now proceed to Thrace, taking as the best foundation for our narrative the neighborhood of Byzantium, since that city surpasses all others in Thrace, both in strength and situation, for it overhangs Europe like a citadel, and guards also the sea which divides it from Asia. I have described above his works, both churches and other buildings, within and without the walls of Constantinople, I am now about to speak of what lies beyond them. 
There is a fort in the suburbs of the city, which from its form is called the Round Fort. The road which leads from it to Regium passes for the most part over uneven ground, and in rainy seasons used to become swampy and difficult for travelers. Now, however, our emperor has paved it with large stones, and made it easy to traverse. In length this road reaches as far as Regium, its width is such that two wagons going in opposite directions can pass without difficulty. The stones of which it is formed are very hard, one would imagine them to be millstones. They are of enormous size so that each of them covers a large extent of ground, and stands up to a great height. They form so smooth and level a surface that they do not seem to be joined, or carefully let into one another, but to have grown together. Such is this road. There is a lake close to Regium, into which rivers flowing from the higher ground discharge their waters. This lake reaches as far as the sea, so that there is but one very narrow bank between them. Both washed on either side by their several waters, when, however, they approach most nearly to one another, they restrain their currents and turn them back, as though they had their placed boundaries for themselves. At one point, they join one another, leaving a channel between them of which it is hard to say to which water it belongs, for the water of the sea does not always flow into the lake, nor does the lake always discharge its waters into the sea, but after much rain, and with a southerly wind, the water of the channel appears to flow out of the lake, though if the wind blows from the north, the sea appears to wash into the lake. In this place the sea forms an immense extent of shoal water, with only one narrow channel leading through them into deep water. This channel is so narrow that it is called the Ant. The channel which, as I have said before, joins the lake to the sea, used in former times to be crossed by a wooden bridge. Though with great danger to the passengers, who often fell into the water together, with the beams of the bridge, now, however, the Emperor Justinian has raised the bridge upon high arches of stone, and rendered the passage safe. Beyond Regium there is a city named Athira, whose inhabitants he relieved. From the distress from which he found them suffering from want of water, by building a reservoir there, in which the excess of their water might be stored up and supplied to them in time of need, he also restored the ruinous part of their wall. Beyond Athira there is a place which the natives call Episcopia. The Emperor Justinian perceiving that this place lay exposed to the attacks of the enemy, more especially as there was no strong place, but the country was entirely unguarded, built a fort there, the towers of which he constructed not in the usual manner, but as follows. From the curtain wall projects a building, narrow at first, but very wide at the outer end, upon which each of the towers is built. It is not possible for an enemy to approach near to this wall, since they come between these towers, and are overwhelmed by the crossfire which the garrison easily pour upon their heads. He placed the gates, not in the usual manner, between two towers, but obliquely in a small projection of the wall, so that they are not seen by the enemy, but are hidden behind the wall. This work was performed for the Emperor by Theodorus Silentius, a very clever man. Thus was this fort constructed. We must now proceed to make some mention of the long walls. 9. The sea which proceeds from the ocean and Spain, with Europe on its left hand, flows in the same easterly direction as far as Thrace, but there divides into two portions, one of which proceeds towards the east, while another makes a 
short bend and terminates in the Euchine Sea. When it reaches Byzantium, it winds round the city on its eastern side, as though round a goal, and continues its course in a much more oblique direction, proceeding by a strait which turns the upper and lower parts of Thrace into an isthmus, not that the sea there is divided into two parts, as is the case in other isthmuses, but it circles round in a singular manner and embraces Thrace on both sides, and more especially the whole suburbs of Byzantium. These suburbs the inhabitants have built over and adorned, not merely for their use, but with an arrogant and boundless luxury, and with all the license which is produced by wealth. Here they have stored much furniture, and preserved many works of art. Whenever, therefore, the barbarians suddenly invade the Roman Empire, these places suffer far more damage than the rest, and are in fact utterly ruined. The Emperor Anastasius, wishing to prevent this, built long walls, 79, at a place no less than 40 miles from Byzantium, joining the two seas where they were distant two days' journey from one another. Having constructed these works, he supposed that all within them had been made secure, they were, however, the cause of still greater disasters for it was not possible either to build so enormous a work firmly, or to guard it with proper care, while when the enemy made themselves masters of one part of the long wall, they conquered the remainder of the garrison without difficulty, assailed the rest of the people unexpectedly, and did more mischief than can easily be described. Our emperor, however, having rebuilt the ruinous part of these walls, and strengthened their weak points so as to assist their defenders, devised the following plan also. He stopped up all the passages leading from one tower to another, and arranged one single means of ascent from the ground, within the walls of each, so that the garrison could, if necessary, block up this passage and defy an enemy, even though he had made his way within the wall, since each tower is sufficient within itself for the defense of its garrison. Within these walls, he made the most complete provision for safety, both by the buildings which I have mentioned above, and by restoring the most ruinous part of the wall of the city of Slibria. 80. These were the works of the Emperor Justinian at the Long Walls. The well-known city of Heraclea, 81, our neighbor on the sea coast, which formerly, under the name of Perinthus, was the first city in Europe, and now is second to Constantinople alone, not long ago was reduced to great straits by want of water, not that the country near it was waterless, or that those who built the city in ancient times had neglected to supply it with water, for Europe abounds with fountains, and the ancients took care to make aqueducts, but time, as usual, destroyed the fabric of the aqueduct either through contempt for the age of the building, or encouraged to ruin it by the carelessness of the citizens of Heraclea. This led to Heraclea being left almost without inhabitants while time produced the same effect upon the palace there, which was a very magnificent building. However, the Emperor Justinian did not neglect this city, but in a truly royal manner furnished it with sweet and transparent waters, and did not allow the palace to lose its ancient reputation, for he restored the whole of it. A day's journey from Heraclea is a place by the seaside named Rodestus. Conveniently situated for the navigation of the Hellespont, with a good harbour. Where merchant ships can moor and discharge their cargoes in quiet water, and. When reloaded can again put to sea without difficulty. It is, however, exposed to. 
attacks of barbarians if they should make a sudden incursion into that country. Being neither fortified nor placed on difficult ground, for this reason it was neglected by merchants, who disregarded it through fear of this danger. Now, however, the Emperor Justinian has not only rendered the place itself secure, but has also provided for the safety of all those who dwell in the neighborhood by building a city at Rudistus, with a strong wall and of very remarkable size, in which, on an invasion of the barbarians, all the people of the neighborhood can take refuge and save their lives and property. X thus did the Emperor Justinian at Rudistus winking sad smiley 82, I now proceed to his works in the Chersensis. The Chersensis projects beyond that part of Thrace. For it runs out into the sea and appears as though it proceeded as far as Asia, and was joined onto it. Its shore forms a promontory near the city of Elus, 83, thus dividing the sea into two parts, while it itself is separated from the rest of the mainland by the water which runs into a recess forming what is called the Black Gulf. The rest of it almost forms an island, from which shape it derives its name. For it is called Chersensis because it is only prevented by a narrow isthmus from being altogether an island. Across this isthmus the ancients carelessly built a wall which could be scaled with ladders, making it as low and narrow as though they thought they were building a dry stone wall round and out of the way. Garden in addition to this they built low and mean works, of the kind called moles, projecting into the sea on either side of the isthmus, and thus fortified the space between the wall and the sea, but in such a manner as not to repel invaders, but to invite them to make an attack, so contemptible and easily captured was their fortification. Imagining, however, that they had erected an impassable barrier against the enemy, they did not think it necessary to build any strong place within this wall, for there was no fort or any other place of strength in the Chersensis, though it extends for a distance of nearly three days' journey. Quite lately the enemy invaded Thrace, made an attempt upon the passage by the seashore, frightened away its guards, forced their way in as if in sport and gained the other side of the wall without any difficulty. The Emperor Justinian therefore, in his great care for the safety of his subjects, did as follows, first, he utterly destroyed the ancient wall so that no vestige of it was left. He then built a second wall upon the same site, of considerable width and height, above the battlements of this he built a vaulted roof like a portico to shelter the defenders, while a second range of battlements resting upon these vaults doubled the defensive power of this work against an enemy. After this, at each end of the wall, on the very beach of the sea, he built two of the projecting works named moles, reaching a long way into the water, connected with the wall, and equaling it in height. He also cleaned out the ditch outside the wall and excavated it to a great width and depth, moreover, he placed a garrison of soldiers within these long walls sufficient to hold them against all the barbarians who might attack the Chersensis. After having made this part so strong and secure, he nevertheless built additional fortifications in the interior, so that if which God forbid, any disaster should befall the long wall the people of Chersensis would nevertheless be safe, for he enclosed the city of Aphrodisias, which before had been for the greater part defenseless, with a very strong wall, and supplied with walls and inhabitants the city of Sybaris, building their baths, hospices, numerous houses, and all that is necessary for a magnificent city. He likewise most securely fortified Callipolis, 84, 
which had been left without walls by the ancients, threw their trust in the long wall. Here he built storehouses. For corn and wine sufficient to supply all the wants of the garrison of the Chersensus. 85. Opposite Abydos is an ancient city named Sistus, which also in former times was uncared for and possessed no defences. It was overhung by a very steep hill, upon which he built a fort which is quite inaccessible and impossible to be taken by an enemy. Not far from Sistus is Elus, where a precipitous rock rises from the sea, raising its summit high in the air and forming a natural fortification. Upon this also the emperor built a fort, which is difficult to pass by and altogether impregnable, moreover, he built a fort at Thescus, on the other side of the long wall fortifying it with an exceedingly strong wall. Thus did he provide in all quarters for the safety of the inhabitants of the Chersensus. 11 Beyond Chersensus is the city of Innes, 86, which takes its name from that of its founder, for Innes was, according to tradition, the son of Anchises. The wall of this place was easy of capture from its lowness, since it did not reach to the necessary height while it lay completely exposed in the neighborhood of the sea, where it was washed by the waves. However, the Emperor Justinian raised its walls to such a height that not only they could not be taken, but could not even be assaulted, and, by bringing them down to the seashore and strengthening them in every quarter, rendered in us altogether impregnable. Thus he provided for the safety of the city, but the country remained exposed to the incursions of the barbarians, because the mountains of Rhodope had been from ancient times deficient in fortifications. In the interior was a village named Belurus, in wealth and population equal to a city, but always exposed to the plundering attacks of barbarians on account of its being defenceless, as was also a large extent of country round about it, this place our emperor made into a city, fortified, and rendered worthy of himself, moreover he also restored with great care all the fortifications which were wanting or had become ruinous in the other cities in the Rhodope Mountains. Among these were Trajanopolis and Maximianopolis, whose walls he rebuilt where they were defective. These were his works in this quarter. In this country Anastasiopolis was already furnished with walls, but, though lying near the sea, had an undefended sea beach, so that it often happened that the barbarian Hun seized the vessels which lay there helpless, and extended their ravages to the neighboring islands. The Emperor Justinian enclosed the whole sea beach with a fortification, and thus provided for the safety both of the ships and of the islanders. He also constructed a very lofty aqueduct leading to the city from the mountains in the neighborhood. There is in road open ancient city named Topirus, which is almost surrounded by a river and lies at the foot of a lofty hill, from which it had not long before been captured by the barbarian Sclavonians, but Justinian raised its wall to so great a height that it rises above this hill as much as it formerly fell short of it. He built a vaulted portico along the wall, so that the garrison could defend the city in safety against besiegers and formed each of its towers into a strong castle. He also strengthened it by enclosing the part between the river and the city wall by a cross wall. These were the works of the Emperor Justinian in this quarter. I will now describe the other fortifications which he built in the rest of Thrace, and in what is now called Mount Hemus. First, he carefully built up what was Wanting or ruinous at Philippopolis and Plotinopolis, 
which were very weakly fortified, although they stood in the neighborhood of many tribes of barbarians. He also established numberless forts throughout the whole of Thrace, by means of which the country, which had formerly been exposed to the inroads of the enemy, was entirely preserved from their ravages. The names of these forts, as far as my memory goes, are as follows. In Europe. Lydice. Elii. In Rhodope the following new forts. Caesera. Cuscabri. Theodoropolis. Cusculus. Thrasi. Thracian Bospara. Thudanellini. Visaparum. Mundipa. Capisturia. Tharsandala. Veripera. Denisius. Ischipra. Toparum. Ozorm. Dalatarba. Virus. British English. Tamunberi. Semnas. Ditch of Gesilus. Carasthira. Chiroenum. Pinsus. Probini. Tulus. Saint Theodorus. Arson. Burdepto. Castrozaba. Recule. Zositusum. Saint Julianus. Burgisum. Cititus. Dingum. Velasteras. Sassisus. Getrinus. Seertugjura. Bredas. Potamo Castellum. Verus. Idacea. Thosiodis. Emporium. Via. Taurocephalum. Anagoncleas. Valeda Pera. Suras. Cetasis. Antipari. Bepera. Daughters. Pusinum. Somathan. Hyman Perubri. Clysura. Scaria to Seleucra. Hylationi. Augustus. Thrasarichi. Dodors. Baker. Saint Trajanus. Chrysanthus. Dertilus. Maserata. Solvani. Zdebrin. Vascum. S. Theodorus. Zingsira. Ascasus. Hemamunti. Bertugizi. Zemarchi. Torocumum. Serioparorum. Nice. Casabonorum. Carvotumba. Unsi. Dixas. Antoninum. Getistraus. Debra. Sidon. Probini. Sun Polygon. Carborus. Basabunum. Esamunti. Anchialus. Asgigius. Marcianum. Dalatarba. Siridana. Theodoropolis. Baculi. The following are the other forts in Thrace on the Euchine Sea and River. Danube, and also in the interior of the country. On the River Danube. Messias. Justinianopolis. Urculent. Therma. Scatrina. Gemelamunts. Apiara. Azilba. Exantaprista. Cuscana. Dionyana. Cuscum. Limo. Fossatum. Odysseus. Bisdina. Bidigis. Marcianopolis. Arena. Scythias. Nicopolis. Grapso. Zisideba. Nano. Poliscastilum. Trisms. Cystodigius. Nidano. Bastinus. Residina. Metalla. Constantiana. Veripera. Calatis. Spadigius. Basidina. Maserata. Belidina. Bodus. Abritus. Ziznutba. Robusta. Tarules. 
Dinoscarta Monteregin Tigra Basis Stiba Altina Novas Moroval In the interior Copastorus Gratiana Virginazo Predis Tilito Argamo Anseriana Paulamundra Muridba Sasclis Its Fair Theodora Castellanovo Tomis Padizara Cris Bismafa Catasi Valentiniana Niconis Zildapa Novjustiniana Axiopa Presidio Carso Ergamia and others beyond number. Book V. Either works of Justinian in the whole of Europe have been as far as possible. Described by me in the former portion of this book, we must now proceed to the description of the remainder of his works in Asia. I think that I have described above the fortifications of cities and forts, and the other buildings erected by him. In the east, from the Median frontier as far as the city of Palmyra in Phoenicia, on the borders of Lebanon. I shall now speak of his works in the remainder of Asia and Libya, describing both the manner in which he repaired the roads, which were difficult and dangerous, in some places steep and overhung by rocky mountains, in others bordering upon rivers which drowned travelers, and also how he repaired all that was defective in the cities, beginning at the following point. Before the city of Ephesus, 87, there is some high ground, not formed of earth, or capable of producing fruit, but altogether hard and rocky. Here the inhabitants, at former times had built a church, dedicated to Saint John the Apostle, surnamed the Divine. This apostle was named the Divine because he has written about God in a manner surpassing the nature of man. This church, which was small and ruinous through age, the Emperor Justinian raised to the ground and rebuilt of such size and beauty that, in short, it resembles and in all respects vies with the church dedicated by him to the apostles in the imperial city, which I have described above. This was the work of our emperor in Ephesus. In the island of Tenidos I will presently describe the work which he constructed for the advantage of the imperial city and all seafarers, after making the following prefatory remarks. The sea as far as the Hellespont is contained in a narrow strait, for the two continents. Their approach nearest to one another forming the beginning of the strait near Sistus and Abydos. Ships bound for Constantinople consequently anchor when they reach this place, because they are unable to proceed any further unless the wind blows from the south. When, therefore, the fleet of corn ships sail thither from Alexandria, if it meets with a favorable wind, the merchants in a very Short time moor their ships in the harbours of Byzantium, and as soon as they have unloaded them, depart at once, in order that they may all make this voyage for a second or even a third time before the winter, while those of them who choose take in some other merchandise for the return voyage. If, however, the wind blows against them at the Hellespont, both the corn and the ships become injured by delay. Reflecting upon these things, the Emperor Justinian has clearly proved that nothing is impossible for man, even when he has to contend with the greatest difficulties, for he built granaries on the island of Tenidos, which is close to the strait, of a sufficient size to contain the freight of the whole fleet, being in width no less than 90 feet, in length 280 and of great height. After the emperor had constructed these, 
when those who were conveying the public supply of corn were detained by contrary winds at this point, they used to unload their cargo into the granary, and, disregarding the northerly and westerly winds and all the other winds which were unfavorable for them, would prepare for another voyage. They therefore at once sailed home. While afterwards, whenever it became convenient to sail from Tenedos to Byzantium, the corn was conveyed from Tenedos thither in other ships by persons appointed to perform this duty. Two in Bithynia there is a city, 88, named after Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine, in which they say that Helena was born, and which in former times was an inconsiderable village. The Emperor Constantine, out of filial duty, gave this place its name and the dignity of a city, but built nothing there on an imperial or magnificent scale, for the place remained in its former condition in respect of its buildings, but merely had the glory of being called a city, and prided itself on being named after Helena, to whom it had given birth. However, the emperor of our own age, as though wishing to put away the reproach of the founder of the empire, first supplied this city, which he found suffering from want of water, with a magnificent aqueduct, and furnished the inhabitants beyond their expectation with enough water not only to drink, but also to wash in, and to use for all the other luxuries of life, as they were now supplied with water in abundance, in addition to this he built for them a new public bath, and restored another which had fallen into ruins and been neglected through the want of water which I have mentioned, so that it had all fallen to the ground. He also built churches, palaces, porticos, and dwellings for the magistrates, and supplied all the other needs of a flourishing city. Close by this city flows a river, which the natives from its form call Draco, the snake, for it winds in curves on either hand, often proceeding in opposite directions, bending its waters round in a crooked course, and flowing now to the right hand and now to the left, so that travellers coming to the city were obliged to cross it more than twenty times. 89. Many of them thus perished through the river suddenly rising in flood, besides which, a thick wood and masses of reeds which encumbered its outfall into the sea, made it a source of trouble to the country, indeed, not very long ago, after much rain, it overflowed its banks and inundated a great part of the country, doing irreparable damage, for it swept away many fields, uprooted vines, olives, and numberless fruit trees of all kinds, and also the houses which stood outside the walls of the city, besides doing other important damage to the inhabitants. The Emperor Justinian, out of pity for them, devised the following plan, he cleared away the woods, and cut down all the reeds, so as to enable the river to discharge itself freely into the sea, so that it would no longer be forced to overflow its banks. He also cut through the mountains which stand in that country, and made a carriage road through places which formerly had been rough and precipitous. By this means he rendered it unnecessary for the greater part of the inhabitants to cross the river at all, whilst he threw two bridges of great width across it, so that henceforth they could pass over it without danger. 3. The excellent works which he constructed at Nicaea, 90, in Bithynia, are worthy of mention. In the first place, he restored the whole of the aqueduct, which had entirely fallen into ruin and become useless, and thus furnished the city with an abundant supply of water. Next he built churches and convents both for women and men. He carefully restored the whole of the palace there, some part of which was in ruins, 
and likewise a bath in the place which is called the courier's lodgings and which had long been ruinous. Close to this city, on the west side, a torrent is wont to rush down, making the road in that direction entirely impassable. The ancients had constructed a bridge here, which in the course of time became unable to withstand the rush of the torrent, as it was not kept in proper repair, so that it yielded to the force of the stream, and was swept away, leaving no trace on the spot where it formerly stood. The Emperor Justinian built another bridge here, of such height and width that the former one seemed to bear no proportion to it whatever, which rises high above the torrent when at its fullest, and affords a safe passage to travellers. Section and Plan of the cistern of Imbaha or baths of Antoninus Reduced from Texia's Asia Minor G.A. At Nicomedia, 91, he rebuilt the baths of Antoninus, the most important part of which had fallen down, and from the vastness of its size seemed unlikely ever to be rebuilt. The great river which is now called the Sangaris, 92, which runs with an exceedingly swift current, is of great depth in the middle, and of width like a sea, and had never been spanned by a bridge since the creation, however, by lashing a number of boats together, and connecting them with each other like mat work, foot passengers ventured to cross it, as once the army of Medes crossed the Hellespont, fearing the wrath of Xerxes. This, however, they did not accomplish without danger, for the river often swept away all the boats, together with their fastenings, and made it impossible for travellers to cross it. Now, however, the Emperor Justinian has attempted to build a bridge over it. The work is begun, and he has already expended much labor upon it, so that I am sure that before long he will accomplish it, for I know that heaven assists him in all his works, so that up to this time none of his projects have remained unaccomplished, although in many cases he at first seemed to be undertaking impossibilities. There is a road in Bithynia leading thence into Phrygia, upon which in the winter season innumerable men and animals used to perish, for the ground. Being soft, not only after great rains, or the melting of great quantities of snow, but even after slight showers, became deep, impassable mud, and turned the road into a swamp, in which travellers were frequently swallowed up. He, however, together with the Empress Theodora, with magnificent generosity, removed this source of danger to travellers, for they raised the thoroughfare safely upon enormous stones for a distance of half a day's journey for a lightly equipped traveller, and enabled passengers to proceed along a firm road. These were the works of the Emperor Justinian in this quarter. In Bithynia there are springs of warm water in the place called Pythia. These springs are made use of by many persons, especially the inhabitants of Byzantium, for pleasure, and above all for the healing of those suffering from disease. Here he displayed a truly imperial magnificence, for he built a palace which had not existed before, and public baths supplied with the warm water. He also brought hither drinking water by an aqueduct from distant fountains, and relieved the place from the drought from which it had formerly suffered. Besides this, he rebuilt on a larger and much more magnificent scale the Church of the Archangel and the Infirmary for the Sick. For there is a river in Galatia which the inhabitants call the Siberis, 93, near the place called Sisi, and about 10 miles from the city of Heliopolis, on the eastern side. This river often rose suddenly. 
to a great height and swept away many of the travellers along that road. The Emperor Justinian, grieved at hearing this, put a stop to these disasters for the future by spanning the river with a powerful bridge, capable of withstanding the force of a flooded river. He also formed the eastern abutment of the bridge into a projecting wall of the form technically known as a bulwark. He also built a church for travelers on the western side of it, which might serve as a refuge for them in times of storm. The river, which flows past the western side of this city of Heliopolis, used to shake and injure its walls, however. Our emperor restrained it by building an embankment parallel to the city wall for a distance of not less than 500 feet. By this means he preserved the fortifications of the city from being washed away. The following were his works in Cappadocia. There has been there since ancient times a very large and populous city named Caesarea which was surrounded by a wall of such excessive extent as to render it weak and altogether indefensible, because it enclosed a large space which was not necessary for the city, and was exposed to attack by its useless length, for there are lofty hills, not near to one another, but at a considerable distance, which the founder of the city was anxious to enclose within its walls, lest they should be used to attack it from, so that thus, under the pretext of safety, he really bridge exposed it to great danger, by enclosing many fields and gardens across the besides crags and high pasture land, on which the inhabitants did not river subsequently build any houses but left it in its former condition, the Sangaris. Few houses upon it remaining solitary and isolated to the present. Reduced from Texias Asia. Day. The garrison was not sufficient to guard such a great extent of minor wall, nor were the inhabitants able to keep it in repair, so that they lived in terror of attack just as though they had no walls at all. However, the Emperor Justinian pulled down the unnecessary part of the wall, concentrated the city within a really efficient rampart, and made the place impregnable to all assailants, strengthening it with a sufficient garrison. Thus did he provide for the safety of the people of Caesarea in Cappadocia. There was in Cappadocia a fortress named Mosus, standing on level ground, whose wall was so decayed that some part of it had already fallen, and the rest was like to fall. The Emperor Justinian demolished this fort, and built a new and very great wall to the westward of the old fort, on a lofty spot inaccessible to any assailants. Here he built many churches hospices, public baths, and everything else which belongs to a flourishing city, so that this place came to be regarded as the metropolis, which is the name given by the Romans to the first city of a nation. These were his works in Cappadocia. V along the road leading from the city of Antiochia, now called Theopolis, towards Cilicia, is a suburb named Platinum. Not far from this city was an ancient path, confined in a narrow glen between two mountains, which had been for the greater part washed away by the rains, so as to render it dangerous to travellers proceeding along it. When the Emperor Justinian heard of this, he spent much pains and thought upon it, and at once discovered a remedy for this evil for at a vast expense he cut down and overcame the difficulties of the mountains in that region for a great distance, so that, beyond everyone's hope and expectation, he made a level and wide carriage road over what had formerly 
being precipice, clearly proving that by wise plans and lavish expenditure men can overcome all obstacles. These were his works in that quarter. There is in Cilicia a city named Mops Hustia, 94, the work, it is said, of the celebrated ancient prophet, Mopsus. Beside this runs the river Pyramus, which is an ornament to the city, but is only traversed by one bridge. In the course of ages the greater part of this bridge became ruinous, so that it continually threatened to fall, and all who crossed it did so with the fear of death before their eyes. Thus, a work devised by the ancients for men's safety had, through the negligence of those in charge of it, become a source of danger and terror. However, our emperor carefully restored all the ruinous parts of the bridge, so as to afford security to those who crossed it, and enabled the city again to take a pride in the river unalloyed with fear. Beyond this is the city of Adana, round the eastern side of which runs a river named Sarus, 95, which rises in the mountains of Armenia. The Sarus is a navigable river, and is nowhere fordable on foot. Here in ancient times there had been constructed a large and admirable bridge, in the following manner. In the river were built many piers, formed of large stones of great thickness, extending across the whole width of the river, and rising high above its surface. Above the two central ones rise two lofty arches. These piers, standing in the water, and having to withstand the force of a strong current, had in the course of ages become for the most part ruinous, so that at no distant time it appeared probable that the whole bridge would fall into the river, and every man who crossed it prayed that it might only just hold together until he had done so. However, the Emperor Justinian dug a new channel for the river, into which he diverted its stream for a time, removed the water from the above-mentioned piers, promptly removed the ruinous portions of them, and rebuilt them, after which he turned the river back again into the channel which is called its bed. These were his proceedings here. The river Sidnus, 96, runs through the midst of the city of Tarsus, and appears to have done no injury to it at any time except once, when it caused great destruction in the following manner. The season was springtime, and a south wind, which suddenly began to blow with great strength, melted all the snow, with which in winter time the Tarsus Mountains are almost entirely covered. In consequence of this streams of water ran down from every part of those mountains, all the ravines poured down torrents, and numerous springs inundated all the skirts of the Tarsus Range. The river Sidnus, swollen high by these waters which were poured into it by its tributaries, and by heavy rains, which afterwards fell, overflowed and entirely washed away all the suburbs of Tarsus on the southern side, poured furiously into the city, sweeping away the bridges, which were of slight construction, inundated all the streets and market places, and even rose as high as the upper stories of the houses. For a night and a day the city remained in this danger and distress, after which the river gradually retired and returned to its usual bed. When the Emperor Justinian heard of this, he devised the following plan. In the first place, he prepared a second channel for the river outside the city, in order that it might there divide its stream, and might only pour half its waters upon the city of Tarsus, next, he built the bridges very much wider, and rendered them too strong to be swept away by the flooded Sidnus. Thus he enabled the inhabitants of the city to dwell in it without alarms or dangers for the future. 
Plan of S. Sacra. Dome of the Rock. From the O.S. Plan of Jerusalem 1864-5. Plan of El Aqsa. 6. These were the works of the Emperor Justinian in Cilicia. At Jerusalem he built a church in honor of the Virgin, 97, to which no other can be compared. The inhabitants call it the New Church. I shall describe what it is like, prefacing my account by the remark that this city stands for the most part upon hilly ground, which hills are not formed of earth, but are rough and precipitous, so as to make the paths up and down them as steep as ladders. All the rest of the buildings in the city stand in one place, being either built upon the hills, or upon flat and open ground, but this church alone stands in a different position, for the Emperor Justinian ordered it to be built upon the highest of the hills, explaining of what size he wished it to be, both in width and in length. The hill was not of sufficient size to enable the work to be carried out according to the emperor's orders, but a fourth part of the church, that towards the south wind and the rising sun, in which the priests perform the sacred mysteries, was left with no ground upon which to rest. Accordingly those in charge of this work devised the following expedient they laid foundations at the extremity of the flat ground and constructed a building rising to the same height as the hill. When it reached the summit, they placed vaults upon the walls and joined this building to the other foundations of the church, so that this church in one place is built upon a firm rock, and in another place is suspended in the air, for the power of the Emperor has added another portion to the original hill. The stones of this substruction are not of the size of those which we are accustomed to see, for the builders of this work, having to contend with the nature of the ground, and being forced to raise a building equal in size to a mountain, scorned the ordinary practices of building, and betook themselves to strange and altogether unknown methods. They cut blocks of stone of enormous size out of the mountains which rise to vast heights in the neighborhood of the city, cunningly squared them, and brought them thither in the following manner, they built wagons of the same size as these stones, and placed one stone upon each wagon. These wagons were dragged by picked oxen, chosen by the emperor, forty of them dragging each wagon with its stone. Since it was impossible for the roads leading into the city to take these wagons upon them, they made a passage for them by cutting deeply into the mountains, and thus formed the church of the great length which it was the emperor's pleasure that it should have. After they had built it of a proportional width they were not able to put a roof upon it. While they were inspecting every grove and place which they heard was planted with tall trees, they discovered a thick wood, producing cedars of enormous height, with which they made the roof of the church, of a height proportional to its length and width. These were the works, 98, which the Emperor Justinian constructed by human power and art, though assisted by his pious confidence which in its turn reflected honor upon himself, and helped him to carry out his design. This church required to be surrounded on every side with columns, such as in beauty would be worthy of the main building, and of a size capable of supporting the weight which would be laid upon them. However, the place, from its inland situation at a distance from the sea, and its being entirely surrounded by the precipitous mountains which I have mentioned, rendered it impossible for the builders of the foundation to bring columns thither from elsewhere. While, however, the emperor was grieving at this difficulty, God pointed out in the 
nearest mountains a bed of stone of a kind suitable for this purpose, which either had existed there in former times and been concealed, or was then created. Either story is credible to those who regard God as the cause of it, for we, measuring everything by our human strength, think that many things belong to the region of the impossible, while for God nothing whatever is difficult or impossible. The church, then, is supported by a great number of columns brought from this place, of very great size, and of a color which resembles flame, which stand, some above, some below, and some round the porticos which encircle the entire church, except on the side turned towards the east. Of these columns, the two which stand before the door of the church are of very unusual size, and probably second to no columns in the whole world. Beyond them is another portico, named the Narthex, read, I suppose because it is narrow, after this is a court of square shape supported by columns of equal size, from this lead interior doors of such grandeur as to show those passing them what a spectacle they are about to meet with. Beyond this is a wonderful porch, and an arch supported on two columns at a great height. Proceeding further, there stand two semicircles, opposite to one another, on each side of the way to the church, while on either side of the other road are two hospices, the work of the Emperor Justinian one of which is destined for the reception of strangers, while the other is an infirmary for the sick poor. The Emperor Justinian also endowed this Church of the Virgin with large revenues. Such were the works of the Emperor Justinian in Jerusalem. Ruins of Church on Mount Gerizim From a plan by Captain Wilson Re. Quarterly Statement April 1883 7. There is a city in Palestine named Neapolis, which is overhung by a lofty mountain named Gerizim. 99. This mountain was originally held by the Samaritans, who ascended it at all seasons in order to pray, not that they had ever built a church there, but worshipped and reverenced the summit of the mountain. Above everything else, Jesus, the Son of God, when in the flesh, went amongst these people, and held a conversation with one of the women of the country. When she inquired of him about the mountain, he told her that in future times, the Samaritans should not worship in this mountain, but that the true worshippers should worship himself there, alluding to the Christians. In process of time this prophecy came to pass, for it was not possible that the true God should lie. It came to pass in the following manner. In the reign of the emperor, Zeno, the Samaritans suddenly collected together, and fell upon the Christians in Neapolis, who were keeping the feast called Pentecost in their church, and killed many of them, while they struck with their swords the bishop, by name Terebinthius whom they found standing before the holy table, engaged in celebrating the sacrament, so as, amongst other wounds, to cut off the fingers from his hands, while they insulted the holy mysteries in a manner fit indeed for Samaritans to do, but not fit for us to speak of. This priest shortly afterwards came to Byzantium, into the presence of the then emperor, to whom he showed what he himself had suffered, described what had taken place, and begged the emperor to avenge what had been done, reminding him of the prophecy of Christ. The emperor Zeno, much moved at what had taken place, without delay, inflicted a full measure of punishment upon those who had been guilty of this outrage. He drove the Samaritans out of Mount Gerizim, handed it over to the Christians, and built upon the summit a church which he dedicated to the Virgin. 
which he enclosed with what was indeed called a wall, but which in truth was a dry stone fence. He placed a sufficient number of soldiers as a garrison in the city below, but in the church and its fortification not more than ten. The Samaritans, enraged at these proceedings, were filled with anger, and remained sulky and dissatisfied, though, through fear of the emperor, they kept silence. In process of time, however, in the reign of Anastasius, the following event took place. Some of the Samaritans, at the instigation of a woman, climbed unexpectedly up the steep face of the mountain, for the road which leads up it from the city was strictly guarded, so that it was impossible for them to ascend by it. Falling suddenly upon the church, they killed the guards who were posted there, and called with a loud voice upon the Samaritans in the city to join them. They, however, fearing the soldiers, were not at all willing to join the conspirators, and not long afterwards the governor of the province, he was named Procpius, of the city of Edessa, an eloquent man, captured those who had been guilty of this outrage, and put them to death. Yet even then the emperor did not bestow any attention or care upon the fortification, but in our own time the emperor Justinian, although he has for the most part converted the Samaritans to a better religion, and rendered them Christians, yet, leaving the old wall round the church upon Jerusalem in its former condition of loose stones, as I described before, he enclosed it within a second wall, and rendered it altogether impregnable. In this place he also rebuilt five Christian churches which had been burned by the Samaritans. These were his works in this country. Eight in the country which was formerly called Arabia, but which now is known as the third province of Palestine, a desert tract extends for a great distance, entirely barren of fruits, of water, and of all good things. A precipitous and savagely wild mountain, named Sina, stands close to the Red Sea. It is not necessary at this point in my narrative for me to give a description of these regions, since in my history of the wars I have given an exact account of the whole of the country near the Red Sea and the so-called Arabian Gulf, and of the tribes of the Auxamite Ethiopians, and the Homerite Saracens. There also I have described how the Emperor Justinian added the palm grove, 100, to the Roman Empire. I therefore omit to speak of this, that I may not incur the charge of want of taste. In this Mount Sina, 101, dwell monks, whose life is but a careful study of death, and who therefore enjoy without fear the solitude which is dear to them. Since these monks have no desires, but are superior to all human passions, and as they possess nothing and spend no care upon their persons, nor seek for pleasure from anything else whatever, the Emperor Justinian built a church for them, which he dedicated to the Virgin, that they might therein spend their life in continual prayer and service of God. He did not build this church on the summit of the mountain, but a long way below it, for it is not possible for a man to pass the night upon the peak, because at night continuous thunderings and other yet more terrible divine manifestations take place, which overpower men's strength and reason. Here it was that Moses is said to have received the law from God, and to have brought it away. At the foot of the mountain our emperor also built a very strong fort, and placed in it a very considerable garrison of soldiers, in order that the barbarian Saracens might not from that point, the country being, as I have said, a desert, secretly invade Palestine. This is what he did here, but what 
he did in the monasteries, both here and in the remainder of the East, I will now briefly enumerate. 9. In Jerusalem he restored the following monasteries, that of St. Thulus, Street Gregorius, and Street Pantlemon in the desert of Jordan, the hospice at Jericho winking sad smiley 102, the Church of the Virgin at Jericho, the Church of the Iberians at Jerusalem, the Church of the Lazy in the Desert of Jerusalem, the Church of Street, Mary in the Mount of Olives, the Church of the Well of Street, Elizus winking sad smiley 103, the Church of Silethius, the Church of the Abbot Romanus. He restored the Wall of Bethlehem, and the Church of the Abbot Joannes at Bethlehem. Church at Bethlehem. 104. He built cisterns and reservoirs as follows, in the monastery of Saint Samuel, a wall and a cistern, in the monastery of the Abbot Zacharia, a cistern, in the monastery of Susanna, a cistern, in the monastery of Aphelius, a cistern, in the monastery of Street. John beside the Jordan, a cistern winking sad smiley 105, in the monastery of Street. Sergius in the mountain named Ciceron, a cistern, the wall of Tiberius, 106, the poor house at Bostra in Phoenicia, the house of the Virgin at Porphyrion, 107, the monastery of Saint Foca in the mount, the house of Saint Sergius in Ptolemy winking sad smiley 108. The house of Saint Leontius at Damascus. In the suburbs of Apamia, 109, he restored the poor house of Street. Romanus, he built the wall of Street. Marox, he restored the Church of Daphne, 110, in the suburbs of Theopolis, at Laodicea, 111, he restored the Church of Street. John. In Mesopotamia he restored the monastery of Street. John. And the monasteries of Thelfrach, Zebinus, Theodotus, Joannes, Somath. Siren, Begadacum, and the monastery at Apadne, in Isauria. 112. He rebuilt the bath and poor house of the city of Syracum, the poor house of Saint Conan, and the aqueduct of the same saint in Cyprus the house of S.S. Cosmas and Damianus in Pamphylia, and the poor house of St. Michael in the seaport which is called the naval arsenal of the city of Perga, in Pamphylia. Book 6. I the above were the works of Justinian in those regions. What he did at Alexandria was as follows. The river Nile does not flow as far as Alexandria. But, after reaching the city which is named Cherium, 113, proceeds to the left, leaving the country about Alexandria. In consequence this the ancients, in order that the city might not be entirely cut off from the river, dug a deep channel from Cherium, and succeeded in making a small part of the stream of the river Nile run through it, by which, as by other channels, it discharges its waters into the Lake Maria. This channel was nowhere navigable for large ships, but men at Cherium transfer Egyptian corn from them to boats named Diamata, and so bring it to the city, which they can reach by the river which flows through this channel. They store up the corn in the place which the Alexandrians call Fiale. Since it often happened that when the populace rose in revolt, the corn in this place was destroyed, the Emperor Justinian enclosed it with a wall, and prevented any attacks being made upon the corn. These were the works of the Emperor Justinian in this place. However, since the course of our narrative has brought us into Egypt, a country which borders upon Libya, let us describe his works in that country also, since this emperor found the whole of Libya in the possession of barbarians, 
and annexed it to the Roman Empire. The River Nile, which flows from the Indies into Egypt, divides that land into two portions down to the sea. The land, which is divided by the river, is divided. Also in name, for the country on the right bank of the river is named Asia, as far as the river faces in Colchis, which divides the land of Asia from that of Europe, or indeed to the Cimrian Straits and the river Tanais, for geographers are at issue upon this point, which I have mentioned in the description of the you can see in my history of the wars. The country on the left bank of the Nile is called Libya as far as the main ocean, which divides the two continents in the west by interposing an arm between them, which forms our Mediterranean Sea. The whole of Libya is divided into various provinces, called, probably, after the name of their inhabitants but the name of Libya at the present day is applied only to the territory of Pentapolis, 114, which extends from the frontier at Alexandria as far as the city of Siren. In it there is a city, situated at a distance of two days' journey from Alexandria, named Tafosiris, 115, in which it is said that the Egyptian god Osiris is buried. In this city the Emperor Justinian constructed magistrates' houses, public baths, and other buildings. To the greater part of this country of Libya is desert, and was almost entirely neglected, yet our Emperor in his watchful care took measures to prevent its incurring any damage from invasion by the neighboring Moors, for he built two forts and established garrisons in them. One of these forts is named Paratonium, and the other Antipiagum, which stands near Pentapolis. Pentapolis is distant from Alexandria eight days' journey for a lightly equipped traveller. In this country of Pentapolis the Emperor Justinian likewise very strongly fortified the city Tkria, 116, and rebuilt from its foundations the wall. 117, of Berenice, 118, where he also built a public bath for the use of the citizens, moreover, on the southern frontier of Pentapolis he fortified two monasteries, named Agrioludes and Denathian, by which he restrained the barbarians in that quarter from making sudden and unexpected inroads on the Roman territory. There is in this country a city, named Ptolemy, 119, which in former times was flourishing and populous, but in process of time became almost deserted. Through want of water, for the greater part of the inhabitants long ago suffered from drought so much that they left it and dispersed in various directions. Now, however, our emperor has rebuilt the aqueduct which supplied the city with water, and restored it to its former appearance of prosperity. 120. The furthest city of Pentapolis upon the western frontier is that of Borium, 121, where mountains, standing close together, seem to form a barrier which shuts out the enemy from invading the country. The emperor, finding this city unwalled, enclosed it with a very strong rampart thus rendering it and the whole of the country round it quite secure for the future. There are two cities, both of which pass under the same name, being both called Orgila. 122, they stand at a distance of about four days' journey from Borium for a lightly equipped traveller, on the southern side of it. They are old cities and the habits of their citizens are old-fashioned, for all of them, even in my own time, practiced the rites of polytheism. Here in ancient times were temples dedicated to Amun, and to Alexander of Macedon, to whom the inhabitants used to offer sacrifice down to the reign of Justinian, and there was in 
them a large number of persons called slaves of the temple, now, however, our emperor, who not only provides for the security of the bodies of his subjects, but is also careful to save their souls, took all necessary measures for the benefit of those who dwelt here, making liberal provisions for them in all respects, and above all teaching them the true religion, so that he made them all Christians in a body, and turned them from their pagan ancestral customs. He also built for them a temple of the Virgin, to serve as a fortress for the safety of the city and of the true religion. These were his works in this quarter. The city of Borium, lying near the Moorish barbarians, has remained free from imposts down to this time, nor have any gatherers of tribute or taxes visited it since the creation. From ancient times Jews dwelled close to it, and had an ancient temple which they greatly respected and reverenced, as it had, according to tradition, been built by Solomon the king of the Hebrew nation. However, the Emperor Justinian compelled them all to desert their ancestral religion and become Christians, while he turned this temple into a church. Three beyond this lie what are called the Great Seerts. I will explain what their appearance is, and why they have received this name. The shore in this quarter, divided by the inroads of the sea, and washed away by the beating of the waves seems to retire and to withdraw itself inland, so as to form an immense crescent-shaped gulf. The distance across the mouth of this gulf is forty stadia, while the perimeter of the crescent extends to a distance of six days' journey. The sea forms this gulf by pressing against the mainland, and when a ship is once forced, by the wind or the waves within the horns of the crescent, it is thenceforth impossible for it to retrace its course, but it seems dragged along, and always forced further forward. It was, I imagine, from this destruction of ships that the ancients called the place Seerts. Nor can ships float as far as the shore, for the greater part of the gulf is full of sunken rocks which make it impossible for ships to float there, so that they are wrecked in the shallows. The crews of these ships can only escape, if they escape at all, in small boats, and reach the land, with very great danger. Here is the frontier of the region named Tripolis. In it dwell Moorish barbarians of Phoenician origin. Here is also a city named Sidema, inhabited by Moors who have long been on terms of friendship with the Romans, and all of whom, by the persuasion of the Emperor Justinian, voluntarily adopted the Christian faith. These Moors are now called Pakati, because they always are at peace with the Romans, for the Romans in the Latin language call peace pacem. Tripolis is distant from Pentapolis a journey of 20 days journey for a lightly equipped traveller. For beyond this is the city of Leptis Magna, 123, which in ancient times was great and populous, but since has become almost entirely deserted, having through neglect been mostly buried with sand. Our emperor rebuilt its walls from the foundation, not, however, enclosing so great an extent as formerly but, much less, in order that the city might not again be exposed to danger, either from human enemies or from the sand, by its great size. He left the buried part of the city as it was, covered with heaps of sand, and fortified the rest in the strongest manner. Here he built an admirable church, dedicated to the Virgin, besides four others. In addition to this, he also rebuilt the ruinous palace which formerly existed here, the work of the Emperor Severus the Elder, who was born in this place, 
and left this palace as a memorial of his good fortune. Having arrived at this part of my narrative, I cannot pass over the great event which took place at Leptis Magna in our time. When Justinian had already come to the throne, and before he had begun the war against the Vandals, the Moorish barbarians called Lucathe overpowered the Vandals, who were then masters of Libya, and reduced Leptis Magna to an utter desert. Being encamped with their generals upon some hilly ground not far from Leptis Magna, they suddenly beheld a flame of fire in the midst of the city. Supposing that the enemy had entered it, they rushed hurriedly to attack them, but finding no one there, they laid the matter before their prophets, who, interpreting what had taken place, foretold that at no distant time Leptis Magna would be inhabited. Not long afterwards the army of the emperor arrived conquered the Vandals and Moors in battle, and gained possession of Tripolis and the rest of Libya. I now return from this digression to my narrative. In this city the Emperor Justinian built public baths, rebuilt the walls from their foundations, and gave both the baths and all other public buildings an appearance worthy of a city. Moreover, he induced the neighboring barbarians, named Gade Bitany, who up to this time were entirely given up to the Greek form of paganism, to become zealous Christians, as they are at this day. He also fortified the city of Sabaratha, in which he built a most notable church. In the further part of this country there are two cities, named Takapa, 124, and Gajis between which lies the lesser Seertis. Here every day a wonderful phenomenon takes place. The sea, pent up in a narrow place, forms there a crescent-shaped gulf, such as I described in the other Seertis. Here the sea flows into the mainland for a distance of more than eight days' journey for a lightly equipped traveller, and towards evening retires again leaving the shore there dry. Like any other sea beach, sailors bound for this land, which at times becomes sea, sail in the ordinary manner as far as they are able in the daytime, but towards nightfall prepare to pass the night on dry land. They carry long poles on purpose, and as soon as they suspect that the waters are about to ebb, they take these poles in their hands, and without any hesitation leap out of the ship. At first, they swim, but afterwards, when the water does not reach above their faces, they stand on their feet, and sticking the points of their poles into the ground, which by this time is, or shortly will be, dry, they fix them upright underneath their ship, supporting it on either side that it may not be damaged by falling to one side or the other. Early on the following morning the land is again covered by the waves of the sea, which raises the ships and causes them to float, then the sailors take up their poles and sail on again. This proceeding never varies, but this interchange of the elements takes place every day. V after Tripolis and the Seertis let us proceed to the rest of Libya. We must begin with Carthage, which is the largest and most important of the cities in this country, prefacing our description by observing that when Genseric and the Vandals possessed Africa, there occurred to them a destructive idea worthy of barbarians, for they imagined that they would be better off if all the towns in this country had no walls, so that the Romans might not occupy any of them to their disadvantage. They accordingly at once pulled down all the walls to their very foundation, for all barbarians, as a rule, most quickly devise and most promptly execute any plans which they form for the injury of the Romans. The walls of 
Carthage and some few other places alone were left, which they did not care to keep in repair, but allowed to be ruined by age. However, the Emperor Justinian, against the advice of all men, who shrank in terror from the enterprise, and only led on and assisted by God, sent Belisarius with an army to Libya, took Gelima, and destroyed the power of the Vandals, killing many of them and making the rest prisoners of war, as I have recounted in my history of the wars. He rebuilt all the ruined fortifications in Libya, and himself built many new ones. First of all, he gave his attention to Carthage, 125, which now, as is right, is named Justiniana. He rebuilt the whole of its ruined walls, and dug a trench. Encircling it, which did not previously exist, he also built churches, one dedicated to the Virgin, which is in the palace, and one outside the palace. Dedicated to Saint Prima, one of the local saints. He built porticos on both sides of what is called the maritime marketplace, and a noble public bath, which he named the Baths of Theodora, after the name of the Empress. He also built a monastery on the seashore within the walls, close to the harbour, named Mandracium, which he enclosed with a strong wall and formed into an impregnable fort. These were the works of Justinian at New Carthage. In the country near it, which is called the Proconsulate, there was an unwalled city named Baga, 126, which was liable to be taken by barbarians, not only if they marched especially to attack it, but even if they passed near it. This place the Emperor Justinian enclosed with a strong wall, thus raising it to the rank of a city, and one, two, which was capable of affording security to its citizens, who, having met with such favour, named the city Theodorias, in honour of the Empress. He also built a fort in this country, named Tuca. Six in Byzacium is a city by the seaside, named Adrametus, 127, which in ancient times was great and populous, so that it had the name and repute of being the chief city in this country, because it was the first in size and in prosperity. The Vandals demolished the walls of this city, that the Romans might not be able to hold it against them so that it was exposed to the attacks of the Moors, who ravaged that country, however, the Libyan inhabitants provided for their own safety as far as they were able, by piling up the ruins of their walls and joining their houses to one another, by which means they were able to offer a precarious resistance to their assailants. Their safety, however, hung by a thread, and was very uncertain, as they were at war with the Moors and neglected by the Vandals. When, however, the Emperor Justinian, in the course of the war, became master of Libya, he built a wall of considerable size round this city, established in it a sufficient garrison of soldiers, and enabled the inhabitants to be confident of safety and to disregard all their foes. For this reason they call it Justiniana to the present day, thus repaying their debt of gratitude to the Emperor, and showing their loyalty towards him by the adoption of his name, for they had no other means of repaying the kindness of the Emperor, as he wished for no other return than this. On the shore of Byzacium there is another place named Kaput Veda, 128 by its inhabitants. It was at this place that the emperor's army first landed when it proceeded against Gelima and the Vandals. Here, also, that marvellous and ineffable gift was bestowed by God upon the emperor, which I have described in my history of the wars. The country being altogether waterless, the Roman army suffered greatly from thirst 
where upon the earth, which formerly had always been dry, sent forth a fountain at the place where the soldiers had formed their camp. For when they dug, the water burst forth, and the land, divesting itself of its natural barrenness, changed its nature and became moist with sweet water. Here, therefore, they encamped and passed the night, and marching forth in battle array the next day, to cut the matter short, gained possession of Libya. The Emperor Justinian therefore, in order to erect a perpetual memorial of this gift of God, who when he pleases can make the most difficult things easy, at once determined to form this place into a city, with a strong wall, and adorned with everything else worthy of a city. The Emperor's wish was fulfilled. The wall and city were built, and the fortunes of this open field were suddenly altered. The rustics, throwing away the plough, dwell as citizens, and no longer live a country, but a town life, for they meet together there daily, deliberate upon their own affairs, buy and sell in the market with one another, and perform all the other functions which distinguish the inhabitants of a city. These were his works on the seashore of Byzantium. In the interior, on the frontier which borders on the barbarian moors, very strong fortresses are built to hold them in check, in consequence of which they are no longer able to overrun the empire, for he enclosed each of the cities upon that frontier, which are named Mama, Telepta, and Kilulius, with very strong walls built a fort which the inhabitants name Armatra, and established in them trustworthy garrisons of soldiers. Seven in the same manner he ensured the safety of the country of Numidia by fortifications and garrisons of soldiers. I shall now enumerate each of these in detail. There is a mountain in Numidia called Aurasius, 129 the like of which does not exist anywhere else in the world. In the first place, it is lofty and precipitous, and extends for a distance of about three days' journey, it is also inaccessible, all the ascents to it being barred by precipices. When, however, one has reached the top, the ground is a rich soil, smooth, and with easy roads, fair pastures, parks planted with trees and all kinds of herbs. Fountains spring out. From the crags, there are quiet pools, rushing rivers with masses of broken water. And, what is strangest of all, the crops and fruit trees on this mountain produce twice as much as any other part of Libya. Such is the mountain of Aurasium, which was originally held by the Vandals whom the Moors dispossessed, and dwelled there until the Emperor Justinian drove them out and annexed it to the Roman Empire, to prevent the barbarians returning thither and doing mischief. He fortified the cities in the neighborhood of this mountain, which he found deserted and without walls, and having, besides them, built two forts, and established there a sufficient garrison of soldiers, he left the barbarians of that country no hope of making a successful attack upon Aurasius. He also built impregnable fortifications in the remainder of Numidia. These were his works in this country. There is a city in the island of Sardo, which is now called Sardinia, which the Romans call the Fort of Trajan, this Justinian enclosed with a wall, which it did not formally possess. Near Gades, by one of the pillars of Hercules, on the right hand, on the shore of Libya, was once a fort named Septon, 130, which had been built by the Romans in ancient times, but had been neglected by the Vandals and had perished through age. This place our Emperor Justinian made strong by a wall.
and a garrison. In it also he built a noble church dedicated to the Virgin, thus dedicating to her the beginning of the empire, and rendering this fort impregnable to all mankind in that quarter. So much for this. No one can any longer doubt, but it is now clear to all mankind that the Emperor Justinian strengthened the empire, not only with fortifications, but also with garrisons, from the eastern frontier to the setting sun, which are the limits of the Roman dominion. Such of the buildings of Justinian, as I have been able to discover, either by having seen them myself, or by hearing them described by those who have seen them, I have as far as I am able described in this work, but I am well aware that I have omitted to speak of many others, which have either escaped my notice by their great number or remain altogether unknown to me, so that anyone who turns his attention to searching them all out and describing them in a book will have the advantage of having performed a useful work, and will gain for himself the reputation of a man of taste. Appendix I Procpius's description of Justinian's work at Constantinople is so full and detailed that it would appear to be complete. But it omits one church built by the Emperor, viz., that of the Saviour, to which was attached the monastery of the Kara, now known as the Mosque Kahaya, or Karayi. The history of this church is thus given in due Kanj. Karasu Monastrium Itea Appellatum, Condiderat Justinianus it cum. Prevetustit considisit aliuda fundamentis extrucit Alexii Imperatris Socris. Andronicide you see conjux. Denit cum ruinam rursum minorita, illad reedificavit Theodorus. Metacitam magnus logotheta, imperant andronico paleologo senior. He omnia signarit nicephorus gregoris, lib 9, divertit e regnit in. Vicinia, Damus sua, in sacro silicite cari monasterio, quod ips magnus anti. Sumptibus vetustit ruinosum instoravat. Extracta minimo limfu orato. Justinia no imperatriforma oblonga, dein de cum vetustit usc adima. Considisit, aliuda fundamentis templum, e aqua nunc forma cernicha, alexii. Comnini imperatris socris candidit sed cum rursus ruinam minitata, hic. Medio templo excepto, omnia liberali manu pen instoravit. Mitakitam hujus. Monasteritu instoratorim rursus predicat, lib. 8. Ducange, 4, p. 126. An inscription over the south door of the church states that the monastery was outside the walls of Constantine, that the church was rebuilt by Justinian, again. From its foundations, in the time of Alexis Komnenos, and again rebuilt by Theodore the Metakite. Sketch Plan The well-known antiquary, Mons. Texia, describes it thus in a detailed MS. Account of Constantinople Fall. N.D. In the Library of the R. Institute of Architects. Carage, Corruption du Greek. Le premier fondateur de cette église fut Justinian, it Theodore Metakite. Grand Chancellor des Hortels d'Andronis Paleologeni en fut Q le renovator. Le cloître ist souvent site dans les auteurs byzantines comme lieu d'exil pour les religio, it ordini attempts de l'empire en conserva dans l'église le portrait. Celebre de la Madone qui avait it paint par Saint Luc. A description of it is also given in Sarzenberg's old chrysalike Bodenkmal von Constantinople. Berlin, 1854, p. 36. The latest account is given by the Revelation. Charles G. Curtis, in the Encyclopedia Britannica 9th edition, SV. Constantinople. 
the monastery to which this church of the Saviour belonged was. Or, as we say, in the fields. This was an ancient establishment, and its church, the oldest church in the city, dates from the 3rd century. A gem of beauty still, even in its decay, rich with mosaic of the 14th century, of a style purer and more refined than that which is more often seen and admired at Ravenna and Palermo. In this church alternately with the Hodagetria was kept the holy robe of the Virgin, which was wont to be carried in procession when the walls were threatened. The sketch plan engraved was made by THL in 1884. An elevation of the exterior is given in C. Daly's Review. 1840, p. 13. L. Appendix 2. Church of the Virgin, Jerusalem. The description by Procopius of this church is very detailed, but the great alterations and destruction of buildings throughout the harem area since his time make it extremely difficult to arrive at a correct understanding of his account, or to identify any portion of the church with existing buildings. It is usually supposed to have occupied the site of the present mosque El-Aqsa, the entrances to which the Duc de Vogue believes to be remains of Justinian's church. The questions as to the church are involved, to a considerable extent, with those relating to the date and authorship of the Dome of the Rock, which has usually been assigned to the Caliph Abdel Malek, but the late Mr. Ferguson, whose great architectural knowledge is undisputed, maintained that it was no other than Constantine's Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and that the church described by Procopius was not on the site of El Aqsa, but at the eastern angle of the temple area, and now utterly destroyed. The subject, already sufficiently complicated, has been rendered still more so by a theory brought forward in 1882, by the well-known Professor Sepp, to the effect that the Dome of the Rock was not constructed by Constantine nor by Abdelmelech, but by Justinian. The question is much more difficult to decide than may at first sight appear. And I confess that after having, for some years past, carefully collected the various documents on the subject, including the valuable translations published by my friend the late Professor Palmer, of Arabic historians, and having subsequently visited Jerusalem and studied the subject on the spot, with the kind assistance of Dr. Chaplin and others, I find that there are so many points to be cleared up, that I should not like to offer a definite opinion on the several disputed points until after another visit, which I hope to make shortly, to Jerusalem. My present views, so far as I may venture to put them forward, are in accordance with those of De Vogue, Sir C. Warren and Captain Kinder, viz. that the Dome of the Rock was built by Abdel Malek. L. Index. A. Abbot Romanus, Church of the 147. Abbot Joannes, Church of the 148. Abbot Zacharia, Monastery of 148. Aborus, River, 54, 55, 57. Abydos, 121, 128. Acacius, Church of, 22. Acarnania, 93. Ad Aquas, 111. Adana, 137. Adina, 113. Adriatic Sea, 90. Adrianopolis, 93. Adrametus, 163. Edabe, 112. Aegean Sea, 24. Aegistum, 114. Innus, 121, 122. 
Italia, 93. Agrioludes, Monastery of, 155. Elaxa, 140. Alexandria, 128, 152, 153. Olmus, 111. Almiris, 114. Albinum, 113. Alistus, 88. Amasia, 86. Amida, 40, 51, 53, 73, 75, 77, 78, 79, 82. Amadeus, 45. Anna plus, 24, 29, 30, 31. Anastasopolis, 122. Anchialus, 89. Anucus, 57. Antiphorus, 59. Antipiagum, 154. Antiogia, 68, 69, 70, 71, 136. Ant, the, 116. Antoninus, Baths of, 131, 132. Apadne, Monastery of, 151. Apadne, 53. Apamia, 151. Aphelius, Monastery of, 148. Apostles, Church of, 20. Artelison, 80. Archangel, Temple of the, 33. Arcadius, 15. Arcadius, Baths of, 36. Archon, 81. Argyronium, 33. Armenia, Lesser, 81. Armenia, 28, 73, 75, 77, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 89. Armenia, Greater, 74, 75, 79, 82. Armata, 111. Arxens, 77. Asia, 25. Astyanine, 79. Ataki, 53. Athira, 116. Athens, 96, 98. Augusta, 112. Orgula, 156. Augusta Elm, 13, 34. Armatra, 165. Aurasius, Mount, 165. B. Bagger, 162. Bay Burden, 81. Balier, 96. Benesimon, 53. Barra, 53. Barkan, 86. Barbalissus, 65. Batne, 61. Bidariana, 91, 92. Bagadakam, Monastery of, 151. Bulabitis, 76. Belurus, 122. Burgonavor, 111. Burgus Altus, 111. Berenice, 154. Bethlehem, 148. Bidamas, 57. Bigrain, 111. Bismidine, 57. Bithinaya, 129, 133, 134. Bizona, 81, 83, 84. Blashane, 16, 26. Black Gulf, 119. Pitea, 96. Bonania, 111. Borium, 156, 157. Bosporus, 88. Bostra, in Phoenicia, 150. Brochi, 29. Bertham, 53. Byzantium, 15, 16, 18, 20, 
24, 26, 29, 31, 33, 38, 114, 117, 123, 129, 134, 145. Byzacium, 163, 164. C. Caesarea, 98, 135. Corlipolis, 121. Corleicum, 57, 61, 64. Campsis, 109. Candidiana, 113. Cantabazates, 109. Cappadocia, 135, 136. Kaput Veda, 164. Kaput Bovis, 109. Kahe, 57, 61. Carthage, 161. Cassandria, 99. Castoria, Lake, 97. Castramatis, 112. Sebas, 111. Centauropolis, 98. Sina, 86. Serres, Gulf of, 24. Cherium, 152. Chalcis, 71, 72, 98. Chals, the Palace of, 34, 35. Cherson, 88. Kura, Church of, 40. Chersonsis, 119, 120, 121. Cyberis, 121. Sidomar, 158. Cilicia, 136, 138. Simrian Straits, 153. Siphi, Fort, 53. Circisium, 55, 57. Scytherizon, 77, 79. Kleis Uri, 79, 87, 96. Colonia, 81. Comagen, 61. Constantinople, 13, 34, 37, 40, 115. 118, 128. Constantina, 54. Corinth, 96. Coracee, 96. Corson, 79. Cord, 45. Curia's Lodgings, 131. Cratiscara, 92. Crisian Gulf, 93. Crispas, 111. Cucarizon, 81. Cululius, 165. Cupus, 109. Sidnus, River, 137, 138. Sintodemus, 113. Sinton, 113. Cyprus, 151. Syracum, 151. Syrian, Monastery of, 151. Cyrus, 71, 72. Syrian, City of, 153. D. Dabani, 53. Dacia, 108, 109. Damascus, 110. Danube, River. 89, 91, 92, 108, 109, 110, 112, 113, 114. Daphne, 113, 151. Dardani, 92. Daras, a village, 40, 41, 42, 43, 47, 48. 49, 51, 52, 53, 83. Dorseron, 57. Demetrius, 97. Deuteron, 17. Demarthian, 
Monastery of 155 Diocletianopolis 97 Ditch of Germanus 81 Ditch of Longinus 86 Doristolus 113 Doru 88 Dorticum 111 Draco River 130 Ducipratum 109 E Echinum 97 Edessa 57 58 59 60 145 Elus 119 121 Ephesus 127 128 Epirus 93 Epidamnus 91 Episcopia 116 Irima 112 Eubia Island 98 Euphratesia 65 67 Euphrates River 53 56 61 63 64 65 75 81 82 Europus Strait of 99 Europus 65 Euroia, 93. Europius, 39. Eukine C, 24, 29, 32, 86, 89, 153. F. Forum of Constantine, 34, 35. 40 Martyrs, 81. Fort of the Emperors, 53. Fountain, the, 16. Forts, lists of 100 to 107, 123 to 126. G. Gopula, 65. Gates, 166. Galatia, 134. Gerizim, 143, 144, 145, 146. Germana, 92. Gajis, 160. Golden Gate, 17, 33. Gumphi, 97. Gums, 111. Greece, 93, 96, 98. Great Seerts, 157. H. Halliconibergus, 111. Hebdomen, 23, 31. Hellespont, 119, 128, 133. Helena, 129. Hemorus, 65. Hera, Temple of, 17. Heraclea, 96, 118, 119. Hyrifthon, Fort. 53. Hiron, 33. Hyrium, 17. Or. Hirum, 38, 39. Hierapolis, 66. Horn, the, 29. Hormistus, 18, 34. House of Oz, 35. Huns, Fort of the, 112. Hypata, 96. I. E. Atron, 113. Iberians, Church of, 147. Ibida, 114. Iluria, 96, 110, 112, 113. Eleusis, 79. Ionian Gulf, 90. Irene, Church of, 14, 27. Ezoria, 151. Iscum, 112. Isidorus, 15. Isthmus of Corinth, 93. Ister, River, 108, 114. Italy, 36, 67, 88. J. Jgundiana, 38. 
Jerusalem, 147. Jericho, Hospice at, 147. Joannes, Monastery of, 151. Jordan, Desert of, 147. Judeus, 111. Julian, Port, 23. Heliopolis, 134. Justinopolis, 92, 93. Justiniana Prima, 91. Justiniana Secunda, 92. Justiniana, Carthage, 162, 163. K. King's Palace, 18. L. Lacobergus, 111. Laodicea, 151. Lapidaria, 112. Larissa, 98. Lazy, Church of the, 147. Lazica, 87. Lebanon, 73. Liderator, 109. Leontarium, 96. Leptis Magna, 158, 159. Libya, 36, 67, 127, 152, 153, 159, 161, 166. Litrata, 109. Loniniana, 111. Lozorum, 87. Lucernaria Bergam, 112. Eleutererizen, 81. Learns, 53. Lysiormum, 81. M. Macedon, 74, 99, 102. Maiotic Lake, 87, 88. Magnkahia, Church of, 168, 169. Magdala Thumb, Fort, 57. Mama, 165. Mandracium, Harbour, 162. Marathon, 98. Mare Burgess, 111. Maria, Lake, 152. Martyr Anthemus, Church of, 27. Martyr Eugenius, Aqueduct, 86. Martyr Minas, Church of, 33. Martyr Menus, Church of, 33. Martyr Mosius, Church of, 23. Martiopolis, 51, 77, 78, 79. Martyr Saint Pantlemon, Church, 32. Martyr Thecla, Church of, 23. Martyr Thesis, Church of, 23. Mark Sintius, 113. Maximianopolis, 122. Melitan, 28, 82. Mesopotamia, 53, 57, 61, 76. Metropolis, 97. Mosus, 135. Moshadius, 33. Mocationa, 111. Mops Eustia, 136. Mount Hemus, 123. Mount Pelion, 98. Mropol, 96. Messia, 114. N. Nisopolis, 92. Neapolis, 143, 144. Neo Caesarea, 65. 67. New Epirus, 93, 100. Nicaea in Bithynia, 130. Nicomedia, 131. Nicopolis, 81, 93. Nile, River, 152, 153. Novi, 109. Novum, 111. Numidia, 165. Nymphius, River, 77. O. 
Octavum, 108. Old Epirus, 23. Onopnictus, 70. Onos, 111. Oracasias, 69, 70. Oranon, 85. Orontz, River, 68, 69. Oshuen, 61, 80. P. Palmyra, 127. Palin, Peninsula of, 99. Palestine, 72, 143, 147. Palmatis, 113. Palatiolum, 112. Pamphylia, 152. Pantalia, 92. Paratonium, 154. Peloponnesus, 97. Pentacamia, 65. Pentapolis, 153, 154, 155, 156. Penus, River, 98. Persian Armenia, 85. Perga, 152. Persia, 51, 52. Perinthus, 118. Petra, 87. Petrius, 81. Pharsalus, 97. Phinis, 93. Phoenicia, 73. Phasis in Colchis, River, 153. Phison, 79. Phial, 152. Philippopolis, 123. Phile, 57. Photica, 93. Phrygia, 133. Phthia, 98. Pycnus, 109. Pitus, 87. Platinum, 136. Plataei, 96. Plotinopolis, 123. Pontum, 110. Pontes, 109, 110. Pontesrium, 111. Potidaea, 99. Ptolemy, 155. Pruthus, 29. Propentis, 36. Putidin, 111. Pyramus, River, 136. Pyramids, the, 40. Pythia, 134. Q. Quisris, 113. Quimadaba, 92. R. Ratioria, 111. Rabdium, 51, 52. Redistus, 119. Rasis, 53. Regium, 115. Regis, 23. Rusius, River, 99, 100. Ripalti, 53. Rizium, 87. Rhodope Mountains, 122, 123. Ripensis, 109. Roman Empire, 29, 43, 54, 56, 85, 88, 94, 117, 146, 152. Rumisiana, 92. S. Sabaratha, 160. Saccus, 96. Sacra, S. Dome of the Rock, 139. Saltopiagus, Fort, 11. Sangaris, River, 133. Safshe, 79. Somath, Monastery of, 151. Sardica, 92. Sardo, Island, Sardinia, 166. Saurus, River, 137. Satala, 80. Sri, 53. Skamaliachon, 85.
86. Certus, River, 58. Scythia, 114. Sebastia, 81. Sebastopolis, 87, 88. Securisca, 113. Slibria, 118. Semiramis at Babylon, 10. Sergius and Bacchus, SS, 14, 18, 19. Sergiopolis, 65. Sergius, 65. Sistus, 121, 128. Siberis, River, 134. Sisabida, 112. Silethius, Church of, 147. Sina, 53. Singidon, 109. Sinai, Mount, close to Red Sea, 146. Cyphris, 53. Cicelison, 86. Cicerinum, Fort, 52. Smargdis, 53. Smorns, 109. Sophanine, 77, 78, 79. Saint Agathonicus, Church of, 23. Stories, 70. Saint Anne, Church of, 17. Stadium, 40. Saint Bartholomew, Church of, 45, 51. SS. Cosmas and Damianus in Pamphylia, House of, 151. SS. Cosmas and Damianus, Church of, 26. Saint Conan, Paul House of, 151. Saint Cyrillus, 114. Saint Elizus, Church of the Well of, 147. Saint George the Martyr, Church of, 81. Saint Gregorius, 147. Stilabergus, 111. Saint John, Church of, 151. Saint John, Monastery of, 149, 151. Saint John the Baptist, Church of, 30. Saint James, Church of, 33. Saint John the Apostle, Church of, 127. Street Laurentius the Martyr, Church of, 26. Saint Leontius, House of, 150. Saint Marox, 151. Saint Michael the Archangel, Church to, Antioch, 71. Saint Michael, Paul House of, 152. Saint Michael the Archangel, at Byzantium, Church of, 17, 29, 31, 134. Saint Mary, Church of, 147. Stork, the, 33. Saint Foca, Monastery of, 150. Saint Plato the Martyr, Church of, 23. SS. Priscus and Nicolaus, Church of, 26. SS. Peter and Paul, 18. Saint Pantlemon, 147. Saint Romanus, Paul House of, 151. Saint Sergius, Monastery of, 149. Saint Samuel, Monastery of, 148. Saint Sophia, Church of, 4, 11, 14, 15, 21, 34, 51. Saint Theodorus, Church of, 23. Saint Theodota, 23. Saint Tryphon, Church of, 33. Saint Thulus, 147. Suri, 64. Susanna, Monastery of, 148. Susiana, 111. Sissi, 25, 134. Sissidaba, 113. Syria, 71, 
72, 73. Ciertis the Lesser, 160, 161. T. Takapa, 160. Tinatas, 109. Tanais, River, 153. Tafo Series, 153. Tarsus, 137. Tauri, 88. Tauru Scythi, 88. Taurizium, 91. Telepta, 165. Tenidos, Island of, 128, 129. Tetrapiergia, or the Four Towers, 91. Tkria, 154. Thanorum, 57. Theodotus, Monastery of, 151. Thelfrach, Monastery of, 151. Thescus, 121. Theopolis, 68, 136, 151. Theodosopolis, 47, 79, 81, 82, 83. Thermopylae, 94, 95, 96, 97. Thessalonica, 99. Thebes, 97. Theodosopolis, 47, 54, 57. Themares, 57. Theodora, 110. Theodora, Baths of, 162. Theodoropolis, City, 113. Theodoropolis, Fort, 111. Theola, 57. Thrace, 89, 112, 114, 117, 119, 120. Tigers, 113. Tigris, River, 74. Tilician, 114. Timona, 111. Topirus, 123. Trajanopolis, 122. Transmariska, 113. Trapezus, 86, 87. Tripolis, 157, 159, 161. Tricatus, 97. Tricissa, Fort, 111. Tuca, 163. Tsanzakan, 86. Sumina, 84. U. Almighton, 114. Alpiana, 92. Anum, 96. Utos, 112. V. Valeriana, 112. Variana, 112. Verns, 109. Viminaceum, 109. Virgin, at Porfarian, House of the, 150. Virgin, at Jericho, Church of the, 147. Virgin, Church of the, 143. Virgin Mary, Church of, 15, 16, 26, 31. W. Watchtower, 44. Z. Zimothers, 57. Zanes, 109. Zebinus, Monastery of, 151. Zenobia, 62, 63, 64. Zetno Cortum, 112. Zgmo, 67. Zucippus, Baths of, 34. The End. Billing and Sons, Printers, Guildford. Footnotes. 1. A new era for Christian architecture commenced with his reign. The historian Procopius has simplified, in the different provinces of his eastern empire, the task to those who would search for vestiges of buildings erected by this prince. Anthemius was selected by him as his architect, 
and the Church of Street. Sophia became the type of all the Greek churches from the 6th century. The Basilica was, until his time, the type of the Christian Church. Anthemius abandoned this form. The chief feature of the church was the dome, the form of the oblong nave being abandoned. Texia and Pullen, Byzantine Architecture, Fall, London, 1864, p. 20. L. 2. There is a pun in the original upon and. Compare Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 3. Taken altogether. There is no building erected during the first 13 centuries after the Christian era which, as an interior, is either so beautiful or so worthy of attentive study as this. Ferguson, Handbook of Architecture, 8 Vo. London, 1855, p. 951. L. In addition to Propius, the erection of Saint Sophia has been described by Agathias and at much greater length by Paulus Silentius, and the three descriptions have been compared and analyzed in the Corpus Historiae Byzantini SV. Paulus Silentius. L. A full description of Saint Sophia with plans, sections, and detailed drawings of the mosaics, sculpture, etc., is given by Sarzenberg in his splendid work Old Chrysalike von Constantinople, Berlin. 1854. L. 4. The solid piles which sustained the cupola were composed of huge blocks of freestone, hewn into squares and triangles, fortified by circles of iron, and firmly cemented by the infusion of lead and quicklime. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 5. Nine western doors open into the vestibule, and from thence into the narthex or exterior portico. That portico was the humble station of the penitents. The nave, or body of the church, was filled by the congregation of the faithful, but the two sexes were prudently distinguished, and the upper and lower galleries were allotted for the more private devotion of the women. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 6. I am unacquainted with the precise meaning of this word. Duke Ange, in his glossary, describes as foranix arcus, quoting Propius. But this gives no definite information, nor, after consulting with several well-known authorities on this subject, can I find that the application of the term is now known. It is not alluded to either in Britain's Dictionary or Willis's Nomenclature of the Middle Ages. From the context and Duke Ange's use of the word, I presume that is applied to the great arch forming the opening of an apse. L. 7, whom? Il, Xzui. 27, S. 8, Street Irene Templum a Constantino M. Extractum, to Sacras Eads. De Peri Silicite, Saint Theodori at Saint Irene's, Idem Magnae Ecclesiae Unitas Fuis, Nec Propriam Clarum Habis, Qui in Iis Sacra Ministeria Perigeret Undi Cum Sophia Neides Appendix Fuorit, Intra Adjustum Septa Edificata Diceta. Denit Concussa Istipsa Eids Eo Terum Motu Qui Accidit Leone Isoro Regnant. Hodi Intra Septum Regi Arm Includi. Duke Ange, Byzantini Historiae Scriptribus Constantinopolis Christiana, Venice, Fol. 1729, Lib. 4, p. 102. Rebuilt, in part at all events, by Justinian late in his reign, but in a style entirely different from that of Street. Sophia or S.S. Sergius and Bacchus, being oblong on plan with aisles and an apse at the east end. This apse was cleared in 1881. Mr. Edwin Freshfield, who visited the church at that time, states that he found that it was filled with marble benches, or steps, somewhat similar to the church of Torcello, near Venice. There is no doubt that they formed part of the original arrangement of the church, and that this was due to its being the patriarchal church. Athenaeum 15th August, 1885. L. 9. 
Eat sacre de peri de ketai. De peri blach inaram. Edim vero de peri blash erni anam apulcaria augusta prima medificatam scribant passim scripteres byzantini. Hang post modem de novo instoravit justina senior, v propius de edifs, libi, c3. Denique solo tenus incensum fuis sub romano diogen, restoratum post modem, novis ornamentis it nova edificiarum accession augsit maya andronica senior. Ducange, Lib. 4, pp. 55, 56. L. 10. Deuterum, locus it tractus urbis ita appellatus occurrit seep apud scriptores byzantinos ki in eoed sacras to. Annas, Sti. George I.E., Street. Pauli it ss. Notariarum extitis narrant dot. Propius scribens hoard procula street. Anni ed in deutero alium edificas justinianum zoe martri, ad ultimam merbis platium. Poro deuterum dictum fuis, quod secundu miliria veteria byzantio dissitum esit. Ducange, lib. 2, p. 133. L. 11, templum quod it appellatum fuit. I.D. nominis sortitumite, a patricia quadum sterili, leone m. Impa. Quim autim esit parvum oratorium ampliari medium ibi excitavit judinianus m. Quam terum motu collapsum instoravit basilius macedo, qui in super ablatum ex strategio fi alamari amilic transposuit. Observat poro moltratus in margin propii. Undi colligiature regnem in qua hic eads extracta fuit senatratu nomini donatum. Ducange, Lib. 4, p. 66. S. 12, Assumptus il in hormistus ss. Serge eit baci monasterio quod palatio adjacet. Ducange, Lib. 4, p. 93. 13. Juxta hormis de palatium, ubi prius quam imperium adeptus esit habitabat justinianus. Hormis de monastrium nuncupatur. Quip ad hormis de palatium, quod imperator factus magno palatio adjuncit, bina excitavit templa, qua relateria coherbant, it vestibulorum porticus, atria it propoli communia habbant. Cump pari in visem decor ac magnitude in ascent, in hoc tamen differebant, quod hujus director esit longitudo, ilius vero columnae in semicirculum dispositi ascent fearons, priori medium ss. Petro it ss. Paolo, alteram ss. Sergio it bacco de cavit. Ducange, lib. 4, p. 93. L. One of the most interesting buildings in Constantinople. It is rightly called the Little Agia Sophia, as it was the first essay of Justinian, before he became emperor, in the style of which the great church was to be the glory. I make no doubt that Anthemius of Trolls was the architect, and the building has in it many of the peculiarities of the church Agia Sophia. It is further interesting as having furnished the model for the church of St. Vital at Ravenna, some of the details in the latter church being also copied from the Kachuk Agia Sophia. This church was dedicated to S.S. Sergius and Bacchus. Mr. Edwin Freshfield, in Athenaeum, August 15, 1885, p. 217. L. 14, equals a read. S. 15, Sanctorum Apostolorum Templum, Omnium Quarin Herb Extiterunt, Post Sophianum Celeberimum It Pulcherimum Extrucit Constantinus Magnus, Ut in Eo Imperatres Christiani Post Abicum Humerinta. V. Eusbius, Lib. 4, De Vita Consti, C. 58, Ducange, Lib. 4, P. 71. Constantine erected it. The walls were covered with marble from pavement to roof, the nave was sealed, and the dome, as well as the roof, 
was covered with plates of brass. Constantine caused his tomb to be erected in the center of the church. It was damaged by an earthquake soon after its erection, but was repaired by Justinian. Texia and Pullen, p. 12. In 1038 AD, the Church of the Apostles suffered terribly in an earthquake, and was pulled down by Mohammed II. Texia and Pullen, Byzantine architecture fall. 1864, p. 161. L. 16, S. A Kasai ki martrium parsist Byzantii sub Diocletiano, edimidificavit in heptascalo Constantinus Magnus. Edis citum undum designant menia, ad 4 junii. Ecclesium s. A Kasai conditam quidum a Constantino Magno, sedilius nomen edi primum imposuis Justinianum. Justinianus autim hanca fundamentis instauravit, disjecta prior ed. Denit cum rursum ruinam minerita de novo instaurata Mr. Basilio Macedon. Ducange, Lib. 4, pp. 80, 81. L. 17, S. Platonis eads ab Anastasio dicaro prima medificator ist, qui in emdisum columnas sculptors ex Thessalonica in Tulit, quarum dure in Charles Noel a capono post e translati sunt. De novo instauratam Justiniano. At cum post modem ilius tectum laborere, novum confessit, murus quibus incumbibat, firmiares redidit basilius macedo. Ducange, lib. 4, p. 92. 18. S. Mosi e martris templum, a Constantino magno edificatum. Codinus eight non de novo edificatam fuis a Constantino sed cum fanum esit diaram, illadex burgas, dejectes simula cris ac idolis. Ducange, lib. 4, p. 89. 19. This church is on the same plan as that of Myra. V. Ferguson, p. 966. L. 20. S.A. Gathonisi Templum Forma Dromica Edificatum a Constantino Magno. Dane D. in Angusturine Formam Excitatum a Justiniano. Patriarch is Sedis, Coronatosc Imperatres Quatu, Tandemkin Magno Palatio, Quia Jacebat, Inclusum Sub Tiberio Maurici Sosero. Ducange, Lib. 4, p. 81. L. 21, equals horn. S. 22, equals fig trees. S. 23, the very ancient church at Ratisbon, known as the Altar Dom or Stephan's Kirch Lane is believed to have been originally built without windows. S. 24, Street Irene Martris Templum, Ultra Edim S. Anthemi, Ad Ipsum Sinus Ostia Medificavit Justinianus. Verum S. Irene Zedis Sicina, Su Sisis Proxime, Non Fuit Condita Justinianus Sed Instaurata. Ducange, Lib. 4, p. 103. L. 25, near the village of Cora, Cheshmer. Murray's Guide to Turkey and Asia Minor, etc., 1878, p. 106, L. 26, S. Michaelis Templum in Anaplo Edificavit Constantinus Magnus. Cum Vero Anaplus Propredicatia Litus Bospori Europinum, ut alibi indicatum, locum distinctius designat Cedrinus. Edim S. Michaelis Sosthenianam de novo ita fundamentis instauravit Justinianus Magnus ut it alteram quam in opposito litera asiatico ab eodem Constantino Magno edificatam narrat Nicephorus. Ducange, Lib. 4, pp. 130, 131. L. 27. Joannis Baptista in Hebdomo Templum Excitavit Theodosius Magnus it in Eonupa in Venchum, it in Urbum Alatum Caput Sancti Precursoris Repus Ut Rotundu Tecto Theodosius Magnus Candidit.
a Justinian o excitatam, su potius instoratam prodat propius. Denique han crusum instoravit basilius macedo. Ea in later ear ad solis autum pertinent sita ist, a tersis maxima ex parti diruta, ubi a liquo columnae marmari extremum rapinum mituant super sunt, sed porsi ex multis ablatis. Quam, autim illa sumptuosa fuisit cum alia vestigia indicant, tum sistina boni paulo supra em sita, longa three hundred passus. Column is it con cameration spoliata, in qua nunc horti virant. Ducange, lib. 4, pp. 68, 69. Sistan amboni. Cameris cylindrisis tectum, extrucit bonus patricius it magister qui heraclius imp, contra persas prefecturus, urbis custodium commisit. Ducange, lib. I. P. 80. L. 28. Some ruins of this still remain near Fort Usha, on the Asiatic shore of the Bosphorus. Murray's. Guide P. 118. L. 29. SS. Many it many a matra medium excitavit in Hebdomo Justinianus. Ducange, Lib. 4. P. 88. S. 30. The finest marbles were taken from the baths of Zeuxippus, and used by Mahomet II for building his mosque, etc. V. Texia and Pullen, p. 161. L. 31. The dome of a spacious quadrangle was supported on massy pillars, the pavement and walls encrusted with many colored marbles, the emerald green of Laconia, the fiery red and the white Phrygian stone, intersected with veins of a sea-green hue, the mosaic paintings of the dome and sides represented the glories of the African and Italian triumphs. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 32, on the Asiatic shore of the Propontis, at a small distance to the east of Chalcedon, the costly palace and gardens of Hiram were prepared for the summer residence of Justinian, and more especially of Theodora. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 33, now Diarbekir, on the Tigris, about 12 miles from Nisbin. 34, military architecture had a special character during the reign of Justinian, and his successors departed but little from the principles laid down by the engineers of his time. The walls were flanked with towers, usually round. The most commanding part was occupied by a square redoubt defended at the angles by towers. The gates were protected by an advanced work. The fortifications of many towns in Mesopotamia, for example Edessa, date from the time of Justinian, and are constructed on the same principle. Abridged from Texia and Pullen, pp. 23-24. L. 35. The fortifications of Dara were almost entirely rebuilt by the Emperor Anastasius, AD 503. Hastily constructed, they fell into ruins in a few years. Justinian rebuilt the town, AD 537. The line of its ramparts, which were built of large blocks of limestone, can be traced throughout, certain portions being still 30 feet high. Abridged from Texia and Pullen, p. 53. L. 36. The fortifications of Dara says Gibbon, may represent the military architecture of the age. The city was surrounded by two walls, and the interval between them, of 50 paces, afforded a retreat to the cattle of the besieged. The inner wall was a monument of strength and beauty, it measured 60 feet from the ground, and the height of the towers was 100 feet, the loopholes, from whence an enemy might be annoyed with missile weapons, were small, but numerous, the soldiers were placed along the rampart, under the shelter of double galleries, and a third platform, spacious and secure, was raised on the summit of the towers. The exterior wall seems to have been less lofty, but more solid, 
and each tower was protected by a quadrangular bulwark. A hard rocky soil resisted the tools of the miners, and on the southeast, where the ground was more tractable, their approach was retarded by a new work, which advanced in the shape of a half moon. The double and treble ditches were filled with a stream of water, and in the management of the river, the most skillful labor was employed to supply the inhabitants, to distress the besiegers, and to prevent the mischiefs of a natural or artificial inundation. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. C. Note, page 58. 37. The Church of Dara is in a perfect state of preservation owing to the extreme solidity of its construction, a parallelogram 97 times 6 by 68 times 3. In the interior, the nave, with the adjoining chapels, forms a perfect square. A building adjoining, supposed to have been the baptistry, is ruined. Mr. Ainsworth says there are seven or eight churches in the town. Texia and Pullen, p. 52. 38, Rabdium, near Jzia Ibnoma. A fine old castle. This appears to be the Rabdium of the Byzantines. The remains of an ancient bridge are seen crossing the Tigris at a short distance. Chesneys. Euphrates. L. 39, Mejarfarkin, northeast of Diarbekir. W. 40, founded by Theodosius II. V. de Bello Persico I. 10. Gibbon. S. Now probably Raz Elaine on the Kaaba. W. 41, River Aborus. The Shabaras at the juncture of the Kaaba and the Euphrates, the Shabaras of Ptolemy and Pliny, and probably the Araxes of Xenophon, now the Kaaba. W. 42, Circisium, the last Roman station on the Euphrates. Gibbon, Chapter. XL, S. Now Kirkisia at the juncture of the Kaaba and the Euphrates. W. 43, La fortification Byzantine se composite de plus yours parties qui correspondent du valum, adja, it manium des fortifications romains. C'est le, le muru la cortin, sur la face de la quella s eleventh les tours, en avant de cemurs elive le mur du parapet, premier defense de la cortin. Cemur is de space, du, de la cortin dun quart environ de la hauteur totale. El espace compris entices deux murs ist le parabole, le chemin couvert. Cemo ist appliqué au si au chemin intérieur de l'Aja qui long le fosse. L'Aja, qui est si compose des tires du fosse, ist sout nu par un mur, quel quifoi flanc de tours, qui ist le, mur de l'Avant rempart. Les tours, sont appliqués à l'Anit et l'autre murales. La cortin ist simonti d'un parapet. C'est la partie du remparts qui porte le nom de Murail supera, sur cette murail sunt places les crenaux. Qui sunt quel quifoi reunis par un mur dans la partie supera, it formant des espaces de barbicanes, pour lance les trays. Le crenau etate quel quifoi simonte d'un pyramidian, d'autres fois il etate fendu par un encoche pour appuyer le tray. On any straight doubt a cue la ville de edus en uit muni de un double rem part, cases deux parties, it, sunt special eminent mentionis par procope dons la relation du siege de edus. Se la murale exterior, qui satient el aja, it par consequent form le chemin couvert. Dot. Texia, monography sur el edus. S, it is now urfa. W. 44. The text, Procpius, is so conformable to the topography of the town, that it would appear to have been written on the spot. We do not find, near the banks of the river, any vestige of the hippodrome mentioned by Procpius in De Bello Persico Book I, Chapter 12. L. 
a stranger is struck by the imposing aspect of the ancient castle, the same which was constructed by Justinian. Its form is that of a parallelogram, 400 by 200 yards, defended by several square and two large semi-octagonal towers. The capitals of the two Corinthian columns are surmounted by blocks of stone which show that they were intended to have some further decoration, probably the statues of Justinian and Theodora. Dot. The diameter of each column is nearly two yards. Texia and Pullen, pp. 181-184 In Smith's Dict of Geob, it is stated that as late as 1184, there were 15 large churches, which fell into the hands of the Saracens. It was deserted in 1285. 45. Kahe, now Haran, a few miles south of Edessa. 46. Corleicum, on the Euphrates, and marked on the map as Ornisephorium at the junction with the river Bilachar, Bilek. L. 47. On void QL historian Greek done in detinctement a set place les noms de or singular, it or plural. La table de puting a dun le nom batna. C.E. qui m a cert out frappe dun set le calite, c.e. sunt les vasts carriers qui ont du fournir a un exploitation considerable. Un grande parti des materiaux qui ont servi auxiliary constructions d'edus en a song doubt it tiri. Edus its is monuments par chapter texia, member de l'Institute, Paris, 1859. S. 48. The ruins present the form of an acute triangle, having its base resting on the river, whilst its sides climb the acclivity of a conical hill and terminate at its summit in a small acropolis. It was defended by walls flanked by strong towers, which, as well as the public and private buildings, were all constructed of fine gypsum, which abounds along the Euphrates, and are as sharp and fresh as if they had recently been built. Narrative of the Euphrates Expedition P247, by F. R. Chesney, London, 1868. 8 Vo, L. 49, Suri, now Surya, a few miles west of Corleicum. W. 50, is this the same as Tetrapiurgia, where Saint Sergius was buried? W. 51, Barbalissus, now Kala, at Bali's, on the Euphrates. C. Ant. Mart, it in Comic Slay. W. 52, on the Euphrates, now probably Jerablus, supposed by some to be the site of Carchemish. W. 53, Hierapolis, Bambyk, formerly the capital of Euphratesia, on west of Euphrates, between Antioch and Edessa. Has no records of its ancient greatness but its walls, which may be traced all round, cannot be less than three miles in compass with towers of large square stone, extremely well built. A deep pit of about 100 yards diameter seemed to have had great buildings all round it, with the pillars and ruins of which it is now in part filled up, but not so much but that there was still water in it. Here are a multitude of subterraneous aqueducts brought to this city. You can ride nowhere about the city without seeing them. Maundrill's Journey from Aleppo to Euphrates Bonds Edition, 8 Vo. P. 507, 1848. L. Hierapolis, Bambij, or Membij. The whole place is now a mass of ruin, but the outlines of a theatre and stadium can be traced. The lake is now represented by a deep circular pool, said to be always full of water. There are several springs in the ruins, and water was also supplied by car eyes or underground channels. Formerly a center of great commercial importance, our word Bombazin comes from Bambia. WMS Notes, 1881 54, Zgmo, on the right bank of the Euphrates, opposite Bijik. W. 55, Antiochia 
now Antakia, founded by Seleucus Nicata. Having been nearly ruined by an earthquake it was almost rebuilt by Justinian, and called by him Theodopolis. In AD 1163, it is described by Benjamin of Tudela as a large city very strongly fortified, overlooked by a very high mountain, a wall surrounds this height, on the summit of which is situated a well. The inspector of the well distributes the water by subterranean aqueducts, and thus provides the houses of the principal inhabitants of the city. The other side of the city is surrounded by the river. A plan of the city is given under Antiochian Smith's Dict of Antiquities. The city, the modern Antakia, covers but a small part of the ground occupied by the ancient city, though it still contains 14 mosques. The population in 1836 was under 6,000. The walls of the ancient city are comparatively perfect. From the Acropolis the wall has been carried down the almost vertical face of the cliff, and after crossing the valley, is made to ascend the opposite steep hill in a zigzag and extraordinary manner. At the steepest part of the hills these walls necessarily become a succession of gigantic steps between the towers, which, at some places, are close to one another. Narrative of the Euphrates Expedition p. 189 by J. R. Chesney, London, 1868. L. 56, Cyrus, Dons la Syrie. Procope rapport Q. Cell ville fut fondi par les Jufs. C'est la ville Cyrus de Ptolemy dont il fait la capitale de la Cyristique. L. A. A. Two journeys de Antioche. O. U. La nomine aussi Cyrus. Encyclopédie Méthodique Géographie Ancient and Paris, 1787. L. It is now Caress, northwest of Aleppo. W. 57. Chalcis, between Beirut and Damascus, where there are ruins of the old city, surrounded by a prostrate wall. Two or three miserable hovels are now the only representatives of the royal city. Porters, Murray's, Syria and Palestine 1875, p. 515. L. Is not the northern Chalcis, now Kinesrin, southwest of Aleppo, intended. It is mentioned in it in comma ant, also in ant. Mart, it in. W. 58, Martiopolis, near the river Nymphus. Tradition says that it was founded towards the end of the 5th century by Bishop Maruta, who there collected the relics of all the martyrs which could be found in Armenia, Persia and Syria. It was the capital of Roman Armenia, now my Afarkine. Smith's Dict. Of Geography. L. 59, Scytherizon, now probably Palu on the Murid Chai. W. 60. Qy Autor Horizon. 61. Sebastia, Sivers, regarded by Pliny as not belonging to Pontus, but to Cappadocia. Its ancient name is unknown. Pompey increased it, and called it Megalopolis. Its walls were restored by Justinian, Procpius. There are ruins of two castles of different epochs. One appears to have belonged to the kings of Pontus strengthened by Romans and rebuilt by Mohammedans. Ainsworth's Journey in Chesney, p. 529, l. 62, Nicopolis now Shaphin Kara Hissa. W. 63, Malaitan now Malaysia. W. 64, Trapezus now Trebizond. W. 65, Amasia. Amasia. Hamilton found two Hellenic towers of beautiful construction on the heights. But the greater part of the walls now standing are Byzantine or Turkish. See researches in Assyria volume. 2. P. 16. Hamilton explored a passage cut in the rock, about 300 feet, to a small pool of clear cold water. Chesney, P. 
535. The tombs described by Strabo remain. They are supposed to have been built by Mithridates. 66. Rizium now rise to the east of Trebizond. W. 67. This country was known to the Greeks and Romans as Colchis. 68. A town of the Lazy or Colchis, founded by a general of Justinian to keep the Lazy in subjection. Taken by Kisros, 541, retaken, 551, by Romans and destroyed. C. Procpius, Beeple. And Bell. Got, and Gibbon. Its ruins are now called Ugena. L. The sole vestige of Petra subsists in the writings of Procpius and Agathias. Gibbon, Chapter 13. S. 69, C. of Azif. W. 70, formerly Dioscuris, on eastern shore of Black Sea. W. 71, now Anchi Allo in eastern Rumlia. W. 72, under the name of Justiniana Prima, the obscure village of Taurus Iam became the seat of an archbishop and a prefect, whose jurisdiction extended over seven warlike provinces of Illyricum, and the corrupt appellation of Gia Stendil still indicates, about 20 miles south of Sofia, the residence of a Turkish Sanjuk. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 73, from the edge of the seashore, through the forests and valleys, and as far as the summit of the Thessalian mountains, a strong wall was continued, which occupied every practical entrance. Instead of a hasty crowd of peasants, a garrison of 2,000 soldiers was stationed along the rampart, granaries of corn and reservoirs of water were provided for their use, and by a precaution that inspired the cowardice which it foresaw, Convenient fortresses were erected for their retreat. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 74, 600 of these forts were built or repaired by the emperor, but it seems reasonable to believe, that the far greater part of them consisted only of a brick or stone tower, in the midst of a square or circular area, which was surrounded by a wall and ditch and afforded in a moment of danger some protection to the peasants and cattle of its neighbouring villages. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 75, Singadornum, now Belgrade. W. 76, Strabo speaks of the Iron Gate as the place where the Danube ends and the Ister begins. Trajan's Bridge, of 20 or 22 stone piers with wooden arches was built, A.D. 103, just below the rapids of the Iron Gate which grind to powder the ice blocks of winter, and save the piers from the shock which might otherwise destroy them. Murray's Handbook of Southern Germany. S. 77, Procpius here confounds the Moesians of Europe with the Messiaens of Asia Minor. The passage alluded to is in Homer's Iliad 2. 604, S. 78, Moesia. 79, the long wall as it was emphatically styled, was a work as disgraceful in the object, as it was respectable in the execution. At the distance of only 40 miles from the capital, Anastasius was constrained to establish a last frontier, his long wall of 60 miles, from the Propontis to the Euchine, proclaimed the impotence of his arms, and as the danger became more imminent, New fortifications were added by the indefatigable prudence of Justinian. Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 80, Slibria, now Silibri, on Sea of Marmara. W. 81, Heraclea, now Iregli, on Sea of Marmara. W. 82, Rodestus, now Rodisto, on Sea of Marmara. W. 83, Elus, near the southeast extremity of the Gallipoli promontory, opposite the plain of Troy. W. 84, Callipolis, now Gallipoli. The wall was about on the line of the Gallipoli line so well known during the Crimean War. W. 
85. In an age of freedom and valor, the slightest rampart may prevent a surprise, and Procopius appears insensible of the superiority of ancient times, while he praises the solid construction and double parapet of a wall, whose long arms stretched on either side into the sea, but whose strength was deemed insufficient to guard the Chersonsus, if each city, and particularly Gallipoli and Sistus, had not been secured by their Peculiar Fortifications Gibbon, Chapter XL S. 86, Innes, now Innes, at the mouth of the Maritza. W. 87, Considerable remains of a church were found on the hill at Iasaluk. This was perhaps Street John's Church, and was in existence when the council was held in 431. The Greeks have built for themselves a small church over the site of an ancient Greek church, which was possibly the Church of St. John, as that was known to have been built on a hill. Ephesus by J.T. Wood, and Society of Biblical Archaeology, London, 1878, p. 332 and Discoveries p. 164. Street John's, at Ephesus, has been destroyed to its foundation. It was in the form of a cross, with a dome at the intersection. Texia and Pullen, P22. L. 88, Leek, Tour in Asia Minor P10. 89, Sea Leaks Tour in Asia Minor P10. 90, Sea Leaks Tour in Asia Minor PP. 8, 10. S. At the south end of the lake, Arcania, beautifully situated stood the ruined towers of the famous Nicaea. Seldom have I had a harder day's work than in attempting to see and comprehend this ruin of ruins. The grandeur and peculiar beauty of the arts amongst the earlier Greeks cannot be concealed even in the broken materials. Some parts of the walls are entirely Roman, in others the cross, etc., give the date of the earlier Christians. On three of the towers in the walls of the city are three similar inscriptions. The sign of the cross is prefixed to all three, the Tower of Michael, the Great King, Emperor in Christ. Travels in Asia Minor by Sir C. Fellows, London, 1852, pp. 83, 85. A very small church still stands within the present town, which, from its mosaic floor and ceiling, may probably be of the date of street marks at Venice, or rather of the Byzantine age. Without the walls is a Roman aqueduct, which still supplies the town with water from the neighboring mountain. Ibad, p. 87. L. 91, Nicomedia, now Ismid. W. 92, Sangaris, now Sacaria River. The bridge is now some distance from the river, which has changed its course. W. 93, Leaks Tour in Asia Minor pp. 79, 80. S. 94, Leaks, Tour in Asia Minor pp. 180, 217. S. 95, Leak, p. 215. S. 96, Ibad, p. 214. 97, the Virgin of Jerusalem might exult in the temple erected by her imperial votary on a most ungrateful spot, which afforded neither ground nor materials to the architect etc., etc., Gibbon, Chapter XL. S. 98, see Appendix 2. 99, the church is octagonal. On the east side is an apse, on the north the main entrance. On five sides there are small chapels, and on the eighth probably a sixth. There is an inner octagon, which gives the place some resemblance to that of the Dome of the Rock. The only capital uncovered was of a debased Corinthian order. The church is believed to have been built by Justinian circa 533. Plans by Sir C. W. Wilson are given in the quarterly statement of the Palestine Exploration Fund, 1873, p. 68.
the church is 70 times 0 inside east and west, inscribed circle of internal octagon. East apse, 15 times 0 diameter, side chapels, 27 times 0 long inside, with apses 9 times 0 diameter. Said by Procpius to have been erected by the Emperor Zeno, not earlier than 474, to the Blessed Virgin. He says also that Justinian, after 529, built the external wall, 9 times 0 thick, of the court, forming a fortress 180. By 230, with chambers built against the wall inside. 1 is 11 times 9 by 14 times 4 internally, Vidi Plan. Dot, Palestine Exploration Memoirs Volume 2, p 189, 190. L. 100. The Veil of Palms by the Shore of the Red Sea Gibbon, Chapter Xelye. Dot, Stanley, Sinai and Palestine. ED 12, pp. 20, 85. 519. S. 101. Full plans, details, and descriptions of the fort and church built by Justinian at the foot of Jay Musa are given in the Ordnance Survey of Sinai. W. 102. Tell S. Sultan and Tel Abu L. A. Lake, Roman. Many traces of ruins. The buildings do not appear to have been large or of fine masonry. A pillar shaft 9 inches in diameter, of marble, and fragments of cornices were found, also a capital of the rude Ionic style common in Byzantine buildings, cut in limestone and much weathered. East and southeast there are extensive ruins on the way to Ereha, mounds, small foundations, and portions of an aqueduct. They do not appear to be of any great antiquity. Jericho was inhabited in the 4th and 5th centuries, to which date the buildings near the Tel are most probably to be ascribed. See Memoirs, Survey of Western Palestine, Volume 3, pp. 173, 223. L. 103, Well of St. Elizus. May this be Elisha's spring at Ain S. Sultan. W. 104. The church is interesting as being the only basilica of Constantine left standing in Palestine. The atrium is destroyed, but the basilica, consisting of a nave and four aisles, is almost intact, the original. Columns and the clear story walls, with fragments of glass mosaic, of 12th century, remaining. The basilica measures 87 feet east and west by 75 feet north and south. At the east end is a transept with north and south apses and an east apse of equal size. The floor of the transept is raised for a width equal to that of the basilica nave, 35 feet. The basilica is separated by a wall, erected by the Greeks in 1842, from the transept. Dot. Palestine Exploration Memoirs Volume 3, pp. 83-85 Notwithstanding the slight notice of this city taken by Procpius, the part taken by Justinian in its adornment is otherwise spoken of in a very striking manner, and its celebrated basilica, usually stated, as above, to have been the work of Constantine, has been assigned in part to Justinian. The eastern part is almost certainly later than Constantine. The choir, with its three apses, does not seem to be part of the original arrangement, but to have been added by Justinian when he renovated, Eutychius says rebuilt, the church. Ferguson's History. 1867, Volume 2, p. 290. Eutychius' account is thus. Jusit Eshem Imperator Legatum Ecclesium Bethlemiticam Qua Parva Fuit Diruor, Aliumc, Amplam, Magnamit Pulcram Fabricae, Adeo Ut Non Esit Hiero Solemis Templum Ipsa Pulcrius. Pavenians Ergo Legatus Hiero Solima, Nozocumium Peregrinis Condidit, It Ecclesium Eleni Perfessit, 
Templark Quar Incendrant Samaritani in Storavit, NEC Non Monasteria Quam Plorima Extrucit, Dirutac Ecclesia Bethlematica Odomio Quo Jam Se Habit Modo Edificavit. Cunc his omnibus absolutis ad imperatorim reversus esit, ill, describe me I, inquit, quomadu ecclesium bethlematicam extruxisti. Quam cum ipsi descripsis it, hoard probavit imperator descriptionem est am nec a latinus ipsi placet, quer vald ipsi iritus. Acceptos, inquit, num mos tibi ipsi congesisti. Edificium autim extruxisti male compactum it ecclesium tenebrosum confessisti nullatenus ex ment me fabricatam, nec consilium meum secutus es. Capitic ipsum pulcti jussit. Eutychius adds after Omar's conquest. Dane de Bethlehem adim visendam prefectus cum adesit orationis tempus intra ecclesium or avit ad arcum australum. Here art autim Marcus totus operia tessellate variegatus. Scripsit comar patriarchi syngraphum, nec mutata in eo quiaquam. Eutychius, Pocox Translation, Oxford, 1658, Volume 2, pp 159, 288. 105, The Splendid Cistern of St. John on Jordan mentioned by Procpius as the work of Justinian, is still visible in an almost perfect condition. It is 30 feet deep, supported on rows of piers. Memoirs Volume 3, p. 177. 106. Tiberia, Tiberius. There are the remains of a sea wall, and of some portions of a city wall 12 times 0. Thick. Many traces of old buildings, at one place foundations which appear to belong to a church. Epiphanius, in the 4th century, says that it had long been inhabited, exclusively by Jews. The Sanhedrim came to Tiberius in the middle of the 2nd century. Thence it became the central point of Jewish learning for several centuries. L. Justinian rebuilt the walls. These were thrown down by an earthquake in 1837. Palestine Exploration Memoirs Volume I, p. 419. The ruins of the ancient town of Tiberias. A great number of fine granite columns are lying about, also remains of the sea wall, with towers. Behind the ruins the cliffs rise steeply, with traces of fortifications upon them. Palestine Exploration Quarterly Statement, 1877, p. 121. 107. Le condit de nebi une et de puis longtem identify avec porphyrion. Les dunes paracent cache des constructions antiques. Quand je passe à nebi une en venite d'oeuvre under ces dunes, pour e entire des pièces de construction. On voyage to ventries de Jolie's chambers, paints presentant des animaux, des ponds of France, sous de petits arso paints des ornes rappellent la disposition des canons question on true v en tête des beaux evangeliaries byzantins. Il est evident question il y uvas set en droit un vil assez important don't la flores or parate of y you lu sert out a elipic critien. Mission de Phoenicia de Rigi par M. Ernest Renan, Paris, Imprimerie Imperiale, 1854, p. 510. Kafer, a small town at the foot of Mount Carmel. Some have held Kafer to be Sicamanos, and others Porphyrian. There seems to be some grounds for its identity with Sicamanos, but none for its being Porphyrian, nor Gath Hefer. Josh 1913, as Benjamin of Tudela has tried to prove. Journey in Syria and Palestine in 1851-2 by C. W. M. van der Velde, 8 Vo. 1854, Volume I, p. 289. All that is left of the ancient town of Porphyrion is a single granite column, with a sarcophagus.
a Phoenician site has been replaced by a few tamarisks beside a Muslim well. Palestine Exploration Quarterly Statement, 1874, p. 199. The Crusaders called Haifa, at the foot of Carmel, Porphyrion. The real town of this name, which was derived from the purple of the murex their court, was eight Roman miles from Sidon towards the north, and just south of the river Tamaras, Naradama. Dot. Palestine Exploration Quarterly Statement, 1876, p. 188. 108, Acre, Ptolemy. There are many fragments of crusading masonry in the town. A small chapel near the sea, of this nature, has been identified with the Church of St. Andrew. There are also remains of the Hospital of the Knights of St. John and Church of St. John. Apian, given p. 163 of the memoirs, dated 1291 contains notes of many churches and monasteries, but nothing referring to street. Sergius. House. Palestine Exploration Memoirs Volume I, pp. 160-167. 109, a large city of Syria, on the Orontes, called Pella by Seleucus Nicator, who fortified and enlarged it. In the crusading times it bore the name of Tamia, now Clat el Medic. There are large remains of ancient ruins. Smith's Dictionary of Geography. L. 110. This is the celebrated Daphne, now be it Elma, near Antioch, Theopolia. W. 111. D. R. Robinson identifies the site of Tel Nebi Mendeh with the Laodicea of Lebanon, also called Laodicea Cabiosa, mentioned by Ptolemy and Polybius, one of six towns founded circa 300. B.C. by Seleucus Nicator, in honor of his mother Laodice. It was 18 MP from Emesa, Homs, on the road to Heliopolis, Baalbek. W. It is a great mound. The principal ruins are on the flat ground east of the mill, the foundations of a building called El Camue, about 50 by 50 feet, with remains of a doorway in the southeast corner. Some broken pillar shafts lie near, and the walls appear to have been ornamented with pilasters in low relief. The details appear to belong to a late period of classic art. These probably are the remains of the Laodicea of later times. This city was the see of a bishop. Palestine Exploration Quarterly Statement, 1881, pp. 162-167. 112, L. 112, Ezoria. A district in Asia Minor to the south of Iconium. W. 113, now probably Carian, about 15 miles from Alexandria. L. 114, Discoveries at Siren by Captain. R. M. Smith, R. E., and Commander E. A Porcher, R. N. Foll, London, 1864. At page 6 a map of the coast is given, and also a plan, to a small scale, of Ptolemyta. Apollonia, Tachira and Benghazi, Berenis. The five cities, Pentapolis, of Cyrena Icar were Apollonia, Barca, Berenice or Hesperis, Cyrin and Tachira. 115, a town in the Libyan Nome, west of the Delta and about 25 miles from Alexandria. There were probably several places of this name in Egypt, but this appears to have been the most considerable, in Asmuk as it was the place where the prefect of Alexandria held the periodical census of the Libyan Nome. Smith's Dictionary of Geography 1857. L. 116. Takra, the ancient Tkria afterwards called Arsino, which, although totally deserted, is still completely enclosed, except on the sea or north side, by walls of uncommon solidity and thickness, 
strengthened at intervals by quadrangular towers, 26 in number, and is entered by two strong built gateways. The walls were repaired by Justinian, in doing which blocks of stone and marble have been introduced, many bearing Greek inscriptions, which evidently formed part of much older buildings. N. C. Y. C. L. S. V. Siren. S. A plan of the remains of Tokra or Tchaira is given in Captain B. Shea's North Coast of Africa p. 388. 4 to 1828. He states, p. 353, that the walls repaired under the Emperor Justinian still remain in a state of perfection which sufficiently proves the solidity of the work. A long account of the city and its walls is given at p. 375 etc. Also in Smith and Porcher's Discoveries at Siren, 1864, p. 64, where Justinian's walls are particularly mentioned. 117, scarcely a vestige of the wall remains. N. C. Y. C. L. S. V. Benghazi. 118, Berenice, about 40 miles to southwest of Barca. Here the ancients placed the gardens of the Hesperides, now Benghazi. Bishay, P314. Benghazi may be considered as occupying the site of the Berenice of the Ptolemies and of the Hesperis of earlier times, but very few remains now appear above ground to interest the sculptor, the architect or the antiquary. J. Pennell's Herodotus, 42, London, 1800. P. 154. Of the ancient city very few remains are now visible. At the back of the castle, some foundations may be seen cropping out, but the tomb of a saint prevents any excavations being made. Smith and Porches. Discoveries at Siren, 1864, p. 13. Benghazi, the ancient Berenice, built by Ptolemy Philadelphus. Nothing now remains but its port, which is certainly the best on the coast of Tripoli. On the north there are still to be seen, beyond Sea Mark, the foundations of several large buildings, of stones eight or ten feet long and three broad, which, by their own weight and being bound by strong cement, have preserved their places. Lelut Col Playfair, travels in the footsteps of Bruce, 4 to, London, 1877. 119, Ptolemy, Ptolemyta, now Dolmita. V. B. Shea, P. 376. He gives, at P. 338, etc., a plan of the city and environs, and also drawings of some of the ruins. The city was something less than a mile in length from north to south, and its breadth from east to west something more than three quarters. Captain B. Shea describes the remains of the walls to the city and harbour, of two theatres, an amphitheatre, and various buildings of more than ordinary consequence. Some of the shafts of small columns are spiral and formed of coloured marbles, and may probably be attributed to the time of Justinian, when the city revived under his politic munificence. Lelut Col Playfair, Footsteps of Bruce, 1877 pp 288, 289, gives a good account also. Smith and Porcher, pp. 64, 66, give drawings of ruins. At a point nearly opposite the centre of the east wall, the ravine is spanned by the arch of a bridge still standing, which appears to have been built for an aqueduct which we could trace distinctly for some distance from the city. Within the walls the aqueduct led in the direction of enormous reservoirs near the centre of the city. Messrs. Smith and Porcher describe them as consisting of six chambers, each chamber two feet long and twenty broad, arched over. The repairs to the aqueduct and cisterns are ascribed by Procopius to Justinian. L. 120, several of the buildings are partly standing such as a lofty gateway, an amphitheatre, two theatres, a palace or large building, 
the inner court of which still retains its tessellated pavement. N. C. Y. C. L. S. V. Siren. S. 121, the exact position of this S. Borium it is difficult to determine. Smith's Dictionary of Geography. 122, Orgula, now Orgula. Its historical importance is considerable, and it is one of those few places whose name has not undergone change since Herodotus wrote. Reynolds Herodotus pp. 568 to 613, 4 to 1800. L. 123, Leptis Magna. The city appears to have been comprehended within little more than a square half mile of ground. The actual remains are still sufficient to be somewhat imposing, but they are for the most part so deeply buried under the sand which ten centuries of neglect have allowed to accumulate over them, that plans of them could not be obtained without very extensive excavations. The style of the buildings is universally Roman. The walls and fortifications, probably restored by Justinian, were finally demolished by the Saracens. From that time the city appears to have been wholly abandoned and its remains employed in the construction of modern Tripoli. North coast of Africa by Bichet, 4-2, London, 1828, pp. 52-54. Leut Col Playfair, p. 283, describes the remains thus, Libida, the ancient town of Leptis Magna, three days' journey from Tripoli where there are a great extent of ruins, but all in bad taste, chiefly done in the lime of Aurelion, indeed very bad. It is said that in the time of Louis XIV, seven monstrous columns of granite or marble were carried from this place into France. Bruce also states that he saw several statues of good taste which had been deprived of their heads. L. 124, Takap. Gabs. This was the Epichus of Silex and the Takap of other ancient geographers, where we have a heap of ruins with some beautiful granite pillars still standing. These are all square and about 12 feet long and such as I have not met with in any other part of Africa. Shaw's Travels in Barbary p. 113, L. 125, Carthage. Shaw, p. 81, etc., of his travels in Barbary describes the remains of Carthage existing in his time, circa 1750, in particular the Great Cistern of which he gives a plan at P75, which had very little suffered and the famous aqueduct, a great part whereof is still standing, we see, a long range of its arches, all of them intact, 70 feet high, supported by columns 16 feet square, the channel being high and broad enough for an ordinary person to walk in. Bruce says, we passed ancient Carthage, of which little remains but the cisterns, the aqueduct, and a magnificent flight of steps leading up to the temple of Esculapius. He gives, p. 130, a drawing of the aqueduct, which Colonel Playfair describes as one of the greatest works the Romans ever executed in North Africa. It was destroyed by the Vandals, restored by Belisarius, the general of Justinian. On the expulsion of the Byzantines it was once more cut off restored by the Arabs, again destroyed by the Spaniards, and finally restored by the present Bay, Sidi Sadak, at a cost of 13 million francs. Leut Col. Playfair in. Footsteps of Bruce P. 128. 126. Baga. The city of Baja or Baja, which by the name and situation should be the Vaca of Salast, the Oppidum Vigents of Pliny, the of Plutarch, and the Vaxensium Ordo Splendissimus, as the title runs in an imperfect inscription. Bajor keeps up the character that Salast gives his vaca of being a town of great trade. The walls are raised out of the ancient materials. 
Shaw's Travels in Barbary P92. The ancient city was surrounded by a wall, flanked by square towers, no doubt this was originally constructed by the Byzantines, but were allowed by the Arabs to fall into decay. The only part in a relative state of preservation is the Kasbah, a great part of which seems to me the original construction of Belisarius or Solomon. It contains a large and lofty hall, about 15 paces long and 10 wide, with a vaulted roof. Supported on two square pillars. Leut Col. Playfair, P234. L. 127, Adrametus. Hercla, the Heraclea of the Lower Empire, the Justiniana of the Middle and the Adrametum of the earlier ages it appears to have been little more than a mile in circuit. That part of the promontory which formed the port seems to have been walled in quite down to the seashore, but the rest of it, to a distance of a furlong from thence, does not discover the least traces of ruins. Shaw's Travels in Barbary pp. 105-106 L. 128, C. A. Paudia, the Caput Veda of Procpius, the Amonis Promontrum of Strabo, and the Promontrum Brachodes of Ptolemy, a low narrow strip of land which stretches itself a great way into the sea. Upon the very point of it we have the ruins of the city that was built there by Justinian, where there is likewise a high round watchtower. Shaw's Travels in Barbary p. 111. L. 129, of the Vandals chosen by Belisarius, the far greater part, in the honours of the Eastern service, forgot their country and religion. But a generous band of 400 obliged the mariners, when they were within sight of the Isle of Lisbos, to alter their course, they touched at Peloponnesus, ran ashore on a desert coast of Africa, and boldly erected on Mount Aurasius the standard of independence and revolt. Gibbon, Chapter XLIII. S. Aurasius. The Aurese Mountains. The inhabitants still retain some marked peculiarities which distinguish them from the surrounding people. W. 130, Subtum or Suta. Asterisk 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 end of the Project Gutenberg ebook of the buildings. Of Justinian asterisk asterisk asterisk. Updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the foundation and you can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing. Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works to protect the Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol. Concept and Trademark Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose, such as creation of derivative works, reports performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given. A way you may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, full license. The full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work. To protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of 
Electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work. Associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to. Comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with. This file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1. By reading or using any part of this project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Work You indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of This license and intellectual property, trademark forward slash copyright, agreement if you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. Electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will. Support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by Keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. License when you share it without charge with others. 1.d. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg. 1.e.1 
The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to. The full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org if you are not located in the United States. You will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3. If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. License for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. Terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website www.gutenberg.org you must at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, 
Copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with Paragraph 1.E.8 or 1.E.9 1.E.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or Distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already used to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the project. Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this. Paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Royalty Payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty Payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information About donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.E.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement. You must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact The foundation is set forth in section 3 below. 1.f 1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited warranty, disclaimer of damages, except for the Right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the project. Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. Trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic. Work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided. In paragraph 1.f.3, 
You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages. Even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur, a distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, b alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, and c any defect you cause. Section 2 Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see sections 3 and 4.
and the foundation information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3. Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501c3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The Foundations I or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541 Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake. City, UT 84116, 801, 596, 1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact. Information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact. Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg. Literary Archive Foundation. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment many small donations $1 to $5000 are particularly important to maintaining tax exempt status with the IRS the Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance Requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit Donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of Compliance To send donations or determine the status of compliance for Any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not Met the solicitation requirements we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5 General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. Electronic works. Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept. Of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a Loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in 
Compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility. www.gutenberg.org This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. Document outline. Transcriber's notes. Buildings of Justinian. Contents. Preface. List of plates. The six books of Procopius of Caesarea, on the buildings of the Lord Justinian. Introduction. Book I Book 2. Book 3. Book 4. Book V. Book 6. Appendix I. Appendix 2. Index. Footnotes.